Good morning, Krakow. Welcome to AppJSConf to everyone in person and at home today. We are your hosts. My name is Ellie. And my name is Yanni. And we'll be really, really, really proud to be here with you today. But before we get started with today's event, let's take a look at what happened last year at AppJS 2022. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. How are we feeling? Bright and early in the morning. Look at all you beautiful people. Shout out matching t-shirt gang. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of people being on brand here today. I respect that. Respect the hustle. We do respect the hustle. Yes. Well, you know who we are, Ellie, Yanni, but we don't yet know who you are. Uh, and this event really is about you, the community. So we would like to get to know each and every one of you now. Uh, we don't have time for that. Yes. So maybe on count of three, could we all just have you yell your names to us? Can we do that? Everybody good? One, two, three. Well, welcome. I think that's a Polish. Uh, I think that's a Polish name. That's a classic name. Yeah, Polish, that's name. Yeah. Polish name. Um, apologies in advance for all of the mispronunciation of Polish names we're going to be, be, be doing here today. Uh, we're from London. Uh, Vowel people. Yes, yes. We don't, we don't do well at that. Anyway, now we know who you are, but there's one more very important person that we need to introduce you, to you at the beginning of this day. So before we kick off, uh, we have the CEO of Software Mansion who wants to say a few words to you. So please give a big, excited, good morning welcome to Marcin. Yeah, so uh, hello everyone. Uh, I am Martin Skotnicz. I am the CEO of Software Mansion. I would, and I would like to welcome everyone to the third edition of AppJS conference. So happy to see so many faces. Apparently, all the tickets have been sold. So I am really thankful for your trust. And I hope you will enjoy this, uh, this event today and tomorrow. And the party after, of course. Um, so. Yeah, apart from, well, all the guests, all the, all everyone of you, we have also have a lot of people very involved in the React Native community. Uh, I think we have people from most of the companies that are like the major companies working with React Native. Um, and I'm very excited that Software Mansion is, well, I think quite important in the community as well. Um, so, um, yeah, we're actually, not a React Native agency, contrary to what most people, I think, might believe. Uh, we do a bit of everything. Ten years ago, when we started the company, there were just four of us. Uh, we would take any project. Obviously, the, those projects were not React Native projects, as you can it, well, count from the history. React Native was not out yet. Um, and we've grown over the years to, to a bit over 200 people. And uh, what I like to see, okay. Well, we are an agency, but I prefer to say that we are a developer experience company. So our idea is that roughly 30% of our engineering time is spent on building developer tools uh, of different kinds, and the rest are client projects. Um, this gives us this fantastic feedback loop where we can learn how to build, well, we can learn from actual projects what kind of tools need to be built, but we can also test those tools against those projects. and. Uh, People send, st sitting on the next desk will be using the tools that other people are building. And obviously, this gives us, there is a feedback from to the other side where we actually get visibility and projects because we have those tools that some people love. 
Um, React Native is probably the number one technology, but we also have a lot of open source um, developer tools in the streaming area called Membrane, if I can hijack your attention for a while. So we're actually launching in the next couple of months, launching a cloud-based video streaming platform. If you want, you can subscribe. There is a wait list. Um, and also, if you, if you have an idea for a project, you can describe it to us, and uh, we can, well, this helps us learn what we need to build. Uh, so I put it on the slide that we also offer free consulting. So if you have an idea that you don't know how to build that's related to video, especially uh, over the last few months, we've been starting, well, we've started working on uh, AI and computer vision stuff there. Like, if you have an idea, please talk to us. We can help you probably just point you in the right direction. doesn't have to be membrane. Um, maybe some other tools are better for that. Uh, also, you can talk to me today. I'll be back there in the expert lounge at least at 4, 4 p.m., probably more than that. You can find me anywhere also. And if you don't, you can find me on Twitter. So, um, yeah, very nice that you are here. Uh, please enjoy the conference, and uh, yeah, I am giving up the stage to the next person. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Thank Please, you, thank another you. big round of applause for the man himself. I, I'm, I'm sorry, we're getting a, a note from the studio. Uh, I, I, they're not really happy with the energy that you as an audience are, are giving us right now. What, what do you think, Ellie? Yeah, I think you need to give us a little bit more. It's them, it's not us, you know. Yeah, no, it's, I get it. It's early in the morning, you know, first cup of coffee, but I think we can do a little bit better. So could we like try, try you know, one more time, but like clap so the hands hurt a little bit. Like, can we do that? Thank you, Arjun. See, all right. See, this is the kind of energy our next speakers especially uh, deserve. Um, they're getting ready here. I think we're ready in, in just a minute. Um, these are two people who in this community probably don't need introduction, but we are contractually obligated and paid to introduce them. Um, so let's do that. Yeah, so please uh, give us that same energy uh, that you've given us for our next speakers, our keynote. We're going to have a great time. Look at them. Hey, oh, that's a big thumbs up and a big smile. Everyone, give it up for Charlie Cheever and... James Hyde. <laughs> James Hyde. I was excited. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is James Ide, and here with me is Charlie Cheever, and together we're the co-founders of Expo. And this morning, we're going to talk about the lay of the land today in the React Native and Expo ecosystems, tell the stories of some apps currently using these technologies, and share how we think about using these technologies together will evolve going forward. To start, let's talk about the state of React Native over the past year. React Native grew to over 1.4 million weekly NPM downloads, and that's just shy of twice as many downloads over a year ago. Now, of course, there's certainly a lot of noise and seasonality in NPM downloads as a metric, and context is important, but this gives us a good sense of the directional growth of a te technology. Expo grew to over half a million weekly downloads and nearly two and a half times more than over a year ago. And while most new projects today use Expo, we still see that there's a gap between older projects that use React Native that could benefit from easier paths to adopt Expo. Meanwhile, authors of modules have been a step ahead. Config plugins quickly gained adoption from module authors and are downloaded more than the Expo package. In fact, they're nearly downloaded as much as the React Native package. Config plugins are an Expo invention that lets modules configure the native project files of the apps that they're used in, and they co-locate the configuration that a module needs with the source code of a module. And the module ecosystem that already uses all these config plugins is ready for all these apps that want to take advantage of them. But both React Native and config plugins are still not yet used by most React developers, let alone app developers. Compared to the most popular libraries, React Native is still small. Now, React Proper has over 20 million weekly NPM downloads. 
And of course, every React Native project also includes React. Well, not all React projects include React Native yet. But with end users spending more time in mobile apps, we also think that the market for React Native is much bigger than where React Native is at today. And there's so much room to grow. And the reason it should grow is because both mobile and the web are where the users are. And if this community succeeds, if the people in this audience build the right things in the right ways, we think that almost every React project should use React Native to reach users on all the platforms that they're using. Now let's talk about some other ways React Native has grown. Some of the themes we saw over the past year from the React Native team at Meta were the quality of life improvements and to see existing projects through to completion. Work on the new architecture that we've all heard of has continued, and more precisely, Turbo modules, which directly bridge your JavaScript to native code in a synchronous way using less data serialization more efficiently, and Fabric, which does the same for native views and also opens the door for new React features like suspense and concurrent rendering. Now, as a quality of life improvement, you can actually write your Turbo modules and your Fabric views using Java and Objective-C rather than C++. Previously, C++ was a requirement. Now, it's just an option. Also, build times with Turbo modules vastly improved. In fact, they're up to over 10 minutes faster due to the React Native package, including pre-compiled libraries. And we know everyone appreciates faster build times. And speaking of pre-compiled libraries, the Hermes JS interpreter is now pre-compiled and also distributed with React Native. Furthermore, Hermes is now the default JavaScript interpreter for React Native as of React Native 70. But Hermes just isn't the default. Hermes is now the majority of apps. When we looked at apps that were built with Expo application services, our hosted cloud services run by Expo, that we call EAS for short, we found that almost two thirds of all apps built with EAS use Hermes. And similarly, when we look at the number of builds, not just the number of unique apps, we, we get a pretty similar metric. 68% of builds used Hermes. And with the release of SDK 48 this February, Hermes adoption especially accelerated. In addition to Turbo modules and Fabric views and, and Hermes, uh, the team at Meta made several other investments. React Native now works with the latest release of React, React 18. And React Native projects, whether they're using Expo or not, now they all use the same JSX Babel transform as web-only React projects do. There's just one JSX transform for all projects. Your TypeScript declarations for React Native are included with the React Native NPM package. So you don't need to keep the at type slash React Native development dependency in sync with the React Native dependency. Tomorrow, Alex Hunt from Meta will share some of the things that they've been working on in the Metro and React Native dev tools. And there's meaningfully more parity with the web. Flexbox's gap property is now here in React Native. We've got ARIA accessibility attributes, JavaScript pointer events, and CSS-like syntax for styling properties like transform and aspect ratio and font weight. And this is an area that the team at Meta is investing a lot in, which we find really promising. At Expo, we think that over time, some of the web's W3C common standard APIs will be part of a bigger common API for universal application software. And this is an exciting direction. Which brings us to a few things that we've been working on at Expo. And part of what we do at Expo is we bring together the best of web and native. One core feature that we really like about the web is that every page is linkable. Every page has a URL. And URLs are so fundamental to the web and websites, but they haven't been fundamental to apps that are installed on your devices. And that's why we created Expo Router, the first file-based router for native apps. With Expo Router, every screen of your app has a URL. It's kind of like how with Apache websites, every file on your disk kind of led to a web page and had its own URL. And PHP and Next.js and, and Remix, they all use the same idea. But this is for native apps for the first time. And URLs become fundamental to native apps. 
And later today, we'll hear Evan Bacon talk about Expo Router in detail and the very exciting possibilities it opens up. Shifting topics a bit, another major feature that we shipped last year was Expo Modules 1.0. The Expo Modules API is our official way for library authors to write native modules using modern, idiomatic Kotlin and Swift APIs. And in addition to first-class support for Kotlin and Swift, it has first-class support for struct-like record types, enums. It lets you easily choose whether you want to write an async function in JavaScript or a regular synchronous function. Data types like JavaScript's typed arrays are natively supported letting you efficiently pass references to large amounts of data across the bridge between functions or even between different Expo modules. And we think this is going to be especially useful for very media-focused modules. And the Expo module API supports React Native's new architecture. In fact, the entire Expo SDK heavily uses Expo modules and will support the new architecture 100% with SDK 49. A recent example of an Expo module is Expo image. It's a native component that supports modern image formats, like AVIF and WebP. It has built-in support for SVG. It has CSS-like layout properties that many of us are familiar with. And it's fast. It uses the Glide and SD Web Image libraries for rendering and caching. Give it a try on your app. Additionally, the contributor ecosystem is alive. We looked at Expo SDK versions 45, 46, 47, and 48 over the past year. And 224 people contributed to these releases. Many of you are in the audience today, so thank you very much. And some of these are significant contributions. For instance, Alan Hughes migrated over a dozen modules to the new Expo Modules API. The open source ecosystem <laughs> is active, and we hope to see it thrive even more and make it even easier for everyone to community, in the community to, to contribute to the repo and upstream contributions. Next, I'd like to talk about the state of our industry, and namely, some trends that we've been seeing. One trend over the past year is that companies are looking to do more with fewer people, fewer teams or smaller teams. And productivity and efficiency aren't new, but we're seeing that they're shifting from nice to have to need to have. And we expect more companies are going to need one focused engineering team rather than three for Android, iOS, web, plus the overhead needed to coordinate and communicate between them. Another trend is that major governments are investigating competition amongst the mobile platforms. And a lot of this is about rules for in-app payments and stores. In fact, the EU recently passed a law called the Digital Markets Act that regulates these large platforms. And meanwhile, Japan and the US have also published market study reports. And the report from US has one part that especially stands out for this audience. Reading through the report, the conclusion makes a recommendation to encourage tools and standards to increase interoperability and reduce developer costs. This isn't regulation yet, but it's what the regulators are thinking about today. And there are lots of ways to achieve what they're asking for. And we think that a framework for universal apps, if done well, is the best way. Another trend that's been true for a while and is still true is developers feel like there's a decision to be made between making a website and making a native app. And today, Making websites is still often easier. And working on Expo, we see the sentiment that developers want native apps and consumers want apps. Sorry, developers want to make websites and consumers want to, to, to use na native apps. But we think it actually gets more complicated than that. We find that consumers want to use both websites and apps. Users want to start with a website and then maybe later install the app. They want to browse a website and pick up where they left off on the app on their phone. Or they want to use the app and share a web link with a friend who might not have the app yet. So people want to use both websites and apps. And as developers, we want to give people these experiences. So smaller teams, interoperable tools and standards, being able to provide 
both native apps and websites. This is what we've been working towards this whole time. Everyone in this room, everyone in this audience sees pieces of an answer that our industry needs. The picture is becoming clearer over time with each new app built with these technologies, with each new SDK release, and each AppJS conference. And with this, we'd like to next share with you the story of two apps with very small teams who achieved a lot. And one of them, in fact, is the smallest team, just one front-end developer. And to tell us more, please welcome Charlie Cheever. Hi, I'm Charlie. I'm the CEO of Expo. Thanks for having me here. I want to tell you a quick story about the Blue Sky app. A few years ago, when Jack Dorsey was running Twitter, he had an idea about how to make it better. Um, the idea was that it would be better if Twitter was decentralized. And in the same way that you and I can have different email addresses, where maybe yours is at gmail.com and mine is at expo.dev, we can still email each other across those servers. What if you could do the same thing with something like Twitter? So he funded and set up some, a project called Blue Sky to develop a protocol to let networks like Twitter interoperate. Um, and they started exploring this. But then, as we all know, Elon Musk bought Twitter recently, and the idea that you could even post links to competing networks was out the window, much less that you could integrate with them. So instead of the plan being that Twitter would be the first network to integrate into this protocol that was being developed, and then everything would spread from there, the Blue Sky team realized, hey, if we want to make this work, we're going to have to build an app to, get every to anchor this and get everyone to use it. But they hadn't built a team to build an app. They'd built a team to build a protocol. So what they did was they had one developer on their team who had, um, had some JavaScript and web development experience, spent six months building an app with React Native and Expo, and he pulled it off. And um, this is exciting because uh, it's just really impressive work by Paul. But there's a few other things that I want to highlight beyond this. Um, React Native and Expo are using to power the most talked about app of today. If Blue Sky keeps this momentum going, it could be one of the handful of apps that people actually put in the bottom row of their home screen and open 100 times a day. All of us here in the audience know that this technology has gotten good enough lately to power this stuff central enough to our lives, but it's nice to see it starting to happen in the real world. This app is definitely a V1. The URL for the website is literally still staging.bluesky.app. Um, but people are happy enough with its performance that their functionality, they can't stop using it. Like one cranky cybersecurity poster even posted that most apps make them want to stab their own eye out with a spork, but the Blue Sky app is pretty OK. Um, so Blue Sky has a ton of momentum. Um, second, this app targets iOS and Android and web all from a single code base. Last year at this conference, many of the talks are about unifying web and native apps with a single code base. But this year, we're actually seeing that start to happen for real across the ecosystem. Paul, the Blue Sky developer, streamed live, live streamed coding a feature a few days ago. And he had the app open in a web browser and an iOS simulator and an Android emulator all at the same time. A couple of times throughout his live stream, you could actually see a pleasant surprise on his face when he developed something for web and then tried it on iOS and Android. And it just worked right away. We know that web is one of the most important platforms for many development teams. And we're making on making Expo a first-class way to make websites, getting it to the point where it's so good that Expo would be a really good choice to build a website, even if you didn't think you wanted an Android or iOS app. The Blue Side team is pretty awesome and gave us a few invite codes to share with people at this conference if you haven't tried it yet. So find me or Brent later if you're not already in the app and want to check it out. I want to share another story, too, about this other app, the new Brex app. Brex is a fintech app that manages and issues corporate credit cards, and other related things for businesses. They recently made some pretty big changes to their product offerings, going from focusing on many credit cards for you to unifying around one card. And they also added a bunch of travel functionality to the app. They already had an excellent app made with Expo and React Native. But Derek Davis and the engineering team at Brex decided to completely rebuild it earlier this year to support all the product changes that they were making. They managed to do this in only six weeks with 14 people, which is pretty incredible. One thing I love about this is how it shows the scalability of React. Sometimes adding more people to a software project can slow it down instead of speeding it up. But Brex's approach here got great productivity from people across their whole team. They spent the first two weeks building horizontally. That means they built all the components and building blocks that they would use across all the, the different feature verticals. And by building these in one pass, 
they were able to great, create this great consistent look and feel across the entire app. The second two weeks, they had product teams dive down into each vertical and build each feature of the app. And then the last two weeks was just testing and polishing. So they got the whole thing done in just six weeks, which is incredible. During all this, they used EAS as part of their testing process. They built a release candidate app that they distributed through TestFlight that everyone at their company could use, including product managers and marketers and people that weren't developers. This is really important since they found a lot of bugs when people with different roles and different ways of using the app gave it a full workout. When they would make changes and fix bugs, they used Expo's update system to push out new versions of the TypeScript app to everyone, and they could update it by just like tapping the logo in the app and verify the fix. We're seeing lots of people use EAS in powerful ways to make their teams work efficiently. The next talk from John Samp will be all about those workflows. And we're going to keep building more workflow enhancements into EAS because we see how much of a difference they can make in speed and quality for development teams. The results of this for Brex were outstanding. We use Brex at Expo, so I know firsthand that the app looks and feels great, and it's really well designed and thought out and executed. Others agree, too, since the app has 4.9 and 4.7 stars in the App Store and Play Store. It's pretty amazing that this kind of speed and quality is now possible with React Native. Changing gears a little bit, one question that I see all the time, and that I'm sure you people see too, is when you read the R React Native subreddit or you look on Twitter, this question keeps coming up over and over again. Should I use Expo or bear React Native without Expo? I want to talk about that a little bit now. We want to make this question obsolete. We always want developers to focus on the important parts of their app, not have to pay attention to arcane implementation details. And it hurts the whole React Native ecosystem when one of the first things developers have to do is make a hard choice that they need to do a bunch of research to make well. Instead, we want developers to just use React Native and Expo. And so we've worked hard lately to make it so you can pick and choose any parts of Expo you want to use without any lock-in or baggage or having to use the rest of Expo. Blue Sky is actually a good example of this. The project started out just using the React Native CLI and being a bare React Native project without using anything from Expo. But then a bunch of Expo things were added one by one as needed. They needed Expo Camera for camera functionality, and they needed Expo Web to target the web well, and a bunch of other things too. So now, any React Native project works with Expo modules. Expo modules use JSI, React's native inter React Native's interface for native modules. There's a small library provided by the Expo package called Expo Modules Core. In addition, in an app already using Kotlin and Swift, the marginal size increase is only about 150 kilobytes. Any React Native can use config plugins. Expo introduced config plugins two years ago, and since then, we've seen great adoption from library authors, and there are now over a million weekly downloads of config plugins. Any React Native project can use Expo Prebuild. Expo Prebuild manages and creates your Android and iOS directories for you in projects that don't need to manually configure those files. And any React Native projects works with the Expo CLI. You, one thing you might not know is you don't actually need to be using Expo Go to use Expo CLI. You can compile a development build of your own app that includes third-party libraries or your own custom native code. All these community libraries and standards are open source. And now that there's EAS, a set of paid hosted services operated by the Expo team for doing builds and updates and other things, um, all those things work with any React Native project as well. Apps built with EAS include only the native modules they use. Expo CLI, Expo modules, and pre-built are all optional. Apps can use any combination of these features, whether it's none of them or all of them, and still be built with EAS build. I just explained to you how you can use each part of Expo separately, but there are actually some powerful and magical things that can happen when you combine these Expo tools together, and I want to share one example of that with you. So when you work on a React Native project, you have an iOS directory and an Android directory that contain a bunch of files that you normally only touch if you're changing something about your app's configuration, like setting up deep blinking URL patterns, writing native code, or installing a native module. Touching anything in either of these directories feels unfamiliar and dangerous and fragile to most React Native developers. For me, I'd say it even feels a little scary. I'm always worried that I'm going to break something by accident. Expo Prebuild fixes that by generating your complete iOS and Android directories for you based on your universal apps configuration files. When you combine Prebuild with config plugins, auto linking, the Expo modules API, and app lifecycle events, you get what we call continuous native generation, or CNG for short. The whole here is greater than the sum of its parts. When you use the CLI to prebuild and run your config plugins, your native project files are continuously generated for you and your app at runtime is set up to work with the application lifecycle events provided by Expo modules. CNG treats your native project files like rendered artifacts. 
It's kind of like how React renders the DOM for you and keeps it in a consistent and, and correct state. CNG takes care of your native project files, so they're always in sync with your app config, and it does those across different native platforms. And because any React Native app works with each part of CNG, any React Native app can use CNG today. Um, excluding apps that have lots of accumulated custom native code changes spanning their whole Xcode and Android Studio projects, we think almost all React Native apps today should use this pattern. It lets teams move faster and make fewer mistakes and worry about less. This is kind of the whole point of Expo. When you have this vision in your head about an application you want to create, let's make that dream come to life as easily and as quickly as possible, where you're only worrying about the interesting and important and essential things that make your app unique, not arcane technical details. So I think most people here should use CNG in most of their projects. So thanks so much for being a great audience today. We're so excited to be here in Krakow with you. And thanks especially to the hosts and sponsors, especially Software Mansion. We've got a great lineup of speakers over the next two days, and I hope you're excited, as excited about them as I am. We can't wait to see what you build. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. That was incredible. I loved the energy for Flexbox, Flexbox Gap. Who was that? <laughs> we heard it from all the way backstage, and I'm like, all right. By the way, thanks also Expo for Blue Sky. I've been loving that app. It's like Twitter with better vibes. Yeah, I'm at elliebelly.dev on Blue Sky. So if anyone joins today, you can follow me. It's fine. <laughs> um, before we talk about our next speaker, okay. just a few housekeeping things. First of all, we want to do a big shout out to our organizers today, uh, Software Mansion and Expo. They've been working really hard for a really long time to put this together. And it's finally here. So if we could give them a big thank you for all their hard work. And also thank you for all of the other sponsors who make this event possible. You know, they help keep the tickets affordable uh, and it's really good to see community support from all of these companies that benefit from React Native and are also companies that you may want to work for or work with. Uh, so thank you to our sponsors as well. And while sitting there and learning cool stuff is fun, uh, at this conference we'll also have some uh, more interactive sessions. We have some expert lounges. Um, the, we have the Software Mansion team, the Expo team at lunch, and then Martin in the afternoon break. Those will be in the back on the mezzanine with the cool neon lights. Uh, so you can talk to people, ask them questions, learn from them. Uh, they'll be over the breaks, uh, so keep an eye out for them when we'll announce them as they come as well. And yeah, this conference is called AppJS, so obviously we have to have an app. Um, that, that is this mandatory. Um, so there's an app, you can download it. I believe there should be a QR code. Yes, there's QR we, codes for both platforms. So can, yes. This is a great uh, time to take a photo. Yeah, on that app you can find all the information you know, about the speakers, about the schedule, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I believe it's made in React Native. I think so, <laughs> yeah. Maybe Flutter. Probably Expo. Yeah, Flutter, probably. No, OK. It's actually native native. No, it's they made by the wonderful folks uh, from Software Mansion. And it's a, it's a great app. I think you should all go and download it and also give it five stars on the App Store, because why not? Yeah. QR code photos. Get it in. Get them in. All right. All right. So it is my great honor uh, to introduce our next speaker, who has uh, come all the way from Kansas on a plane, not a tornado. Um, and is uh, also part of the Expo team. Please give a big, energetic welcome to John Sepp. Thank you. Hey, what's up, everybody? Good morning. I hope you're doing well. Um, I've had a lot of coffee this morning, so this is going to be awesome. Um, I was here last year, and it was such a great time, and I can't wait to be here again today. If this is your first time at AppJS, get ready for an awesome two days. I can't wait to hang out with all of you today and tomorrow. So today, I want to talk about EAS and iterating with confidence. James and Charlie just talked about how Blue Sky and the Brex team... Uh, haha, does the clicker work? I can't change slides. <laughs> Fantastic. One moment, please. Okay, there we go. 
James and Charlie just talked about how the Brex team and Blue Sky use our tools to develop, review, and deploy their code. And these are generally the three things that we do as developers to get features out to users. So that's what I want to talk about today, how you can use our tools to do these things faster with your team. Because if we can move faster, we can ship better features to our customer customers sooner. My name is John Samp. I'm the head of product at Expo. So let's get going. I want to first talk about EAS. These are cloud services to help turn your project into apps by building them in our cloud, submitting them to the Google Play Stores and the Apple App Store, and then updating them after they're already in your users' hands. Before I was working at Expo, I was writing React Native apps, and I was doing it without Expo. And so I'd finally get a feature done. And once it was done, I'd have to build it manually in Android Studio and Xcode. And once that was complete, I'd want my coworkers to review my features. And so they'd have to do the same thing. They'd have to pull it with Git. They'd have to build it locally and then run uh, and then sideload it on their own device. And then after that, I'd have to manually drag and drop these things into the Transporter app and then also into the Google Play Store website to get it deployed to the app stores. Usually, that would take about my whole morning to get all of that coordinated. And then over lunch, I'd be looking over the app, and I'd see, like, oh, no, there's a bug. And it's pretty easy to fix. But now I'd look across my entire afternoon's calendar and realize I have to do all of this again. So then I started discovering EAS and Expo. And it just made all of this stuff so much faster. I could run EAS build and EAS update and EAS submit. And it really just made that a non-issue. So that's something I'm really excited to talk about today. Some of the stuff that we uh, do currently and also stuff that uh, is new over the last few months that I want to let you know about. So I want to talk about getting your team up and running super fast with EAS. Currently, we offer something called development builds. These are versions of your app that have developer tools built in. Just like how websites, you can right click and get developer tools, this makes your app just like that. We also manage all of your team's credentials. And part of those credentials is a provisioning profile that we can use with internal distribution to sideload apps on your phone. So you can get a development build on your phone. This looks kind of like this, where you and your team can use your device's credentials to get a development build on all of your devices. This is super handy. But the thing that doesn't really work with this flow is that every single device needs to have their credentials built in to the development build. And so we kind of run into this issue where if someone gets a new device on your team, or someone just joins your team, we then have to make an entire new build of your app. And this is a problem. How can I get another device on the latest development build of my app? To do this manually, you'd have to run EAS Device Create, which sets up all of your credentials. Or you'd have to manage all of your credentials yourself. Then you have to go and find the correct commit, you have to kick off a new build, and then you have to wait for that whole build to finish. So one way we're solving this this year is re-signing builds with new device credentials. And we call that build re-signing. The way this works is you can run EAS build colon re-sign with a profile name. And then we'll ask you which build you'd like to re-sign with, which, with whichever credentials that are new. And you can pick which one. So I took one of my personal builds, and I made a new build with it. And it took about 12 minutes. This is compared to just re-signing an existing build I already have, which took only a minute and 30 seconds. The cool thing here is that builds can take a wide array of times. They can take five minutes for a really simple app, or even 30 or 40 minutes for a really complex, huge app. If you re-sign a build, it always takes about one minute and 30 seconds, or somewhere around there. So this can really speed your team getting new people up and going with your app. Also, speaking of your team getting up and going, for larger companies, they often use something called single sign-on. Single sign-on is a way for your company to control what access you have to all kinds of web apps and other services. And Expo is going to be supporting that coming this summer. So if that's something your company uses, you can start using us as well. All right, next up, I want to talk about testing your features, because this is one of the things that causes me the most issues. We currently offer a lot of different features uh, around testing your features. So we have organizations, which you can control your teammates' uh, permissions and what people can do. We also allow you to create emulator and simulator builds of your app. Finally, um, we allow you to auto-submit your builds to the test track and to test flight. Now, one thing I do a lot is I create emulator and simulator builds. This will result in me having an APK file for Android 
and a tarball with an iOS app file for iOS. And a problem that I run into a lot is how can I efficiently get one of these emulator or simulator builds on my device quickly? Now, I usually do this manually. So that means going to the website, finding the build, clicking download, opening the simulator app, unzipping that tarball, and then dragging and dropping it into the simulator. I do this all the time. It's like clockwork, but it takes a little while. The way we want to solve this is by doing one simple thing, which is pressing the Y key. <laughs> so um, we call this running simulator builds immediately. And the way that this works is when you make a build, at the very end, we will ask you to install and run the build. And we'll do all of those steps for you and install it on the simulator. Now, if you're used to using React Native CLI and building with Android Studio and Xcode, this kind of happens automatically. But we wanted to take this further, and we can go further here since we've made this build in the cloud. We can actually allow your teammates to do the same thing with a command called EAS build run. So if I make a simulator build on my computer, my teammate can run this. They can find the exact same build, and then it will download it and put it on their phone for them. So this is just a way that I can speed myself up, but then also speed up my teammates too. Now, running things on emulators and simulators is one way to test your code. But one thing I do a lot is I make PRs. Imagine that we've made a PR together that adds a banner to our app. It might be called PR302 adds banner. And it might look like something like this. If I want, my, uh, if I want one of my teammates to view this feature and to also look at the code, I kind of run into this problem, which is how can I share a preview of my feature with my teammates? Generally, to do this manually, they'd have to clone the code. They'd have to install all the dependencies. They'd have to run a local server. And then they've got to open up Expo Go or a development build to load that. What we want to do instead is make this really fast. And we can actually use EAS update and branches. If you've heard of EAS update, generally it's thought of and used to ship production bug fixes to end users. But we can actually use the exact same mechanisms to preview PRs with our coworkers, which I think is like the superpower of the service. And I'm, we're calling this PR previews. The way this works is you can run EAS update dash dash branch, give it your branch name. We'll use Metro to bundle everything together and make an update of your current branch. Then, once you've done that, there are three different ways that you can preview this. You can go on our website at this URL down here, and you can scan a QR code to view any particular update. And actually, you can go to that URL. It will take you to the right place, even with the brackets and all. Another way is inside of Expo Go or development builds. You can see all the branches that you and your team have published, and then you can tap on them. And then over here on the right, if I tapped on that top one, I can see all of the updates that have been made. If I'm publishing on every single commit, this becomes actually kind of powerful. Because over here, I would see all the updates. I could tap on the top one if I wanted, but I could also tap on all of the ones below it. So if there's a problem, this is actually a pretty interesting way to bisect a problem. Now, probably my favorite way to preview PRs is using Expo GitHub Action. This will add a comment to your PRs that, after publishing every single commit, will give you a QR code that your teammates can scan to preview your feature. So if I have a stack of 10 PRs ahead of me, it's just so convenient to be looking at the code, scan this QR code, and see everything working at the same time. It makes review go so much faster. Speaking of going faster, let's talk about builds. Uh, we all want to build faster because we're building all kinds of apps with our projects. We're building development builds with development tools inside of them, builds to review, and also builds for app stores. And now that you can build with any native code or library, we're making builds all the time. And earlier this year, we started moving our build infrastructure from Intel to Apple Silicon. And the results we've seen from this have been just kind of awesome. Here is an example of a build that we made. The first one, it took about 15 minutes and 41 seconds to run on Intel. And the exact same build on Apple Silicon took nine minutes and two seconds. We were really thrilled with this. And so we started asking people on Twitter if they could send us their like, Intel to Apple Silicon times. And we found that, on average, this resulted in 40% total less build time for developers. This is just awesome. It's so much better to build faster. But you might be saying, I wish we could build even faster than that. I mean, nine minutes is still nine minutes, right? So 
we're introducing worker sizes for builds. How this works is we have Android and Apple worker sizes. And by default, those new Apple Silicon workers are available to everybody. And those are the medium size workers. And we also have medium Android size workers. But we're introducing these large size workers. And those are even faster. I took one of my apps and I built it on Intel and then Apple Silicon Medium and Apple Silicon Large, and I compared all three. And here's what I found. The Intel one took nearly 14 minutes. I've got nearly 10 minutes for the medium one, which is now default. And on the large worker, it only took five and a half minutes. This is like awesome. In fact, so fast that when I ran this, I thought there was an error and that it had like bugged out and ended early, but no, it was actually finished. So if you and your team need the fastest builds, you can start using this today. In your EAS config, you can add a resource class with a value of large, and that will instruct our builders to use the large worker class for you. So part of making your builds faster is about our machinery, and we can make it quite a bit faster on our side. But there's kind of another side to building, which is us, the developers. How can I make running builds faster like myself as the monkey behind the computer? Because I always have to run this command, EAS build, profile, whatever my profile is, and maybe some other flags too. And running this can be inconvenient or slow. And also, I'm spending most of my time in GitHub all day or on our website and not necessarily at my command line to remember what all of these commands and flags should be. So we're introducing GitHub linking. What this allows you to do is on our website, you can link your GitHub repository to a project. And this is what it looks like. Once you've done so, we can enable some pretty cool stuff. One of those things is kicking off a build from expo.dev. So since we have access to your GitHub, then we can allow you to fill out this form and then hit confirm, and it will kick off a build on our servers for you. This is fantastic for non-technical people on your team or just people not familiar with EAS CLI. But probably my most favorite way to kick off builds is right inside of PRs with labels. So when you set this up, you can add labels to your PR, like EAS build Android colon production. What this means is EAS build, please make an Android uh, build of my app, and then also use the production profile that's in my EAS config. This is awesome. And compared, if you put this and combine it with the preview uh, QR code that I was talking about earlier, it's really cool. I can make a PR, I can add some screenshots of what's going on with my feature, I can add this to kick off a build, and then my reviewers can see an instant preview of what's going on. It happens all in GitHub. We think this is really neat. Now also, aside from kicking off builds this way, one thing that we do a lot with making a build is actually a lot of the stuff that becomes before the build happens. We often will unit tests, we'll run linting tasks, and we'll run end-to-end -end tests with something like Detox or Maestro. Generally, how we've done this in the past is run everything on the left with GitHub Actions, then run the build part with EAS. And so we have to kick off two CI processes. We've got to have two different configuration files, and like YAML files are everywhere. So we're introducing custom build jobs. The way this works is in your EAS configuration file, you can add a config key with a route to a YAML file. And then if you go into the YAML file, you can write any process you'd like. So this allows you to install dependencies in this example and then to run tests, but you can do anything here. You could make a build and then you can run your end-to-end -end tests or you can notify Slack. Now a cool thing that we're also exposing here is all of our build steps so that you can use the ones that you like of ours. So if you like that we manage your credentials, you can use that step from us, but say you want to replace Fastlane with buck or build cache or something, you could write your own custom step for that one. So it makes the build process massively flexible and turns those two CI processes into just one. This is coming later this summer, so make sure to look out for that. All right, so moving on. I want to talk about making changes with confidence and kind of going back to that first topic I talked about, about shipping features. So when I was working on apps before, when I had a bug fix, for instance, this was kind of the process that I'd have to do. So over here on the left, I'd make a bug fix. I'd have to make a build of my project with the bug fix. I've got to submit it. Then I have to wait for store review. Then once it's approved from the store, I have to wait for my users to download it in the background, which can take some time. I think at least on iOS, there's like a seven-day window that people can get the new app. 
And then finally, my users will see the bug fix. So if there's something wrong, it can actually exist in production for quite some time. With EAS, we've made this a lot faster, and with EAS update specifically. So now if I have a bug fix, I can run EAS update, which publishes that bug fix. Then when my user opens the app, they will start downloading the new update, and then when they open it again, we'll apply the new update. The reason why we do that is so that they get the fastest startup time, and they can keep on using their app, and then it just updates seamlessly without them seeing anything. But we've heard a lot of feedback from all of you and from tons of developers that we need to make this more flexible. We want to get more adoption of end users on our latest code. And so we're making our updates JS API easier to use. Um, while it's supported a lot of these features, they've either been undocumented or just not very easy to use at all, so we wanted to make this better. One use case that we've found a lot is people want to make a UI that looks kind of like this, where a banner pops down that says there's an update available, and then the user can decide if it's a good time to reload for them or not. This changes this sequence of events to look like this. And the main difference is here is that now it's a foreground step instead of an app open. A lot of people don't close their apps all of the time, or at least I don't. Maybe that makes me crazy that I don't like flick them all up and like close them all the time. So this means that when I foreground my apps, it would check for the update instead. Then it would download the update, and we could show a UI prompt. Instead of taking days for my users to get bug fixes, this might just take my, most of my users minutes to get bug fixes, which is really neat. Now, you can take this really far and be really heavy-handed with this. Like, if you have an internal app that is absolutely essential that everybody is on your latest code all of the time, and you never want them to use anything but your latest code, you could show a UI like this, which covers their entire screen, and it just says, we are updating right now. This is going to take a moment, and we're going to force reload you once it's done. This turns the timeline to look something like this, where they foreground the app, it shuts down their app, downloads the update, and then force reloads. This can get your bug fix out in seconds if you want to sacrifice that user experience. Now, obviously, you'll have to do something that works for your app and write business logic that will work for your users, but I just want to show the spread of what this JS API can do. We've put a lot of these helpful APIs in this package called Expo Use Updates. It's still experimental, but we'd love for you to go and try it. You can go check that out today. Now, <laughs> yes, there we go. Now, aside from getting your updates out as fast as possible, sometimes that's kind of a scary thing. Like, maybe you don't want your latest update out to all of your users all at once. And so I want to talk about that just a bit. So this is a pretty common pattern that developers do, and one I've done as well, where we have two different channels, a staging channel that goes to the test track and also to test flight, and then a production channel that goes to all of our production, like public App Store users. Generally, I'll create four builds at a time, and Android and iOS one for each. So I kind of think of these channels as like groups of users, where staging is like the small test group, and production is public and everybody. Then a lot of developers will link these to different branches. So we've got version 1.0 that is stable and on production, and then we've got version 2.0 that is on staging that we're currently testing and trying to fix bugs on. Now, this is great, but implicitly, 100% of our users are going to both of these branches. So we're introducing EAS update rollouts, and these are rollouts by percent. This allows us to change this graph to be something like this, where we point 10% of our users at version 2.0 to detect any bugs, instead of exposing our entire user base to the version 1.0. Now, here's how you can do this. You can run EAS channel colon rollout and give it your channel's name. Once you do, we'll ask you which branch you'd like to start rolling out and at what percent, and then we'll show you the state of your rollout. You can rerun this command at any time to update this rollout. And if it's going well, you can roll it out to all users and you can keep on moving on. So we're really excited to introduce that, something that people have been asking for, so hopefully that's good news for all of you as well. This can really de-risk uh, publishing new code to your end users. And so that's a great win for teams who want to push things quickly. In addition, it's really nice to see what kind of code your users are running and who is running it and when. So we're working on a new feature that is going to look something like this, and we're calling it Insights. This allows you to see how many users have accessed your app and how many of them are in the latest Android and iOS build and also what update they're running. We're, we're going to be adding a lot more to this, but this is what we're starting with. 
Um, the UI will look something similar to this, and we use data from Expo updates to supply or to fill this up. And we'll also have a new library called Expo Insights if you'd like to get even more data about how your users are using your app. If you want to know that like, your deploy actually went off and people are using your code, or why is there a bug still happening in production that I swear I fixed, this kind of data can really help you. We'll be releasing this also in the summer of 2023. OK, so I've talked about a ton of features today. And I put them all on this one slide if you want to take pictures of this one. Um, I just want to thank you all so much for learning about all these features and coming this morning. And yeah, that's all I have today. Thank you so much. I can't wait to hang out with all of you. See ya. Before we announce uh, the coffee break and send you all off, uh, we have a few announcements. First. First. First coffee. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, no, yeah. Yes. We have the expert lounges uh, happening at the mezzanine there on the second floor. So that'll be starting. We're finishing a little early here. So that'll be starting in about 20 minutes um, up there. Um, you can talk to the Software Mansion open source team, uh, the people who make building React Native apps so much easier. So if you don't have any questions to ask them, just go give them a high five and a thank you for all of the work that they're doing. Uh, there's also a cool neon sign that you can pose with for the gram. <laughs> um, we also, during the break, for the, the we have a live stream, so there's a lot of folks watching at home that aren't here in person. Uh, and on the live stream during the breaks, we'll have uh, live interviews uh, with some of our speakers, with experts. Um, and I think that'll be playing on the big screen, so if you want to grab a coffee and a cake and come watch, that's also cool. Folks at home, uh, make sure to catch the live lounge. The one for this break will be Charlie and James, who gave the first talk, co-founders of Expo, so it should be a good interview. All right, and that's all from us. Uh, I'll see you back here latest at 11.30 for the beginning of the next block. Yeah. Thank you. In Krakow, a remarkable journey awaits you through time and culture, science and innovation. From the foundations of an ideal city, Nova Huta, golden dream of socialism, to the medieval city center. Besides monuments entered on UNESCO heritage list, Krakow has something else to offer. People. In Krakow, every year close to 200,000 people complete their higher education. This includes almost 6,000 foreigners. These are specialists in almost every field from IT to biotechnology. No wonder that global players open their affiliates in Krakow. Krakow has become the center for modern services in Europe. Krakow is also a mecca for innovative business, from small catering unit to internet startups. A few of them have become world famous brand names. Our town is called the Polish Silicon Valley. By investing in infrastructure and transport system, we draw closer to each other. Local public transport is considered to be the best in the country. The blue trams and buses carry a quarter of a million passengers each year. The map of the town shows that museums play a special role, especially those that have outstanding collections uncomparable with anything else in the world. As for instance, the Wawel Museum of Aviation, the only one of its kind in Poland. Here you will find in this part of Europe the largest library with access to books that constitute not only Polish heritage but also that of all Europe. Old and modern architecture 
are the town's strong assets. In these interiors, not only are extraordinary concerts held, but also great sports and artistic events. One of these extraordinary places on the map of Krakow is Małopolski Garden of Art, an area for the implementation of innovative art projects combining many fields of art. Krakow, due to its center of Congress, has become one of the leading places in Europe where both cultural and trade events are organized. Krakow is increasingly associated with excellent cuisine, its restaurants offering both traditional Polish food dishes as well as those representing other often distant lands, gain recognition amongst residents, tourists and culinary experts. Hidden in the medieval cellars or located in sophisticated townhouses, vibrant centers of social life may be found. Krakow is a town which is unique, intriguing and surprising. A unique mix of history and modernity inspires action. Experience Krakow. And if you want to become an Node.js developer that can build end-to-end -end applications, join our thriving community at Node.js.dev and I'm gonna help you master full-stack mobile development by building applications users love.
Hi, everyone. Um, I'd like to say hello to all the people that have been watching uh, the live stream back at home. Um, and yeah, so we'll be having a couple of interviews throughout AppJS during the coffee breaks and also the lunch breaks. And so we'd like to start off with James Ide and Charlie Cheever. And one of the first questions that I wanted to ask is, do you have any kind of favorite memories from AppJS? Because I know this isn't like your first rodeo here, right? Yeah, I think for me the after party has always been fun. Um, it's so, and also just meeting so many people from this community. There's so many like really interesting, really smart, really caring people who want to make, you know, building apps better or just want to do it really well. And um, this conference just brings together such great people who come from so far. Away. I'm always blown away by how far away people come to crack off from to get here, and that that just makes it an awesome group of people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, okay. So, as a first technical question, I have a question about AI. As there is a big boom around artificial intelligence right now, uh, do you see any case when it can affect Expo, or do you see any new features that will benefit from AI? Yeah, absolutely. Um, one way we think about AI at Expo is that we we're not really a AI expert company. Um, that's something that we could, a skill that we could develop over time. And it's important that we learn to use AI, but we think that the most important thing for Expo is that the, the companies that use AI for app generation tools target Expo. We want to make Expo be the easiest way for all the companies using AI to build an app. So while people ask us, is Expo going to build a tool using AI so that you can type in, make me an app, and it will design an app for you? Sure, we might prototype with that. But what's even more important for us is that the dozens of companies that are going to do that same idea each in their own way, that they can all target Expo. We want to make sure that when AI makes certain tasks a lot easier to do in the future, that Expo is along part of that easiest path. Thank you for that. It was really everything I needed to know right now. Yeah, and do you guys have any tips maybe for some developers that are maybe just starting out their career or just starting to use Expo? Like, do you have any general advice? Yeah, the first thing I would do is just make sure you're using Snack and Expo Go so you can get started as quickly as possible. And then just try things. And I think I've always found that when I really want to make something, I just stay focused and stay motivated. So if you have an idea that you're really excited to build and really want to show your friend or your mom or your you know, boyfriend or girlfriend, that's, that's always really motivating and, and keeps people on task. Yeah, I think that actually finishing your app and showing it to someone is really a fulfilling experience. Yeah, there's something really magical when, when everything works and you can show it off. Did you create anything new with Expo lately? I've been busy. Um, <laughs> what about you, James? Um, I haven't completed it yet, but I want to make an app for the US postal system to check my mail that's going to arrive. Um, there is a, an app that they officially make, but uh, it uses a lot of wrapped web views, and you have to log in every time, and I don't want to have to do that. So again, I have this own personal desire, and that's very motivating. <laughs> Great. And no, do you have any? No, I get a question if you think that we was in a phase that was Expo versus React Native, and now we are in state that it's Expo and React Native. Do you see in the future that will be no difference? Like it, those will be interchangeable. Like Expo and React Native will be like, I mean the same thing. Uh. I think those might move closer together, but you know there are different groups of people working on this. There, you know, there's people at Software Mansion, there's people at CallStack, there's people at Infinite Red, there's people at Meta, Facebook, uh, there's people at Expo that work on things, and and there's so there's so much that goes into all this technology that it makes sense that there's different names for different parts of it. But I do think that like, you know, this community isn't that that big, and we want, and I think it's best for everybody if we all kind of work together and present like a, you know, the unified thing for new people coming in to have a really smooth path to just getting stuff done and getting those magic, like you were talking about, you know, that magical moment when you make something that works and you get to show it off. 
every second we can shave off of the time it takes somebody coming new into the community to get to that point actually makes a big difference in terms of like growing the React Native community. And so like when it's just clear and smooth how Expo and Meta and all these other companies and individual contributors that are part of this whole ecosystem are all working together in a really clean way, I think that's good for everybody. And I also wanted to ask, like, are there any new kind of tools, technologies, anything like that that make you kind of excited within the realm of mobile app development currently? Um, well, one thing that we have some firsthand knowledge about, I don't want to spoil too much, but uh, we, we've got some talks from, from folks on the Expo team uh, coming later today that, that we think people will be excited about. Yeah, definitely check out Expo Router. That's a, I think that's a huge deal. Yeah, I was just about to segue to the next question. Are there any particular talks later today or tomorrow that you're excited about? Yeah, for sure. So from, from the Expo team um, coming up, we've got a talk on uh, routing from, from Evan Bacon. Um, also, uh, Kudo from the Expo team is giving a talk, and, and Cedric as well on, on debugging. And um, outside of Expo, uh, one, one talk I'm looking forward to at the end of uh, tomorrow is uh, one by Henry Moulton on using Maestro, uh, which I've heard is a great way to, to test mobile applications. Um, I'm just interested to learn more about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I guess we're looking forward to it. I'd like to thank you guys so much for, for sitting and chatting with us. And we'll be coming back to the next talks at 11.30. So catch us later at the lunch break. Bye-bye. Yeah, bye-bye. Thank you very much. And if you want to become a Node.js developer that can build end-to-end -end applications, join our thriving community at nodejs.dev, and I'm going to help you master full-stack mobile development by building applications users love.
when I have enough money in my hands, enough for the f
And if you want to become a Node.js developer that can build end-to-end -end applications, join our thriving community at Node.js.dev and I'm going to help you master full-stack mobile development by building applications users love.
Hello, 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 hello. Welcome back, everyone. See, I can actually hear some caffeine powering those claps now. Um, I hope you're all caffeinated and ready for this next session of talks. Uh, we're going to do four talks back to back. They're not uh, strictly timed, so basically you should be seated for all of this, and we're going to run through four incredible talks. Um, I am super excited to introduce this first talk. So I, I used to be uh, a React Native developer all the way from point, version 0 0.4 uh, up until a couple of years ago. Uh, and the thing that I loved about React Native was the ability to create these sort of like incredible user interfaces experiences, um, try to always work towards native, but also be more creative about it because the React Native painting library has allowed you to do that. Uh, and there was always one person that I always used to look up to, and we have him here with us today. Um, so without further ado, I would like to give a big welcome, and I hope you do too, to our next speaker, William Candion. Native developers. <laughs> William here presenting from beautiful Krakow, Software Mansion, Expo. Thank you so much for having me today. With Christian Folk and Shopify, we've created React Native Skia, an effort to bring rich 2D primitives to React Native. We got started by finding the shortest integration path between these two technologies and we exposed the Ski API to JavaScript using GSI. And we built our own React renderer to draw the Ski drawings. This brings us a couple of thing, things. So first, we can use it on iOS and Android. But of course, on the web, we use it a lot with Remotion. So what you're seeing here is a Ski Canva in React Native. And so, we render the React Native tutorials using React Native Skia. And that includes also the React Native Skia source code, which is also rendered using React Native Skia, so it has been a lot of fun. You can also use the renderer on Node if you want to generate images or videos. We use it to run end-to-end -end testing. So here, we use the Skia renderer with Jest. We ask it to generate a documentation image and we check it for correctness. And you can also serialize the tree, send it to an iOS and Android device to do end-to-end -end te testing. You get the image as a result, and we can check for correctness. Lately, we've, we've migrated our JavaScript renderer to a C++ renderer. We call it Skia DOM. This new renderer brings us two things. First. Because it's in C++, we don't need the JavaScript thread to be available to render a frame. So it gives us a very fast first time to frame. And the second thing is that it brings us 10 to 100 times performance improvements, depending on the drawing. So this is an example. On the left is the old Skia renderer. And on the left side, every second, we were all, uh, allocating around 3,000 GSI objects. So these are Skia objects that need to be memory managed by JavaScript. And at these scales, uh, things start to be a, a bit slow. But now in the new renderer, things are much, much faster. And it's all rendered on the UI thread. There is a really fun package that takes, takes advantage of uh, uh, this new renderer. And it's, at, it's React Native Ski, uh, Fiesta from um, Matteo Guzman. And he needs to display a lot of uh, uh, drawing commands and elements, and animate them. So a really, really fun uh, package. We got started by finding the shortest integration path 
between React Native and Skia to a fully tailored declarative solution. Over time, our understanding of how these two technologies, React Native and Skia, should integrate together is getting increasingly sophisticated. Which brings us to today's presentation. I'd like to show you three things. Things which are near and dear to our hearts. And before we have a look at what Christian and I have been working on, let's have a look at what you guys have been working on. Hey everyone. Hello everyone. I'm Adria and I lead the app development at Orca. So hi everyone. Hi and so about a year ago I co-founded together with other two amazing software developers a React Native consulting company called Worker. My name is Dan. By day, I am a React Native developer, and by night, I am a YouTuber that runs a channel called Dan's React Native Lab. I'm Mark, CEO of Margelo. At Margelo, we build some pretty cool apps for our clients and maintain some of the most popular open source libraries. React Native Skia is an important piece of the puzzle. React Native Graph is a library to render 2D line graphs and is used by quite a few crypto and fitness apps out there. We built the library using Skia to make use of the blazingly fast rendering engine and provide a smooth user experience even at highly complex graphs. Orca is a modern navigation system for boats that runs on iOS, Android, and our custom-made hardware. In Orca, we make a Tesla-like screen that includes maps, instruments, autopilot controls, weather forecast, etc. The main difference, though, is that Orca is for boats instead of for cars. And compared to car drivers, boaters care much more about instruments. Therefore, we face the challenge of displaying all this information in real time on a fully customizable and easy-to-use dashboard. We designed a minimalistic UI that needed to be animated and adaptable to any screen size. And that's when we came across React Native Skia. We found that this library was the perfect match for our needs. The developer experience was great, and the implementation was incredibly smooth. On my channel, I like to create um, sort of intermediate level videos on a lot of different topics. And one of those funnest topics is actually React Native Skia. When React Native Skia came out, I sort of latched onto it and got really excited. I started by doing simple things like just moving simple shapes around the screen. Over time, I graduated to more complex things like charts and graphs. Um, I started having fun with it by making circles and stuff that would morph. By the time about a year went by, I was just having fun and doing confetti and adding fun heartbeat animations to um, a heartbeat app that I made. As a company, we know that the secret behind a perfect app lies in the details namely the animations. Being Italian, there is just one thing that I know perfectly well. There are some ingredients that absolutely shouldn't be used together, like pineapple and pizza, and the others that when used together work perfectly. Skia and React Native definitely fall in the second category, allowing React Native development to meet creativity and madness. And that's basically what has led me to create my Patreon account, where I try to share the most interesting use cases in which to apply these two amazing packages. Glass morphism, team switching, creating custom tabs are just a few of the thousands of use cases where Skia gives you the ability to reach a design set that uh, was impossible to reach before in React Native. Tom and I are working on a new rendering layer for Vision Camera. This allows you to render shaders, draw boxes, blur stuff, and even more using Skia's easy-to-use JavaScript API. Thanks to Skia, we can bring even the craziest designs to life. Back to you, William. Thank you, Margello, Orca, Shopify, and Worklet, and you, the community, for trusting this project. Speaking of working together, let's talk about animations. And the gold standard for animations is, of course, reanimated. <laughs> Some of you have seen this story countless times when animating in React Native, the, the nerf de la guerre, the heart of the matter, 
is to keep the JavaScript thread free. So here we block the JavaScript thread, and of course, the animation is blocked because we need it to be available to animate. Christoph Magira has single-handedly built a new integration between reanimated free and Skia, and this is how it looks like. So there, it's, a, it's done on the UI thread. So there are two things to notice here, is that now if we block the JavaScript thread, the animation still runs, because we don't need the JavaScript thread anymore to run the animation. And the second thing to notice here on the, on the source code is that, so this is a reanimated code that you know and love, and if you are a pro at reanimated, you're gonna be a pro at animating skier. And also you can see that we can pass reanimated values directly as properties. There is no use animated style nor uh, use animated props. The skier renderer understands how to, to deal with these values. And we think that you're gonna have a lot of fun with this. But this is about more than performance. We think that this new integration is enabling use cases that were not possible before, and I'd like to show you one. This is a skia Canva that animates, rotates, scales, pinch different uh, vectors and pictures on, onto the Canva. And this is done using Gesture Handler and the new reanimated integration. There are maybe two things interesting about this is that, so first, Building such an example is now extremely simple to do, thanks to Gesture Handler version 2.0. Some of you might remember that these things used to be really complex to do and almost impossible, and now it's actually only a few lines of code. When you're gonna see the demo, I think you're gonna be really surprised by only, it's only a few lines of code to, to build the whole demo. And the second thing to notice is that, and this has been a really um, a common feature request, is that even though this is a single Skia Canva, we can track and apply gestures on separate elements to the Canva. And the way we do it is by overlaying native views on top of elements in the Skia Canva, and we can track the same transformation matrix to display the vector graphics and the view. And Gesture Handler keeps nicely track of the transformation when you pinch, zoom, do the pivot points, and it's all perfectly in sync. Another compelling example of the Gesture Handler integration is this okay. um, graph. So here the whole graph is a um, Skia Canva, and we want to be able to scroll. So if we touch the Skia Canva, we still, we don't want the gesture to to be active, we only want the gesture to be active if we touch the little cursor uh, in the middle. And so this is what the new reanimated integration is enabling us to, to do. So thank you, Christoph, and thank you, Software Mansion, for building these incredible modules with reanimated and gesture handler. <laughs> now, I would like to talk about the elephant in the room. When we introduced React Native Skia, we got really excited, to say the least, and we showed these little demos of, so these are, we call it backdrop filters, so we're not blurring the shape, but we're blurring what's behind the shape. And we were really happy to, to learn how these things are done in Skia and then to offer a declarative API on how to do it in React Native. We were really excited and proud. The elephant in the room is that, of course, this only works because the pixels behind the shapes are done in Skia. If you have a native view, the Skia view has no idea to know what it needs to blur. I'd like to show you an example. This is an example from um, Enzo's Patreon. And here we have clearly a native view. This is Google Maps, and we play around with it a little bit. And when we open the model, so the semi-transparent view that you're seeing here is a skia view. And we ask it to blur, but of course the skia view has no idea to, doesn't know about the Google map view behind. And sometimes when I see this example, I feel bad about the skia view because we ask it to blur some pixel, but it's like, no, what do you want me to blur? I, just, I don't see any pixels. So what are we gonna do? There is a little non-secret in the React Native community is that 
the native part of the name stands for native. So surely, if we can do it in native, we can do it in React Native. So let's have a look at the same demo, but running the latest version of Skia. So we play around with the native view a little bit, and then we're going to, maybe I'm playing around a little, a little bit too long here. But at some point, we're going to tap on the modal, and now this is a Skia view blurring the Google Map view. And this is hard to see here, but also the blur view is slightly animated with the scale value. So thanks to the new reanimated integration, you can animate using the same code your native views and the skia views. So how does it work? We provide a new API for snapshot views. It's based on a similar technique used by React Native uh, view snapshot, but it's a bit faster because we don't do the image encoding and so on. We just take the bitmap and upload it to the GPU. And so this is a low-level API. To build this demo, I actually wrote a component called Skia Filter, where you can pass a native view as a children, pass the Skia Filter as a property, and we try to identify the different patterns in which people will use this feature, and we will hopefully offer some higher-level construct to use it. But this is about more than just doing backdrop blurs. So I'd like to show you another example. This is a completely native app. The text is rendered using React Native text. We have a scroll view, everything. And now I would like to turn the page. So how are we going to turn the page? Maybe we can use a shader, and maybe it can, use, it can look like this. Let's have a look. Here we took the snapshot of the foreground view, the background view, and we applied the skier shader to it. We use GL transitions. There are, I think, thousands and thousands of GL transitions available. You can choose uh, any one you like. If, if you think this is corny, there's plenty that I'm sure you will like. I would like to show you one last example, which is a bit more involved. So. This is, a, again, a native app, fully native view, and we switch from light mode to dark mode. So is there a way maybe we could make it a bit more um, exciting? So one way we thought maybe this could look like is this one. So this is a bit more involved because we, when we press the dark mode, we don't know yet how the dark mode view is going to look like. So we wait one frame, two frames, to see if the dark mode has been re-rendered, and then we just apply a clip path to the, to the animation. And once you, the transition is over, you're, you're back to the native view. So that's native view snapshots, finally giving access to Skia views to the native view pixels. These are some of the use cases we had in mind when designing the feature. But we think that you guys will come up with even more creative ways to use it, and we cannot wait to see them. So now I would like to show you one last thing. The text that you are seeing on screen here is rendered using React Native Skia. That's a new rich text API we are working on. You can use it to do text layouts. It supports full internationalization and also fonts from the system. So this is a, another example. You can now the Skia renderer supports text nodes. They can be deeply nested with one another. You can apply different styles to your uh, text. This is very much uh, a work in progress. The API is really, really big, and we want to, to make sure we're careful with it. And we've been struggling with shipping interna full internationalization support on, on iOS, but um, we've received great support from the Skia team at Google, and we think we're onto a really good solution now. So that's something that should come later this year. And so these were the three things I wanted to show you today. 
reanimated free integration with Skia, allowing you new fun use cases mainly with gesture handler and allowing you to reuse existing animation code and knowledge to your Skia animations. Image snapshots finally giving access to the native views to the Skia view and a sneak peek of our upcoming rich text API. All of these things are the fruits of the hard work of Christian Folk, Shopify, and Software Mansion. Thank you to our amazing industry partners for trusting this project. If you are interested in using Skia or are using Skia, come to GitHub, say hello, let us know what you are up to. And so indeed, I am looking forward to talk to you soon. And until next time, happy hacking. Wow. One more round of applause for William Candion. <laughs> Genuinely, if some of these tools and APIs had been, had been available in 2020, maybe I would have never quit being a React Native developer to begin with. It's incredible what we can do now, and, and, and that is just a masterpiece. But now, we're going to switch gears. Let's talk a little bit more about data. So our next speaker, uh, Johannes Schickling, you might know him from the past as the founder of Prisma, but for the last couple of years, he's been exploring something really exciting and interesting in the space of data, and he's here to talk to us about local-first state management. And I know what you're thinking. State management in 2023, are we still doing that? Is that still a conversation we're having? But I think Johannes has something interesting and surprising for us to share. Johannes. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. Super excited to be here. Uh, yeah, I'm giving yet another talk about state management today, but bear with me. It's not yet another Redux. It's a bit different, and if anything, I don't actually want to share like a new NPM library with you today, but it's more of like a different way of thinking about state management, and particularly how it relates to user experience. So, and the first part of my talk will be more about local first, the second part more in the nitty gritty. So I'm Johannes Schickling. I'm based in Berlin. In the past, I've been the founder of Prisma, uh, where I was also thinking about state management uh, more on the server side. And nowadays, I, do, uh, I build an actual app uh, similar to the story that Charlie shared today. I'm also like a developer who's building an app, trying to build an, a cross-platform app, so feeling right at home here. I also do a bit of open source consulting. And the project I want to present today I've been collaborating on with my friend Jeffrey Litt, who's doing about the same project, actually, his uh, PhD at MIT. So uh, some, some really great thoughts have gone into this. So the app I'm building, don't want to go too much into detail here, but just in case someone is interested, and that's been the motivating foundation for, for all of my learnings and, and thoughts, is I'm building a new music app. Uh, like it's, I call it a mu universal music app because it should integrate Spotify, YouTube, Bandcamp, wherever the music lives these days. Um, yeah, it's hopefully going to be available later this year. But uh, this has been the, the, the ground for, for all of my thinking and, and learning on, in regards to state management lately. So as mentioned, in this talk, I want to, in the first half, present a new architecture, or maybe new to some of you, called local first. It's a bit of a different paradigm as like an antidote to everything being cloud these days. And in the second half, I want to share my approach to how I've built a local state management um, solution, uh, particularly with local, local first in mind. So why local first? I want to walk you through like kind of like an anecdote that I've gone through like a bunch of times when I've built an app, and maybe this seems familiar to you. So let's say we build an app. Let's say we do it either by ourselves or like in a, in a small team. And we, we maybe go with like a three, typical three-tier architecture. So we build a React app, maybe a React Native app. On the server, we're using an API server, maybe a REST server, maybe a GraphQL server, and a database. Typical three-tier architecture. And so we develop it, we develop it locally, we roll it out to our next data center. And it's like working pretty OK. But then as we get actual users, 
Uh, turns out the app is pretty slow. Maybe they don't live right next to the data center. Maybe they don't have like perfect network connectivity. So what do we do as developers? Right, we add caching and we add optimistic updates. So it's like ruins the simplicity of our app a little bit, but it's for a good cause. So we make the app faster again. Users are happy again. Okay. So a little bit further down the road, since we're building a mobile app as well, like it turns out you take your mobile phone like downstairs where you don't have any connectivity at all, and the app breaks because it doesn't work offline. So what do we do? Well, I guess in most cases, we do more of the same, which is more caching and more optimistic updates. Uh, looks like my slides don't quite load. The One second, the internet here is not as reliable. I'm sorry about that. Uh, one second. It's funny that I'm giving a talk about local first, which is about the independence from the internet, yet my slides are relying on, uh, on network connectivity. Um, so maybe at some point the, this starts loading again. Unless maybe someone can give me a, a hotspot. Right. This. Oh boy. There, oh, there are some phones, but mine is not popping up yet. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> can you give me a hotspot? Mine is not popping up, unfortunately. I'm very sorry about that. Or maybe some of you can hop out. My phone has suddenly appeared magically. Technology. Let's see. We're back. All right. And actually, this was not scripted. This was about poor connectivity. But uh, this actually made my point, my point perfectly. Like, our technology is pretty useless without internet. Um, so yeah, but back to the flow. How, what do we do? Actually, the solution here would have been similar, more caching or a different architecture, which I'm getting to in a second. Um, but here, in this case, with this app, we typically add more caching, more optimistic updates when we're doing writes, and so on. It's like it fixes the, the problem for, for the user, but it comes at a big cost for, for us as developers. And then let's say we want to go a step further even, and we really want to like, improve the user experience. Let's say we have like, some collaborative aspects in our, in our app. Let's, let's think about something like Notion, where it can collaborate on, on the same text, et cetera. So as we want to add that, now we not suddenly need to coordinate this. And so this might work fine for one user editing something. But if another user tries to edit the same document, our, approach, our typical data management approach starts to break down. And we need a different so, uh, solution to this, uh, which maybe we aim for something like CRDTs to, to do syncing. But as a developer, all of this came at an insane cost. Like we have now racked up so much technical depth in our, in our code base. And I would say state management is the, is the origin of, of all of this problem. So like our state management has gotten like super complex. We have to deal with cache invalidation problems left and right. Uh, we have inconsistent state due to optimistic updates if they go wrong. And on top of all of that, now we've tried to like retrofit the Stata syncing flow, and this does not fit our original ar architecture at all. And so as an alternative idea to, to all of this, this is where like a new architecture is emerging. And so as a foundation, I want to share two observations here with you. One, the problem, the, original, the originating problem of all of this is actually that we have two kinds of state. We have the state in our app, and we have the state on our server. And that state, by nature, is distributed. And all of our problems that we've dis discussed here is about that state being distributed, so like a distributed systems problem. So that's observation one, and that's really the root of most evil. <laughs> and the observation number two is, as we've introduced the first little cache in our app, we've actually, that cache grew and grew and grew, and actually looks and was like 
talks a little bit like a database. So I want to share an approach with you where we could actually embrace that. And just to, to drive home this point, um, I found this, this really interesting blog post where Tristan writes, when I've worked on any kind of distributed systems, including systems as simple as a web app with front-end and back-end code, probably upwards of 80% of my time is spent on things I wouldn't need to do if things weren't distributed. This is really, like, to my previous point, like, we have the state in the local app and we have the, st the state in the server. If we find a different solution to this, we could probably massively reduce the, the time we spend on, like, not building features. So, yeah, and that approach is, as I initially mentioned, local first. Local first was coined in a research lab uh, called Ink and Switch. I'll share the, the blog post in a second. And the core idea is to embrace that database that we have typically in most of our apps anyway. So we just embrace that and really try to like leverage that for most for like all of our queries and state management locally. And we try to push out the state management, the distributed state management problem a bit into like an in intentional syncing problem. And so and those are like pretty well explored. And if we if we put those ideas together, that's kind of like what local first is, is all about. So as mentioned, Ink and Switch was, uh, I think is, is kind of like has always been there, but more it's like as a concrete intentional idea was coined at the research lab called Ink and Switch. Uh, can highly recommend everyone who's interested in reading this blog post, highly inspirational and informative. So quickly want to motivate a few benefits of, of local first. I think it's a win-win for both users and developers. Uh, for users, I think kind of the ultimate feature is that it's fast. Local first makes it so much easier to build fast apps. It's always available, uh, as opposed to my slides earlier, uh, even with poor and uh, like no connectivity at all. Um, the apps are have much better longevity. So like most SaaS software where like a SaaS service has shut down, like you can't use that anymore, you can't access your data anymore. Whereas like MS DOS software still works rock solid. Like why, why have we lost this? Local first brings us back. Um, it's much easier to build collaborative apps, uh, such as apps like Figma or Linear or Notion uh, with local first. And it's also much more respectful of the user's privacy. But all of that is not just like better for the user, but much harder for the developer. But it argue actually much easier for, for the developer it's, um, as well. So for developers, it makes for a much easier, much simpler architecture. Um, it solves the distributed system. Or it doesn't solve it, but it puts us aside and lets you focus intentionally on the distributed system problem, and importantly, lets other smart people Talk, uh, like deal with a distributed systems problem much smarter than me, and I can vo focus on my app. And um, yeah, it's overall, I can now say, with having done that for two years, it's much easier to develop, test, and debug in, in such a data paradigm. The developer experience is just great. So this is kind of like a quick uh, recap here of like what I think are the benefits of, of local first. But in the second part now, I want to share like the, the how, like how have I done local first state management? And I want to focus here, um, there, there would be a lot to cover. This would be like many, many talks. Uh, but I don't, I don't have enough time today to talk about syncing, for example, using CRDTs. I don't have time talking about versioning or migrations. These are all interesting problems or integrating with other APIs. I don't, we don't have too much time today, but I want to focus particularly on the local state management part. And I want to, yeah, share my thoughts, findings with you today. So as a starting point for local state management, this might be as, as simple as it gets using a simple use state React hook. So that as a starting point, we started to explore, hey, what are the characteristics and the design goals we'd want for, for the app that we're building to make the right thing easy to like, build a great user app? So the design goals that we've come up with, I'll walk you through them like in greater depth in a second, is that the state management should allow me to easily persist all the data that, that I have. Um, it should be reactive, as we're at a React conference. The data should be reactive as well. 
it should allow me to express transactional boundaries very easily, and it should be super fast. So what do I mean by persistent? The goal here is that like whatever I'm doing in the app, like whether it's navigating, filling out forms, et cetera, and something, in case something catastrophic happens, or like if you're in a web app and you reload the app, uh, like all, all the stuff you've put into the form, like let's say a government or insurance form, if all of that is gone, that's, that's a nightmare. So the most state should be persistent by default. That's better for users, uh, like avoids data loss, and just makes for a much better, developer, um, much better user experience overall. But it's also great for developers because it's much easier. If all state is persistent, it's much easier to, inf uh, to reproduce like hairy uh, debugging situations. Yeah, so that's, that's a key characteristic I want. But it's kind of tricky to do right. Uh, you might need to think about data serialization, migrating that data, and there might also be an overhead of like now persisting that data to something like index to be or, or something else. So that's persistence. I want my data to be reactive so that when any data changes in my app, that it updates the corresponding React components. And it should do so in like the, it should not drop like any data changes, so it should always update a React component if something has changed, but also as minimal as possible that is like efficient. And then it also needs to be, trans gives me transactional consistency. So in a music app, for example, as uh, where it's a lot about playing music, let's say you play a track um, and you play another track, now you want the, the state to be all updated. You don't want like your one play button to still show pause or like the, the wrong track. If you change something, everything should change at once that it's consistent. And, but yeah, that is kind of tricky to pull off because you now need to track the dependencies of your data across the entire app. You might want to batch changes together and to express all of that in a nice and ergonomic API has proven quite challenging. And last but not least, I want all of this to be fast. I want to build an app that's like ideally like 60 FPS, 100 FPS, like however our fast our, our screen is. And whenever a user interacts with the app, it should be reflected ideally in the, in the next frame. So that leaves very little breathing room for like the, how, how much time the state management aspect has. And if we're using a database, that puts incredible pressure on the performance characteristics of the database. But that's also like a super important requirement for, for my flavor of state management. So we've been exploring that. And just to give you an idea, like, as we're building a music app, this kind of like the more the status quo, where you have uh, like Spotify, and just notice uh, as you're clicking between playlists, there, like they were all open before locally, so all the data should be there. And just to drive home, like like look at for all of like those loading spinners, etc. Like this is all data that should be there instantly. And uh, the next slide, I want to share like an early prototype that we've built uh, for Overtone. This is like you click on a playlist and the next frame, like your entire data is there. This is like what you can get with, with local first. So that's the kind of that's the kind of speed. So but speaking of like loading spinners, etc., like we've been at a point where we've like been, how can we uh, like do we need these loading spinners if we have the data, et cetera? Could we, like, this was really, like, introducing so much complexity in our app that all, like, the, the queries are asynchronous and we have, like, this loading state. So we've been wondering, could we get rid of this somehow? Like, this is a typical, like, like use query hook. You could implement this however you want or use an existing one, but that's kind of, like, the gist. That's what it is. You have, like, a loading state. You have the actual state. And then in your app, you need to kind of like switch over, hey, is it loading? Then show like a skeleton. And like if it's not loading, then like actually now finally we can, we can render my component. And it's even worse if you have like multiple things that are loading and now you need to coordinate all of this. So if we'd, we've been really wondering, hey, could we do without that? Could we get rid of like this asynchronous part? And this is kind of like the secret sauce of our state management approach that we've been, um, yeah, that, that we've been thinking about, and frankly, this was like kind of a tough battle 
Uh, for like two years, we've been like going back and forth. Hey, does this even make sense? Can we even pull it off or not? But this was at least like a bold initial goal initially, and I'm I'm pretty excited to share that uh, it seems to be working out. So the goal is like to drop uh, the async away, drop the loading states. Um, this massively simplifies your your application code. Um, it makes for the best possible performance and, and user experience this way. But yeah, given that you do these synchronously, this also puts like real requirements on what needs to happen within that typically the UI thread. Uh, like that needs to be just crazy fast, and that's kind of been like one of the main challenges for for what we've been exploring. But yeah, one takeaway here maybe for you as a, as a, that I could suggest is like if you have the option to make an API synchronous as as opposed to asynchronous, uh, I think that can be massive benefits that I did not appreciate in the past. So what about existing solutions? As Yanni mentioned, yet another state management talk. There's a bunch of like state management tools out there in, historically, and I think they're all like are great for their time where they came to be and are still great in many circumstances. But none of those solutions really addressed all of our goals that, that we, we set out for ourselves. So, and that's why we've built our own. And so we've built kind of like, we built a technology called Riffle and are now integrating that with another technology called SKDB. SKDB is built by a bunch of like brilliant ex-Facebook people. It's built in a program language called Skiplang, uh, runs in Wasm, runs natively. And it's, you can think about it as like a smarter SQLite that you can add, embed in your database, uh, in, in your actual application. And Riffle is the, the glue between React and a database like SKDB, and that's what we've been kind of incubating over, over the last two years. So I want to show you a quick demo. Um, so this is the uh, to-do MVC app, uh, as, as we've seen it probably a bunch of times before, and so I can uh, do the talk, have internet, and do demo. So I'm doing the demo, I have internet, and notice uh, this all, first of all, works. This is like with an actual like SKDB database running in Wasm. This is a web app, but the same applies also for, for uh, React Native. Um, I can filter this, like filter by the active ones, filter by the completed ones. Uh, thus, everything updates. And just to, to illustrate this a bit more, we've integrated this little, uh, this little debugger tool here where you can see the, the different tables. So here we see the to-do table, here we see the UI state table. As I've been writing something here, hello, this would be updated right away here. So, and this is, this is all just like SQL running. So here I see like the visible to-dos, just says select star from to-dos. Uh, if I'm like filtering this, the query will be updated, the data will be updated. It's just SQL, but like in a reactive way. So yeah, this was a little demo. I just want to uh, briefly explain how this is kind of working on a, on a code level. Uh, everything in a database typically starts with a schema. So you can express a schema here. You can also express actions. This is where you would change some of your data. You would then take that schema and provide it to your React app on sort of like a root level. And um, yeah, then you're then you're ready to go, and you can do you can do queries here. You can uh, actually like make changes, like add a to do, update something, and that's basically all there is to it. With and all of this has the the uh, fulfills the goals that we had before. Is like super fast, persistence, all transactional, and this is all like synchronous. There is no loading state here. So yeah. This is, um, that's Riffle, just another, uh, another visualization of this where you have your, your components, your, your SQL queries, and how it like composes all the way up from, from your, from your um, tables. So who is excited to, to give this a try? <laughs> so this is awkward. Uh, I have some bad news for you. Uh, this is not yet available. Those are mostly just like internal projects, but this will, 
there will be progress, and we're like writing about it. There is some like there are some essays uh, that, that you can read about this. SKDB is going to be probably announced like and, and publicly available in the coming months as well. And if you're really keen on somehow still giving this a try yourself, please get in touch with me. In the meanwhile, there's also great alternative technologies such as Vulkan, Electric SQL, and, and others. So this is really just one technology as part of this broader spectrum of like local first. Um, but please, by all means, get in touch with me if you're if you're curious to learn more about this. I'm also like uh, I think up for questions there uh, tomorrow. So if you, if you're interested, uh, approach me and happy to chat more about this. So yeah, what I want to leave you with today is please give like local first, uh, local first architecture a try when you're like building a new app or as you're facing some of the problems that I've that I've mentioned earlier. I think is like it's it's probably not the and all be all for like all apps, but for that's better for users and better for developers. And as you're thinking about like state management, particularly local state management, yeah, those are the design principles that we've kind of like worked our way up to over the last two years that seem to work really, really well for our app. And so maybe this can be an inspiration for you as well. So with that, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Johannes. That is a brave move to pretend to have a network failure in the middle of a talk, just to demonstrate your point. Um, that is some incredible stagecraft. If you would like to learn more about um, all of the things that Johannes just talked about, you can speak to Johannes tomorrow at the expert panel on the first break. So Johannes will be back here tomorrow. But now we must move on to our next talk. Uh, and this is actually an exciting one for me because uh, Caddy and I used to work together and she's a very dear friend of mine. Um, she runs the mobile services at, at uh, Formidable and she's genuinely one of the most gifted engineers and engineering managers I've ever worked with. So I'm really proud to introduce our next speaker, Caddy Kramen. Thank you so much, Yanni. Thank you. I am so excited to finally be here at AppJS um, this year. So I'm really excited to give you the talk that I was meant to give last year. Thankfully, my topic is timeless. So I'll be talking about building a five-star app. In particular, I'm going to talk about why app reviews are important and what us as engineers, what we can do to nudge our app reviews in the right direction. So just a quick intro. Hi, my name is Caddy Kramen. As Yanni said, I'm currently the uh, Director of Engineering for Mobile Services at Formidable. Uh, you can find me on the Twitter uh, if you want to connect um, under Caddy Kerman. That's usually my handle. So I built a bunch of mobile applications, and I'm excited to share some of my experiences. So when me and my sister were little, my, our parents had this rule that we don't get any treats throughout the week. We have a treat day on Friday. So on Friday, we can tell our dad, anything we want from the shop, any ice cream, any chocolate, any candy, anything we want. So no treats and just that one day of being treated. And that was a very difficult decision in my life. And little did I know that decision was one of the simplest that I'll be making. As adults, we continue to make more and more decisions each day. And every single decision has more and more options. So what shoes to buy, which conference to attend, where to book a holiday, what house to get, which job to accept. And due to globalization, due to capitalism, we have more and more options for every single choice that we make. And arguably, that is a good thing. We're spoiled for choice. But really, we are exhausted by all these choices. There's been a lot of studies on this, and uh, various researchers have found that an average adult makes around 35,000 more or less conscious decisions every single day. And this is causing a thing um, called decision fatigue, which you might have heard of. And it's the idea that the more decisions you make, the worse you are at making those decisions. 
And there's various things to combat this. For example, something you might have heard of was um, a, a bunch of well-known people who have a lot of responsibilities wear the same outfit every single day. And the reason they do this is to take the choice of what to wear out of their day so their decision-making fuel could be used on more important decisions, such as running a country. And this brings us to reviews. So reviews are something that we as humans have created to help us make these decisions in a world that has increasingly more and more options for every single choice that we have to make. So online reviews are almost as old as the internet. So the internet became mainstream in the 1990s. And the first online reviews actually appeared in 1999 in eBay, eOpinions, and a couple of other platforms. Originally, reviews were product reviews. They were about product reviews and seller reviews. And over time, you could review companies, then companies could reply to reviews, and honestly, we'll have reviews attached to it. They're just part of our life. Fixes a bunch of bugs, you receive an influx of five-star reviews, your app rating will actually go up faster than the mathematical average would suggest. And the converse is also true. So this is why you see your Play Store rating fluctuate a lot more than your App Store rating. And finally, on the App Store, you have a unique feature of being able to reset your rating. So if you've ever published an iOS app, you probably would have seen it. It's part of the uh, publish flow. And it's just a radio button that, al that allows you to either keep your existing rating, which is the default, or reset it. Uh, it's useful to know that it doesn't actually reset the reviews. The reviews will still be there and visible. However, they don't count against the number displayed to the user. On a Play Store, this is not supported at all because they do the weighted average. Now that we're halfway through, let's talk about how to actually build a five-star app. Now, when I started this talk, I had about 10 bullet points here, but over time, I've toned them down to just two most important things. First, we want to preempt common complaints. I'll be honest, winning the alert, the ugly alert with JavaScript error and crashing the app, it will allow you to catch it and then give a user a much friendlier error and also a way to progress. For example, just reload the app. Secondly, you want to communicate errors to the user. I know that there's always going to be a default of, oh, something went wrong. However, whenever possible, users want to know what happened, what can they do about it, and who to contact. And the other thing uh, that's very, very important for us, at least, is if you are publishing to any um, large group of users, if you have like a million users that have downloaded your app, you'll want to track your errors and you want to monitor them. For example, I usually use Sentry for this. So in Sentry, you can, uh, you can track your um, app errors. You can track errors introduced in newer versions. So when you do stage releases, so you start off with maybe just 10% of users, you would, you would track the errors in Sentry, and you see if there is an influx of an error that never happened before but was introduced in a new version, in which case you could hold your release, go and fix it, and fewer users will be impacted. Secondly, as developers, I think we're all aware just how expensive it is to test. So unit testing is expensive in terms of time, effort, maintenance. 100% of unit test coverage isn't really feasible for most people or projects. So we need to prioritize. And if there is one area in your app that you should prioritize for unit test coverage and regression testing before releases, it should be anything to do with payments. Um, as soon as money gets involved, people get more frustrated, more angry much quickly. So this could be making a purchase within the app, but also if your app unlocks any paid content. So if you take the user's money, you really need to make sure that the experience that they paid for is available to them. Now, before we go into the last bit, I want us to all to internalize this point. App reviews are not just a reflection of your app, but of the whole user experience. I think as developers, because we're the ones building the app, we're the ones publishing it, we're often the ones monitoring the reviews and the crashes, then we are the ones held responsible for the app rating. But the truth is, for most applications, the app rating 
uh, the actual app experience is only part of what goes into the rating. And the user doesn't care that the app is good, but the things outside of the app weren't. They are rating the whole experience, including the company. So just to give you a few examples, so you have two types of negative reviews. You have reviews that could be in your control. So for example, um, if there's a feature that's not working, um, for example, if there are crashes or errors, or if there is some UX problems, for example, a user can't find a way to search. So let's say there's no way to search products in the app, and actually there is a search, but you put it in a, in a place that the user can't find it. And then you have the frustrating ones, the types of negative reviews that are just outside of your control. So for example, your payment provider goes down. There's nothing you can do about it. You're angry at your payment provider, but the customers don't know that. They are just angry at you. Or if you're building an app that, uh, where you're selling products which get delivered to the user, uh, a, very common error, uh, a very common negative review is the delivery driver um, was late, uh, my product was broken, uh, the product had bad quality, um, product was delivered to the neighbor. And this is not something that you can fix as a developer, but it will affect your App Store review. And finally, there's always going to be anti-company sentiments. So public sentiment of the company might drive individual opinions, and nowadays people would um, potentially go to the App Stores and leave you a review to reflect that. So if we just do some quick math, just to give you an idea of what the impact of these one-star reviews is, uh, just to take a mathematical average of an app that got one one-star rating and one five-star rating, so our average is now three stars. So we want to get this up to four point something. So I've done a quick formula here, and I've sorted it by x, and just plugged in some numbers so you can have a look. So at the very minimum, we want to get a 4.5 star rating. So given that we have one one-star rating, we would need seven five-star ratings to offset this so we could get to our target of 4.5. And this gets exponentially harder the closer to five stars we want to get. So if our goal is a 4.9 rating, which really is considered a good rating on iOS, then we need 39 five-star reviews to offset that single one-star review. Now, have a think. How many times have you personally looked up an app on the App Store or on the Play Store to give it a good review? If it's more than once, you're probably better, a better person than me. And most of us don't. So human nature is so that we don't notice things when they're good. The good is the baseline. That's the expected experience. We notice things when they are absolutely exceptional and if they are even slightly worse than the baseline. And unfortunately, our threshold for complaining is much lower than our threshold for saying good things. So for example, the hotel that I'm staying at, I think it's decent. It's not the best hotel I've ever stayed at, but I don't really have any complaints. I'll be honest with you, I am not going to go to Google. I am not going to give them a five-star review just because I'm not that kind of person. However, if as I was leaving the hotel, there was a person there with an iPad that said, hey, do you want to rate your experience out of five? I'd give them five stars. Why not? I have nothing to complain about. And it was easy. And this is exactly the mentality you're going to have to tap into when it comes to getting those five-star reviews for your app. So how to ask for reviews. This is the point of the talk. First. You want to ask when the user is in a good mood. You know your app the best. Um, you know what flow is the good flow in your app. But just to give you some examples, if it's a shopping app, maybe it's when they've made a purchase. If it's a running app, maybe it's when they've completed a run. If it's an app for social media, maybe it's after they've browsed it for 10 minutes and liked the post, something like that. And then, you don't give the native alert straight away. You use a custom prompt that you design yourself as small as and as inattrusive as possible just to go, hey, are you in a five-star mood? Are you enjoying this app? 
So you're kind of trying to prime the user and see if they're in a good mood. And if, if they're not, if you misjudge the flow, they'll go, nah, not really. And this gives you an opportunity to, get, to ask the user for an alternate, an alternate way to ask the user for feedback. And this is good in, in two ways. The obvious one is that you are driving the negative reviews away from your store page. But the important one, really, is that it gives the user a more detailed way to give you feedback about what's wrong, other than, I don't like the app, which is not actionable. And finally, when they say they love it, this and only this is when you open your native alert. And hopefully, they'll hit that five star, and um, you're getting that much closer to your five star app. So in summary, the average rating um, on app, and app Store and Play Store are, on the App Store, it's 4.5. On the Play Store, it's about 4. So a good rating on the App Store is around 4.8, 4.9. And on the Play Store, you should be aiming for at least 4.6, 4.7. So your goal is different. And you shouldn't be worried if your, app, if your Play Store rating is lower than your App Store rating. Secondly, some feedback is always going to be out of your control. Don't worry about it. It's not a reflection on yourself personally. It's just going to happen. However, it is important to proactively uh, counter this, offset this. And the way you do this is you proactively ask for reviews. You ask for reviews when your user is in a good mood. They've just done a positive thing in your app. Ideally, it's the main thing your app does. You show a non-native prompt just to check if your user is in that five-star mood. If they're not, you give a detailed uh, form for them to provide additional feedback if they're in the mood. And if they say, yes, we like your app, you show the native prompt, and you get your review. I hope you find it useful. That's all for me. Thank you, Caddy. Uh, five stars for that talk, I would say. All right, so we have one more talk before our lunch break. Um, it is another person who maybe does not, strictly speaking, need an introduction, but I will give one anyway. Uh, I love this guy. I've known him for years. Every time I see him, the first thing he tells me is, are you using Expo? You should be using Expo. Um, fun fact, I think Evan is short for evangelist. Um, do not fact check me on that. Uh, fairly sure that is true, though. Uh, I think that's all I have. The talk will speak for itself. Everyone give big applause for Evan Bacon. No, no, no. <laughs> Can, I... Can we get the speaker? Yeah. Yeah, let's drop one down. Sure. Yeah. All right. Ooh. For next, or? Okay. In 2023, developers are still wondering if they should build an app or a website. And they, they kind of pit them against each other to try and choose. But we at Expo believe that there is a different way to think about front end development.
In the last decade, mobile computing has gone from nearly non-existent to the majority of the way that uh, we uh, consume the internet. With an almost 10% or sorry, an almost 10x increase uh, surpassing desktop worldwide. And on mobile, native apps make up uh, over 90% of the time spent uh, when, when you're on a device. The other 10% is uh, in, in mobile web. And as a result, we've actually seen a widespread trend emerge in mobile sites. Mobile websites have become deeply entangled with their native app counterparts. Now, we refer to these types of websites as mobile gateway sites. And a lot of popular websites are building these on mobile web. They do this because mobile web enables four fundamental features. The first is being an instantly available preview of the app's content. Anyone can open any web page at any time and preview the app's content. And this is great for users who don't have the app yet. The second is universal links. Now, universal links uh, work by creating a website and a native app and then painstakingly linking them together. At Expo, we refer to apps that are built on universal links as universal apps. Now, when a universally linked native app is installed on a user's device and they open the link to the connected website, uh, the OS skips over the mobile website, takes you right into the application. This system enables users uh, to access content inside of your app with a standard URL, meaning you can share content uh, anywhere with just a URL. It could be on Twitter, emails, Reddit, SMS, anywhere you want to promote your content. It could even be in a TV commercial with like a URL bouncing around the screen, like the Super Bowl ad and, uh, that Coinbase put out. It's just a link. Uh, so it's native content everywhere. And the third feature is installation. Users can install your app right from the browser without having to travel to the App Store. This is really fundamental because it also means that when they you know, install the app and they open it from this page, they can be sent to this exact same page in the app without losing any progress. And finally, possibly the most important and powerful feature of a universal app is the ability to add SEO to your native app by corresponding it to a searchable website. We call this universal SEO. This makes the content inside of your native app discoverable by anyone with a search engine, which is substantially better than being buried in the App Store. These four features are wildly important. They shift the narrative from web verse native to web and native. Uh, as the mobile web is kind of clearly designed to empower this really, really powerful native experience. But just universal links on their own are extremely difficult to set up. They're even harder to scale, and they're almost impossible to test. When companies do implement universal links, it's usually just for a couple of key routes, and those few supported routes will also uh, fail to use vital data, like query parameters. They'll often scrub them out. So then you, know, you lose important context, and it kind of leads to a frustrating user experience. But even basic discoverability is extremely important, especially to the people who need it most and can access it the least, due to independent developers, indie devs. Uh, you know, just imagine what the world would be like today if only the biggest companies and groups uh, had access to SEO on the web. Wouldn't be great. Uh, and this is how most of the native world operates today. That same native world that has kind of been dominating uh, web usage for uh, you know, a couple of years now. So it needs to be better. Now, what if universal links were actually the default and not some complex feature you add later? Uh, what if the way that you set them up was the easiest possible way to build mobile navigation? And what if instead of you know, sanitizing URLs, we just handle them exactly, we pass them to React state? What if when you wrote a React component, it was highly performant and the content inside of it was fully discoverable by anyone? Because it doesn't really matter which tool or framework you use to actually write text to the screen if no one can find that text in that screen somewhere. Which is why if there were a system which offered automatic universal links 
an automatic universal SEO, it would be one of the most powerful ways to build mobile uh, content, mobile apps. And it's exactly what we plan to deliver with the new Expo router. Last year, we introduced Expo Router, which is a first of its kind, revolutionary new file-based routing system, specifically crafted for universal app development. And today, I'm gonna to be showing everyone here all of the new features that are coming to V2. But first, let's take a quick look at how Expo Router works today. By simply creating files in the app directory, you create robust navigation pages inside of your application uh, for both your app and website. The name of the file is its universally accessible link, automatic deep links on every single page. You can organize files into folders and create a layout route, which adds uh, shared UI elements like stack bars and tab bars, drawers, what have you. And because it's built on React Navigation, you have access to all the same powerful features, like shared element transitions with the new reanimated or uh, native stack navigators. Now, Expo Router supports modern conventions from the web, like dynamic routes. It also supports catch-alls and groups and you know, a number of other things that you'd kind of find in the web. But it also introduces some new concepts that are very app-specific, like shared routes where you want to present the same screen with the same URL in multiple different places at the same time. That's kind of something that was added to make up for the fact that there's no tabs in, in native apps. Now, this is gonna be a good one. Expo Router doesn't just help with navigation. It's also really good for TypeScript. Expo CLI already has pretty awesome TypeScript support, but starting now, uh, if at any point during the or you add TypeScript code, Expo CLI will automatically install all the TypeScript dependencies that you need, it'll set up the TS config, and it will also augment the React Native types so that they support web. And to support Expo Router even further, we've added uh, TypeScript import aliases to the Metro Bundler through Expo CLI. So now in your TS config, you can go in, add paths, set them up, whatever you need. And all of your spaghetti imports that you may use to reach outside of this app directory and import things like components or API-related uh, uh, modules, all of those go from this to something like this, uh, which is you know, a very common pattern found in the web. Everything here uh, works and integrates directly with VS Code, so it means you get jump to text, you get the previews, you get the auto imports. It's the shortest import, so it's the one that's always recommended. It's pretty nice as well. And that's the new TypeScript support in Expo Router. But possibly the most important feature of Expo Router is the state-of-the-art deep linking engine. Instead of pushing screens from arbitrary IDs, we introduced the concept of links, uh, where you can move around using 
uh, URLs. Now, every route is publicly accessible uh, with any of these deep links, and it also supports query parameters. It's how you pass around data, all serializable. This system can be extended to support universal links with like unprecedented ease. It's extremely simple to set up. All you have to do is turn the feature on, and then the universal links completely work. And now this gets us to being able to install the app directly from the browser and passing links around to people and having them just open up content into your app. But it doesn't get us universal SEO. It doesn't make our app searchable. Having a solid web platform optimized for mobile and SEO is the crucial missing piece here. It's, it's fundamentally what we need. Now, this was the motivating reason behind introducing uh, Expo Web four years ago at the first AppJS conference. And uh, the original Expo Web, while powerful enough to build websites like the Blue Sky website by a single dev, uh, has become a little outdated. So the way we built it originally was we, we just took what was running on native, which is a giant JavaScript bundle, and ran it on web. And this is not very optimal for web. Uh, this is a system called a single page application. This can't be indexed by browsers very well because there's very little HTML. There's just kind of one div element, and then the JavaScript adds the rest of the HTML after it loads. So nothing to index. The main reason we went for this approach is that native apps have a single entry point, you know, the app.js. And uh, <laughs> Because of this, we don't really know which, uh, which files can be um, pulled out or turned into other pages to create multiple pages. Uh, we needed a file-based router. So since we didn't have one, we halted support on web and development uh, until we could get one. And thanks to Expo Router, we can now move beyond single-page applications. for the suspense, <clears throat> which is why I am thrilled to announce that today, static routes uh, in Expo will now be a thing. Uh, you'll be able to export your routes as crawlable HTML uh, that search engines, LLMs can recommend content, and it can link directly into your app. Uh, so static rendering in Expo. Static routes work in five steps. First, you configure the project to use Metro for web and the new static output mode and then you run the universal mpx expo export command. Using the new plus HTML file, you can wrap all of your children with uh, the HTML element. You have full control over it. It's good for things like Google Analytics or adding global styles. Then all the layout routes are sequentially rendered inside of each other up to the leaf route. We have a new generate static params function, which is like the Next.js get static paths and uh, similar functions on web. This basically means if you have like a dynamic segment, uh, you can export a bunch of different variable content. This is good for things like blogs or uh, conference apps uh, where you want to render out each user. And finally, the static HTML is written to disk and ready for uploading to any hosting service. And that's the new static routes feature in Expo Router v2. It's designed to work with native apps to enable searching according to Apple and Google's best practices for app indexing. It's a very niche and unique web framework. Uh, Expo SDK 49 will be the first version of Expo to support static site generation. And this effectively means that when you use Expo on web and on native, you now have this clear path to universal SEO for everything in your app, not just a few key features, literally everything, uh, which has never been possible before. So we're very excited about it. Now, there are a number of factors that search engines consider when indexing content. Static routes provide the most important part. The Expo Router link component actually magically turns into anchor elements when you run it on web, so they can crawl and find all the other pages. But what about you know the title and the icon and the favicon and all that? Uh, well, for that, 
we created the new Expo Head module, which is powered by Universal Links. Uh, this Expo Head module generates metadata per route for both web and, uh, and also native. And we'll get into that here in a second. So to use this, you simply import the head component in any of your routes, and then you use it just like you would any other head component in like a web framework. If anyone's familiar with web development, this looks super familiar. All the content you define here will show up in search results as you'd imagine. But our head element goes even further than the web. When Expo Head is used with universal links, it brings native Safari features to any iOS app. I'll show you what that means. So for example, you can look at any page inside of your Expo router application when using the new head element, and you can say like, hey Siri, uh, remind me of this later. And it will intelligently create a new reminder because it knows what this is because there's a URL registered at any time. Uh, so users can effectively save state and then rehydrate that state later. It's automatic accessibility. Then we've also introduced some new metadata properties, the Expo handoff property, which enables Apple handoff automatically for all of your screens. With this, your users can instantly transition from mobile to web to desktop to iPad to any of your devices while preserving state. When using your native app, a handoff button uh, will show up in the dock saying, you know, continue in Google Chrome. You'll click that button, and it will open up to the exact same URL, same query parameters, everything, automatically continuing you. You can make some modifications, do whatever you want, and then in the task switcher, you can automatically switch back, preserving all that same state. Again, the setup requirement for this is uh, nothing. You just build the app around the concept of URLs, and things like this are just possible. Uh, this is amazing for cases where you want to discover content on desktop, pass it over. But it also, because it has these query parameters in there, and those query parameters represent React state, it means we can do some really magical things where, you know, maybe you discover some content on web, greatest content in the world for discovery, and then uh, you, maybe you add some things to a cart or you make some modifications, scroll somewhere, then you want to hand off to your phone uh, where you maybe you make a purchase and you add notifications. You effectively have these flows now where by simply writing an app once, you can utilize the best of all of these platforms end to end, um, which is pretty exciting. So that's the new Expo head API. This module will come standard in Expo Router v2, uh, and it will be available in Expo Dev Clients and Static Routes. And of course, you can use it in any React Native app, just like all the other Expo features. So let's really quickly talk about bundling, specifically in Metro. As many of you know, uh, React Native is used at Facebook to build the Facebook app. And the Facebook app is very, very large. So standard, standard bundling solutions just, they don't really cut it in terms of speed and productivity. And this is all because, this is because all of the dependencies are always mapped uh, and bundled with each request and sent to the output bundle. Because historically, Metro has not supported the async import syntax. So to solve this, in, in uh, 2019, Meta developed the lazy and deferred bundling, which means that only the parts of the Facebook app that they were actually working on would be bundled. Everything else would be deferred until request time. Uh, which means drastically reducing startup times in development, especially when you work across teams. Now, we teamed up with the React Developer Experience team at Meta to integrate this system directly into Expo Router, offering users these same performance benefits right out of the box for the first time ever. And we call it Async Routes. So, with Async Routes, every screen is automatically deferred until you request it. Uh, you know, and then it's lazily loaded with suspense. You get this bundle indicator as it's bundling. It shows up, it's cached, so you can come back and test the instant transition. And this leads to much faster startup time and development. Because no matter how big your app is, you're now only bundling one page at a time. So it's effectively bundled at the same speed as an app with one page. Async Routes also enables much better upgrades because broken pages won't take down the entire app. You'll notice here I've got four tabs. The app only errors out when I open up the fourth tab. So if you have an app and you're doing some sort of upgrade, uh, you no longer have to fix 
every single screen all at once in order to use it. You can incrementally adopt and improve your app. Again, great for working across teams. This builds on our continuous native generation offering of config plugins and pre-building to just further improve the upgrading experience, which is already pretty sweet uh, because we love upgrading. And uh, well, actually, we don't love upgrading. We just want it to be automatic. So in a, a medium-sized app, kind of a moderate couple screens, we've noticed uh, three times faster startup speed when bundling that first screen because, I mean, it's not actually faster bundling. It's just split up and chunked around. Uh, and of course, it improves over time as your app gets larger. So that's the new async routes feature, uh, which will be experimentally available in Expo Router v2 and Expo SDK 49. Uh, and you can turn it on using the Expo Router config plugin. And we, again, really want to thank Modi Zilberman and his uh, team, the React Developer Experience team at Meta, for uh, their amazing contributions to this feature. Uh, we're super excited to bring it to people. But uh, settle down. Uh, on the topic of bundling, we believe that a fully universal stack is the future to unlocking some really imag like magical workflows, like a lot of the features that I just showed you that feel truly native that we just get for free. And we'll continue to build out functionality like React server components on top of Metro in these few coming releases. Uh, but as a result, we've begun sunsetting Webpack support in Expo. We've used Webpack for web only, and this has really limited our ability to share features across platform. Everything that we built into Expo Web was specific to Expo Web. Now everything we build on Expo Web automatically shared on native. Webpack support has been moved to maintenance mode, so it will continue to stay usable, uh, just like how the rest of the community has been using it. Um, but all new features, like again, server components, uh, Expo Router, these will all be Metro only going forward. Now when you switch to Metro Web, you get Expo Router, you get fast refresh, you get error overlays, you get unified logging, you get stack traces, unified exporting, and uh, you, you also get one other thing. Now, according to the React Native survey, the most missed feature in the React Native ecosystem is CSS and styling. And now that we have static rendering in Expo Router, this means that we work in a pipeline that compiles down to CSS. And then it's all statically extracted so that it can load inside of your binary without the need for JavaScript. You could make whole apps that don't even use JavaScript on web. CSS and Expo can also be customized using post-CSS plugins uh, and files that can be you know, imported from node modules. And then it all supports uh, hot reloading. And on native, Currently, the system basically just mocks it out. So no more having to wrap your imports in like styles.web and styles.native. Uh, it's basically all behind the scenes now. It's all powered in Rust, thanks to Lightning CSS. As a result, um, it's ridiculously fast. Minifying and parsing CSS is both uh, four times faster than ES build, and it's uh, roughly 130 times faster than JS tools like CSS Nano. So it's pretty fast. And in the future, we can leverage this new CSS pipeline in Metro to add native support for very scoped CSS features like Tailwind or CSS modules uh, as well, which will radically simplify the approach of web developers coming over to native, uh, which we just think is really important. We feel that React Native should feel like React on native and also native with React. Um, and we know CSS is possible. We've got examples and demos, but we won't be releasing until sometime after uh, SDK 49. Uh, here's a quick demo uh, of just using CSS modules in Expo Web. Uh, do you see it here on native and web? We just 
parse the results, and then we can pull it in. Uh, we also have access to different CSS units, things that work much better on web uh, or more dynamic. And then the way we'd import it is just as a module, and we treat it like it's more styles, just like if we defined it with stylesheet.create. Uh, so it's a solid alternative. And we, um, we think that the way people will use this is not directly. They'll mostly, it'll mostly be utilized by libraries like Tailwind and Tamagui as this underlying bundler primitive, uh, which they can compile down to. So effectively, what this means for you as users is that the results are substantially faster, far more real, and at no point do you have to feel like you need to switch around your tooling in order to uh, achieve really performance styling. It's just built right in. Uh, so we're really excited for the value that this is going to add. And first class styling will be coming in June with SDK 49, available in any React Native project uh, by installing Expo and using Expo CLI. And that is the new Expo Router V2 lineup. Styles, bundling, faster bundling, better at scale, um, TypeScript everywhere, static routes, searchability. Um, we are extremely, extremely excited to release this. Uh, we just believe that a high performing, shareable native experience is important to the future of the web. And we believe that everyone should be able to build it regardless of team size, which is why we are just, I mean, yeah, we've been working on this for a while and we're, we're really excited. The new features will begin rolling out and releasing Expo SDK 49. And uh, if you're as excited about the future of mobile computing as we are, then I highly recommend you reach out to us on Twitter at Expo or come find us at the show. Um, if you wanna join the team, we would, uh, we'd love to talk. And you can find me on Twitter at Bacon Bricks. I'll be tweeting out links to everything, so you don't have to take my word for it. You can, you can just try uh, all the new features in the alpha. And um, yeah, thanks. All right, all right, all right, thank you. Uh, now we're entering the, you know, one of the more exciting parts of the day, which is lunch. Uh, I guess. PM local time here. Uh, we'll start the expert panel with the expo team uh, upstairs. And if you need any more encouragement to join, uh, the bar will also open uh, upstairs at 2 p.m. So there will be beer there. So go grab a beer and talk to the expo folks. And if you're joining us from home, uh, the live studio will be uh, continuing shortly. We first have William Candion and then Caddy Kramen. But that's it for me. Uh, happy lunch. I'll see you after. In Krakow, a remarkable journey awaits you through time and culture. Science and innovation. From the foundations of an ideal city, Nova Huta, golden dream of socialism, to the medieval city center. Besides monuments entered on UNESCO heritage list, Krakow has something else to offer. People. In Krakow, every year close to 200,000 people complete their higher education. This includes almost 6,000 foreigners. These are specialists in almost every field from IT to biotechnology. No wonder that global players open their affiliates in Krakow. Krakow has become the center for modern services in Europe. 
Krakow is also a mecca for innovative business. From small catering unit to internet startups. A few of them have become world famous brand names. Our town is called the Polish Silicon Valley. By investing in infrastructure and transport system, we draw closer to each other. Local public transport is considered to be the best in the country. The blue trams and buses carry a quarter of a million passengers each year. The map of the town shows that museums play a special role, especially those that have outstanding collections uncomparable with anything else in the world. As for instance, the Wawel Museum of Aviation, the only one of its kind in Poland. Here you will find in this part of Europe the largest library with access to books that constitute not only Polish heritage, but also that of all Europe. Old and modern architecture are the town's strong assets. In these interiors, not only are extraordinary concerts held, but also great sports and artistic events. One of these extraordinary places on the map of Krakow is Małopolski Garden of Art, an area for the implementation of innovative art projects combining many fields of art. Krakow, due to its center of Congress, has become one of the leading places in Europe where both cultural and trade events are organized. Krakow is increasingly associated with excellent cuisine. Its restaurants offering both traditional Polish food dishes as well as those representing other often distant lands gain recognition amongst residents, tourists and culinary experts. Hidden in the medieval cellars or located in sophisticated townhouses, vibrant centers of social life may be found. Krakow is a town which is unique, intriguing and surprising. A unique mix of history and modernity inspires action. Experience Krakow. And if you want to become a Node.js developer that can build end-to-end -end applications, join our thriving community at nodejust.dev and I'm gonna help you master full-stack mobile development by building applications users love. Code like zero degrees, I'm not the case, gotta let out the beast. 
streets. Revolutionary guy, let out the streets. Locked in a cage, I'ma let out the hood, out the hood, out the hood. Wake up, get out the sheets. We came from wrong, man, forget my peace. You take the west side, take out the east. I'ma put him in a cage, never let out the hood. Oh, God. Okay, so we're back with Studio Live. I hope that all of you have enjoyed the last couple of talks. Um, I'm Camila, and... I'm Wojtek. Yeah, and now we get to chat with William Kandian. So, hi, William. Hey, hi. Yeah. Hi, it's really nice to have you here. And hi, to, it's really nice to have you here. And I have a question. Because last year I attended your workshop you created in cooperation with Christoph Maguera, and... This year you get a talk, and I just want to ask you, how was it different to create a talk from creating a workshop? Uh, which one do you prefer, really? I have to say I think I prefer to prepare for a talk because it's a lot of work, but then the delivery is fairly short. Where the workshop, it's a long delivery. So, but I heard that this year the reanimated workshop was amazing, so I was really happy to hear that. Yeah, it was great. And actually, we touched the topic of your cooperation with Christoph Maguera already. So can you talk about a little about it? Yeah, I mean, it has been really fun to, to work together. We, you know, every time I jump on a call with uh, Christoph, I get so inspired. And um, he's always so, you know, open to discuss ideas. And, and this is how the collaboration with the reanimated integration and, and Skia uh, came along. And uh, it's, just, it's just really fun. Yeah, and you're saying that Skia is ready for all those fancy animations we're going to create. So, yes, the part with Reanimated, I, I would say so. And um, lately I was doing a lot of content around Skia. And I think now that we have brought back Reanimated into the picture, it's going to be time to, to do uh, maybe more also Reanimated content and put everything together. Finally, we, we can do it, I think. Yeah, so we unlock the full potential of potential of reanimated in Skia or it's some new things coming still? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. So, um, so the way we think about animations, there are animations which are completely undeterministic. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen. It's a side effect, a user event. And for this, reanimated is, is fantastic. And then there are animations which are completely deterministic. So if you think about a low TV where you just play, so we know the whole uh, sequence of, uh, of animations. And with Skia, we really want to support both types of animations. And I think we have like, um, some really fun and cool ideas on how we are going to enable the user to set the cursor on going like, full reanimated or maybe have more deterministic and declarative approach. Um, an example of that is that you know, we have people who have Skia canvas with thousands of views, little views that animate. But then there is only one reanimated values that drives the whole animation. So parts of it are completely deterministic, parts of it are undeterministic. And we think we're onto something good that will enable to set the cursor on where you, you want your animations to, to be and how, and it should be very fast. Yeah, and probably the best part about it will be that you will create a great YouTube video with tutorial and teach us how to use it really when it's out. Hopefully, <laughs> yes. Yeah, so I'm um, talking about content. I know that you've been really active on YouTube lately. So I wanted to ask, are there any kind of videos that you're particularly happy about or anything that's gotten kind of really good reaction with your audience? Um, so in terms of future content, so definitely excited to bring Reanimated back to the mix because that's how it all got started. And 
Yeah, um, one thing funny is that I did an April Fool's joke video. Yeah. But actually, people said, no, but you should really do this seriously. And so we, are, we might bring back the joy of painting with Kia videos in the future. And yeah. I hope you keep the hair yeah. you use. Yeah, yes. break out the Bob Ross yes. afro, right? <laughs> Just wanted a good excuse to. <laughs> And I hope you one day create a library that we can use all those fancy colors as a names, like, I don't know, sea blue on watermelon yes. red. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, so um, I know that this is you know, another time at AppJS, and we're hoping to see you at next year's edition. And I'd just really like to thank you for coming here and you know, working on the workshops and also the talks. And yeah, so thank you for joining us. Um, in a couple of minutes, we're going to be coming back with another talk with Caddy, so stick around with that, and we'll have a bit of a break and then move on to the next talks. Thank you for having me. Oh. Okay, Thanks. thank you. In Krakow, a remarkable journey awaits you through time and culture, science and innovation. From the foundations of an ideal city, Nova Huta, golden dream of socialism, to the medieval city center. Besides monuments entered on UNESCO heritage list, Krakow has something else to offer. People. In Krakow, every year close to 200,000 people complete their higher education. This includes almost 6,000 foreigners. These are specialists in almost every field from IT to biotechnology. No wonder that global players open their affiliates in Krakow. Krakow has become the center for modern services in Europe. Krakow is also a mecca for innovative business, from small catering unit to internet startups. A few of them have become world famous brand names. Our town is called the Polish Silicon Valley. By investing in infrastructure and transport system, we draw closer to each other. Local public transport is considered to be the best in the country. The blue trams and buses carry a quarter of a million passengers each year. The map of the town shows that museums play a special role, especially those that have outstanding collections uncomparable with anything else in the world. As for instance, the Wawel Museum of Aviation, the only one of its kind in Poland. Here you will find in this part of Europe the largest library with access to books that constitute not only Polish heritage but also that of all Europe. Old and modern architecture are the town's strong assets. In these interiors not only are extraordinary concerts held, but also great sports and artistic events. One of these extraordinary places on the map of Krakow is Małopolski Garden of Art, an area for the implementation of innovative art projects combining many fields of art. Krakow, due to its center of Congress, has become one of the leading places in Europe where both cultural and trade events are organized. Krakow is increasingly associated with excellent cuisine. Its restaurants offering both traditional Polish food dishes as well as those representing other often distant lands gain recognition amongst residents, tourists and culinary experts. Hidden in the medieval cellars or located in sophisticated townhouses, vibrant centers of social life may be found. Krakow is a town which is unique, intriguing and surprising. A unique mix of history and modernity inspires action. 
Experience Krakow. And if you want to become a Node.js developer that can build end-to-end -end applications, join our thriving community at nodejust.dev and I'm gonna help you master full-stack mobile development by building applications users love. Welcome back. Um, again, I'm Camila, this is Wojtek, and now we have the chance to speak with another one of our speakers from today's talks, Kadi Kaman. So, hello. hello. Again. Okay, so I know that you mentioned during your, your talk that you narrowed it down to about kind of two points um, of how to get a five-star app, and I was wondering with Wojtek, like, could you tell us a little bit about the points that maybe are also important, but didn't have like time to touch on during your presentation? Yeah, that didn't make the cut. Well, I did try to uh, combine the uh, two points into well, like all the ten that mm -hmm. I started out with, but one that didn't make the cut. Um, it was because it's quite difficult to explain, but it comes down to think about the user. Mm -hmm. rather than what you want to build. So as developers, we often think like, oh, this would be nice to build, but we're not thinking about what it would be like to use this thing. So an example is uh, a lot of animations. So we like doing lots of uh, animations to just add some delight mm -hmm. and like make things look pretty and make them a bit shiny and make them a bit exciting. But if you think about as a user, when every time you open a notification, you get this full page animation that takes four seconds, that's actually going to create a frustrating experience mm -hmm. rather than a delightful one. So with every single feature that you add to your app, the first thing you should be asking, do the users actually want that? What would it be, what it, would it be like to use this day to day? Yeah, so if, if it's actually adding value versus being like an overstimulation or something like that, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And um, also, a lot of users, okay, so the features that I've built that I'm really proud of, a lot of them are animations. So, for example, if you have a flat list and it, you, know, it, you scroll it and then the header animation like whizzes up really gracefully, I'm really proud of these. But these are the things that I really like. Other developers are impressed, but users don't really care. Mm -hmm. So they just want things to work. So it's finding that balance between like, what you want to build and what the users actually want to use. Mm -hmm. So yeah, when you create those fancy animations, it happens that those things work 
works better on different devices, like for example iOS, and it works worse for and Android devices. And you can see it in the app reviews. So definitely. Do you think this gap between the platforms will be smaller with with time, or just be bigger? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I was quite interested. I was quite surprised when I found out just how big the gap is. Mm -hmm. Like, I have personally seen that um, Android reviews tend to, on average, be lower. And I have also experienced that it's more difficult to build Android apps, even with React Native. And the reason for that is that there is more of a variety of Android devices. So for an iPhone, even a low-end iPhone costs several hundred pounds or dollars. Um, whereas you can get a low-end Android phone for a couple of hundred pounds, mm -hmm. like easily. You can get a hundred pound. You can get an Android phone for a hundred pounds, right? But not a good one. And obviously, when you have less processing power, uh, you have a, a, a smaller display. You will get a subpar experience in apps. Mm -hmm. And when we're building apps, a lot of the time we're building them to work on the highest possible device, and we're often forgetting the lower devices, and they're the ones that are getting um, more of the negative reviews. So because Android has more of a breadth of devices, especially like high-end versus low-end, like it's the low-end devices that are suffering, and this is reflected in the reviews. And I think you were asking whether this is going to change. I think it would only change if Android took the same path as iOS to be more exclusive mm -hmm. and um, more conforming to a norm, which I can't see happening, to be honest. So do you think it's reasonable to limit your application to the newest SDK for Android because the older devices tend to be uh, slower and tend to drag your reviews down because the app is not going that well on those devices? Well, I think that depends on your target market. So if, you, if you're OK with cutting out those users as, as users of your app, so for example, if you were building an e-commerce app, then any person that couldn't download your app is a, per a potential person who could have made a purchase and won't. right? So if you are happy to take that risk that they don't use it at all, then sure, you could cut it out. If you have a really high-end app, say that you know, you're doing video streaming, right? That's something that's very difficult to do right on a low-end device, then I think it would be valid to limit your SDK, but otherwise, not really. Yeah, and talking about apps, I just wanted to ask, do you have any kind of favorite apps or any of your most used apps? Well, the thing is, as I mentioned in my talk as well, we tend to have a base level of expectation of things just being good. So it's very difficult to find my favorite app because they just work. I mean, something I use very often, I use the Notes app. Mm -hmm. You know, it syncs between my, uh, my phone and my laptop. It's very easy. I quite like the Slack app. Um, I obviously like the app that I'm, I'm building on right now. I'm very proud of it. Um, yeah, just anything that works and doesn't crashes on me. I'm, I'm, I'm very happy with the developers who do that. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Okay, so then um, I think that uh, I'd just like to thank you for joining us and also for giving an awesome talk before. And yeah, so we'll have a bit of a break now and then we'll be back later for some more talks. So uh, tune in soon. Thank you. Awesome, thank you very much.
Welcome, welcome. Uh, it's time for the afternoon portion. Hello to everyone here and everyone joining us at home. Are we ready for this next block of talks? Are we ready for this next block of talks? Yes, that means you. Yeah. I hope you had a great lunch, or if you're joining us from home, I hope you had a great breakfast, lunch, or dinner, or whatever time it happens to be in your neck of the woods. But welcome back anyway. And I hope you have coffee or beer uh, because I'm about to announce our next speaker. I'm very excited to introduce her. She's come all the way from Connecticut, uh, works at Shopif Shopify. Please give a nice, loud, warm welcome to Monica Restrepo. JS again. Uh, thanks to you for coming. Uh, my name, uh, as it was presented, is Monica Resrepo. I work for uh, Shopify as a software developer. Um, one of the best things about React Native, uh, as you probably already know, is the community support and uh, the interest of companies and developers of making it better. Uh, but have you seen how fast it evolves? How fast frameworks and libraries overall upgrade to include uh, fresh new things? Um, but have you also noticed how slow the process of getting um, to upgrade a brownfield app uh, to use these new features is? Um, this is because every mobile app is different, of course. Uh, many of the changes that we are introduced in React, uh, especially the architectural ones, are more focused on greenfield apps rather than brownfield apps. Um, and obviously, there is a dependency on, well, dependencies, right? So uh, today I would like to give us a refresher on today I would like to give us a refresher on why app upgrades are challenging. Uh, talk about a little bit uh, um, what has been our experience at Shopify with this. What have we learned from those various upgrades that we have and we have not done yet? And um, what processes do we have in place to account for these difficulties we're upgrading? So let's start with the first one. Um, why are app upgrades so challenging? Um, from my first years as a de uh, mobile developer, I will never, I was working for MLS at the time, and I will never remember, um, forget, uh, how um, one day I just nicely volunteered to upgrade our application for, I think it was 0.56 to 0.59. Um, and I will never forget this uh, for two reasons. Uh, so the first one is, one, just not volunteer for this type of work alone. And then uh, the second one is I obviously ended up getting one of the most painful tickets I have gotten so far in my career because uh, our application was a hybrid app. Um, it had a lot of uh, SDK integrations into it, many dependencies. So the process was uh, really torturous. Upgrading React Native mobile applications can be challenging uh, due to many things, uh, but I just grabbed a few just, again, as a refresher for us. One of them is obviously breaking changes. React Native is an open source project, as we know, um, that is constantly evolving. So new versions often introduce breaking changes that can just cause uh, our existing code to stop working or to behave differently. Upgrading to a new version might require also significant refactoring of uh, our application's code. And even though the React Native team already has a great job at maintaining the change log where we can see all the difference between like, versions and all that, um, things breaking in our applications, uh, something it is something that is unfortunately almost for sure every time we upgrade. Another reason for upgrades to be so challenging is dependency management. So uh, this one is a fairly common reason for you to uh, not be able to upgrade to um, your application to use the latest versions of React or just even uh, to upgrade libraries in general. Take, for instance, Fabric. So Fabric is one of the most uh, promising features of the new architecture. And um, it offers really good benefits for any application. I, I think majority of applications would like to upgrade to use it uh, because it offers simplified bridge, uh, better UI responsiveness, and asynchronous rendering. 
But uh, if one of your dependencies in your application doesn't, is not compatible with Fabric, so then you are stuck without it. React Native application dependencies on, uh, I'm sorry, React Native uh, depends on many third-party applications. So when upgrading, um, these, application, these dependencies might also need to be updated to ensure compatibility with our applications. This can be complex. Um, as some libraries might not yet support the latest versions of either React or another library, or might have their own breaking changes. So we usually have to wait for those to solve first on their own. And you know, work, uh, teams work differently at different speeds and all that. Another reason why uh, upgrades are painful and challenging is uh, platform-specific issues. So as you know, React Native aims for, uh, to provide a unified development environment for both iOS and, and Android platforms. Uh, however, each platform has its own set of native APIs, um, components that are different, and design patterns that are just different. So upgrading React Native might introduce platform-specific issues that require additional, uh, additional debugging and platform-specific code changes as well. As a little example, so um, when we use Upgrade Helper, which is uh, the tool that uh, probably you are very familiar with, uh, that helps us just go through the process of upgrading our applications, we, we have seen that uh, some of those changes listed for iOS are listed on, um, in Objective-C, right? So um, in our case, we use Swift. So another layer of complexity, which is not super terrible, but it still is something to add into the workload of upgrading, is just to translate in between Objective-C into Swift, for instance. Um, tooling and building systems. React Native uses, again, platform-specific uh, build systems like Xcode and Gradle for Android. Upgrading React Native uh, sometimes requires updates in these build systems. We can, ch uh, we can be a little bit challenge, um, challenging, specifically for developers that are not super versed in uh, how um, these uh, building systems work. And uh, you know, it, again, adds complexity to that. Who hasn't spent tons of time just setting up uh, a local environment to make it work? I definitely have. Quality assurance and just testing overall. So um, ensuring that an upgraded React Native application works correctly in all uh, devices uh, is very important and can be time consuming. So um, there are auto automated testing tools like Detox and um, Opium that can help, but manual testing is almost a most for every application. Um, so we are able to catch subtle issues uh, with the upgrades that we're doing, right? And we, we are able to ensure high quality of our applications before they hit um, production. So this is why upgrades are something that we have to think uh, as a whole team when we are thinking of them, just so everybody is aware of what to do and so on. And then finally, we have the lack uh, of an official upgrade path uh, for these upgrades. So again, we have all the contributors of uh, tools like Upgrade Helper uh, doing a great work at uh, helping us to start our upgrades. But as mentioned before, there is not a, a, a official path um, for an upgrade for the, all the applications. There is not like one, all, one fits all type of system. So uh, whatever works for us, uh, Shopify might not work for any of your applications. Uh, this means that in many occasions, uh, developers must face a lonely route to get to the upgrade and uh, obviously rely on community-driven sources and just their own experience to uh, be able to, to bring the upgrade all the way to the end. So uh, what has been our experience at Shopify? So I'm going to start with the elephant in the room. Obviously, uh, we haven't uh, yet upgraded to use the latest uh, React Native architecture. Some of the reasons is uh, to be in this current state is because uh, we, you know, some of the reasons I listed before in my slides, but also because we have different priorities at the time. It's definitely that we're something starting looking into with more speed, for sure. Uh, that being said, we have uh, definitely dealt with many upgrades within our applications. Uh, we have seen dark times and many things broken as well. Um, and we have also tested victory when our upgrades finally go to, uh, you know, our applications go back to life after the upgrades. So let's take a look at some of the struggles that we have faced uh, at Shopify when upgraded to either libraries or just uh, a new version of React Native. Since many of our applications at Shopify are also hybrid applications, um, there has been many cases when our upgrades to either libraries or just new architectures or new versions of React have, uh, have pushed us to patch some of our core libraries. This is a very common pattern, uh, I'm pretty sure, for many of your applications as well. So this makes it so the list of patches that we have in our applications is not one to ignore. We have quite a few. And, um, 
So every time there is a new React Native version out there that we want to bring into our applications, we also have to take into account those uh, patches that we have in place. Sometimes the perfect outcome um, is that the issue that motivated the patch is solved by the new upgrade, which is awesome. We just get rid of the patch and then just work with whatever we have new. But there are times that we also have to either upgrade those patches or just create new ones uh, to account for whatever is, is breaking at the time. Uh, this is one of our big limitations when it comes to upgrading, especially when it comes uh, to architectural changes like the not so recent anymore, but like many, uh, you know, the new version of React. Um, as another example, I don't know if you recall, but back in 2018, uh, I think it was version 0.54 of React. Um, React introduced a, a significant change in the way promises were handled. So this was a change due to the update in the GSC uh, engine, which, um, as you know, is used for um, execution of JavaScript code by React. Um, and this includes some improvements to the way, again, uh, promises were handled. So this basically, this basically meant that we could start using uh, async and, and await to have a more concise and readable way to work with promises, and, we can, and the, that we can also start using the finally method uh, just to be able to send and attach callbacks to our promises and uh, you know, have them execute uh, even if the, regardless if the, if the uh, promises were fulfilled or rejected. So with this upgrade, we got uh, our applications, uh, applications to build. And this in case was just one application to build. CI passed, and everything was uh, looking good. But then we have a lot of issues with uh, our unit tests, because they weren't prepared to uh, these sort of changes. And uh, as you know, testing is very important. So this was also something that uh, definitely something that we needed to pay attention to and take care of. We ended up having to patch uh, our unit tests so they were able to process and use uh, the new functionality, or at least just to run and uh, keep our things safe while the, the new functionality was being used in our application. Another case um, that we recently experienced uh, related to upgrades uh, was upgrading was one, sorry, one of our versions of uh, WebView. Like, we have a dependency for it, so we upgraded it. This was uh, very surprising because we thought it was going to be such a simple change. Uh, it was uh, even dependable, was the one suggested uh, to do the upgrade. It was a minimal version upgrade. Uh, but then things started breaking. And, and it was a hard issue to debug because the reason why things were breaking uh, was while the app was in background mode. So there wasn't a lot of things like uh, strategies to use when debugging that. Um, so after many hours of trying to debug this, we finally found out that the issue was actually coming for the upgrade itself. So the newest version of the dependency uh, came with some faulty, some things that were faulty, or at least didn't uh, work well with our application. And then we also found out that there was a web view that we were using, or, or rather rendering on the, when the app was in background mode. I think uh, this was to send some data or, or something to one of our other applications. Um, and then this was the reason why the application was breaking. So we have to revert the upgrade in this case, unfortunately, and we're waiting for like, uh, the library to just to solve this issue so we can re-implement it. So based on this, uh, what have we learned at Shopify from these uh, experiences and many other that we have had? So the first one that I have uh, quite repeat a few times already is that there is no one fits all solution. So um, the team at Meta and obviously all of the contributors of the uh, React Native um, repo do a great job on moving the framework forward uh, to improve mobile development, but catering solutions on a case-by-case -case basis is obvious almost impossible um, for them or any company overall, right? So that's an obvious one. Uh, testing mechanisms are crucial. So to mitigate or to bring uh, to surface the negative effects of, uh, of an upgrade, um, we have to have these mechanisms in place so uh, we assure, again, that the quality of our applications is great before uh, hitting production. Then upgrading the whole framework is not a one dev job, as I thought before, uh, and it requires time and planning ahead. And having a whole team being at least involved and aware of the upgrade happening so everybody can keep an eye out for you know, things that are breaking or like the new, even the new changes uh, so they can be used within the application. React Native is also a work in progress. Oh, I'm sorry, I just missed one of the slides. Um, React Native is, a, is a, always a work in progress. So um, we, you know, as much as React Native has evolved during the, all these years to become one of the best solutions out there uh, for mobile development, it is still a work in progress and is hopefully and uh, you know, 
going to be like that forever. There is always something good to do. Um, so collaborating to make the upgrades smoother is not only, uh, not only for greenfield apps, um, it's a task for all of us actually. Um, and there is also a great helper, which can also uh, use some love from us um, to help us like overcome this. Okay. So then I want to just uh, conclude with some of the, uh, the strategies that we currently use or some of the processes that we kind of like intuitively have in place to um, avoid having a lot of like setbacks when it comes uh, to developing our applications. And this especially obviously related to upgrades. Um, so at Shopify, we uh, strike for always staying up to date or at least try to. We regularly uh, update our applications and, and dependencies to avoid failing too far behind. So this can help minimize the impact of breaking changes that make uh, future upgrades less challenging. In other words, we do, we don't, and I suggest, we suggest uh, for you to do not dismiss a small version of uh, either a library that you're using that is important or just React Native overall, just because it doesn't seem to be impactful enough. At least uh, don't do it if it doesn't break anything in your, in your application. This definitely will cut off some of the uh, trouble when major versions are published. Um, we also use, uh, in particular, Dependabot, which I find really useful for like just tracking in case you don't, you know, it, it gets cumbersome just to have to go through all of your libraries if, it, if this uh, tool didn't exist. Um, also, we embrace modularity, so uh, we try as much as possible to structure our application in a modular way. So with clear separations of concerns and well-defined interfaces, again, as much as possible. Um, and this can make it easier to update individual components and libraries um, without affecting the entire application and also establish end-to-end -to -end, end -end testing processes. And that brings us to, obviously, we invest in automated testing. Uh, testing React Native application is not always a very straightforward process, as you probably are familiar with that. We have some end-to-end -end testing in place at Shopify, but we also rely heavily on manu manual QA. We are lucky to have a big team uh, that can just like do, uh, you know, play the role of like being a QA person and just go around, click around, and just be able, uh, you know, break things if possible before we hit production. Um, we also have our own screenshot library uh, that is called React Native Testify. Um, which provides a set of tools and APIs that make it easier to interact with and uh, assert the behavior of React Native uh, components during testing. So this library is a key part of some of uh, our app testing process, since it allows us to register changes in the visuals of our application. So like things like sizing of our components, fonts, and things like that, uh, locations, appearance overall. And this is obviously um, something really hard to test uh, usually. So this uh, library is currently or like beta testing, and we're like you know, eventually and hopefully we'll be um, able to open source it. I don't know about that. It's not official, but I'm just thinking. Uh, so put it simply, um, establishing a robust, uh, a robust suite uh, automated test, sorry, uh, to catch regressions and just ensure that your application continues to work correctly after an upgrade is very important. Um, this can save time and effort in manual testing and help maintain a high level of quality. We also strive for being very proactive and addressing technical debt. This uh, goes a little bit along with the state, staying up to date. Um, we regularly review and refactor our application code uh, to address technical uh, debt, such as outdated libraries, deprecated APIs, and just to uh, suboptimal design patterns. This is part of the duties of like what our ATC developers do while they are like on call. Um, you know, to make the upgrade process smoother uh, as it helps maintain a long-term health of our applications. And finally, and it's not here in the slices, uh, slides, uh, but I think it's a still important part of the process. We stay also informed with anything that is happening within the community. So uh, keeping up to date with the latest developments in, React, uh, in the React Native ecosystem, including new releases, best, best practices, and just community resources uh, is one of our strategies as well to avoid fo uh, uh, falling behind uh, when it comes to upgrades. Um, and we currently support as well the release efforts of the official React Native team uh, and, um, and Meta, which is like, you know, I, I found to be really valuable for us. That's it. Thank you. Amazing. Isn't Monica great? Don't we love Shopify? Yes. How are we feeling?
You sound like a sad bird. Do you know that? Can we do like a... Everyone go like this. And I'll ask you again. Give me two seconds. Oh my God, welcome for the very first time. And I haven't asked you this question at all. How are we feeling? <laughs> That's better. Um, just a reminder, there's beer upstairs, expert lounges during the break, a whole bunch of fun stuff. Um, but uh, I think even more fun, now that we're all reanimated from lunch, uh, is introduce. <laughs> oh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you. I'm here all day and all of tomorrow. Um, is introducing our lovely next speaker. Can you do a little hello, a little wave? Um, I tried learning the proper Polish way to welcome Christoph, but I cannot make the noises in that order. Yet, my Polish is not that good, and by not that good, it's zero. But one day, I'll come back to AppJS and make all the noises appropriately in that order. Um, Christoph here is an open source developer at Software Mansion, who are one of our lovely organizers today. Uh, open source is obviously a very important and be a very big part of this community. It's hard work. Um, so it's good that Software Mansion is supporting that. Um, and Christoph is going to talk to us about reanimated a little. So please give a big animated welcome to our next speaker. So, mic test also, it seems work, okay. So, uh, hello everyone, I hope you are doing well. I'm glad to speak you, uh, to you today. Uh, so, I am uh, Krzysztof Jaskowy, but Polish pronunciation is a bit strange, so you can call me Chris. Uh, okay, but... So, uh, I am working at Software Mansion as a React Native open source developer. I am also maintainer of the reanimated library, and that's why I'm talking about animations. Uh, this talk, I would like to start with a story about this gentleman. Uh, meet Tomek, yeah? Perhaps he's sitting somewhere here, and Tomek, uh, together with me, uh, work on reanimated, uh, and we have a lot of fun with it. Uh, Tomek usually arrives uh, to the office earlier than I do, and his desk is uh, right next to mine. One day, I come to office, I look at Tomek, uh, he look at me, and he starts to smile, but with very specific type of smile. I mean, this specific type of smile. And I know that he did something big. So uh, then Tomek called me uh, to come over to his desk because he wanted to show me something. And he showed me this. Give me one second. OK, this nice uh, billiard game. OK, and also show me this one labyrinth game. And I was surprised what he was able to do just in React Native. Uh, until that moment, I always thought uh, about the games as something that required native programming rather than JavaScript. Uh, but what I saw, it wasn't enough for me. I was hungry for more. Uh, I have started to think about something a bit bigger, about this. Uh, but <laughs> bad news, unfortunately, Tomek didn't do it. Uh, so I need to went back to my desk and started thinking about the future of React Native. Uh, then I asked, asked myself perhaps the one most famous question in React Native world. Can it be done in React Native? Uh, and in this particular moment, I didn't uh, yet know the answer for that question. So I started to look around, and my first discovery was ExpoGL. So uh, ExpoGL is a library that offers you GL view, which acts as a renderer target for OpenGL. In simple terms, uh, GL view is visual display that presents the output from GPU, which is computed by the shaders. So 
ExpoGL is built on top of OpenGLS, uh, which is natively supported on iOS, Android, and even uh, on web. Uh, does mean it doesn't require any additional uh, heavy dependency to run it. Moreover, uh, ExpoGL is also compatible with uh, WebGL API, uh, which provides you access to wide range, ready to use uh, shader that are available on the internet. Uh, with ExpoGL, you can directly use those sh sh shaders to create uh, impressive visual effects directly in your application. But what are the shader and how to use them in the app? So basically, a shader is a small program that is running directly on your GPU. And it doesn't mind the bitcoins, yeah? Uh, OK. Uh, basically, uh, there are two main types of shaders. Uh, vertex shaders that calculate the position of elements or triangles, and fragment shaders that compute the color for each pixel. Uh, but for the, simpli uh, for the simplicity, let's focus mainly on fragment shaders. Uh, fragment shaders are essentially functions that uh, take pixel coordinates as input and return the new value color for this pixel. Uh, however, there are, there are two additional key characteristics for those functions. First, they are uh, run on GPU instead of CPU. And they are run in parallel. So each shader does compute in same time for same pixel. So you can basically run it in uh, compute uh, new graphics in real time. But let's jump to the example. Uh, we have a picture that is used as input data for the shader. Uh, each shader takes one pixel, pixel of this uh, photo as input. And its job is to add a little bit red to each pixel. Uh, the outcome is an image with a red mask appealed to it. Uh, but it's just a theoretical explanation. How does it work in, in practice? So let's take a look, look at the same scenario I explained before, but this time with the actual cell, shader source code. Uh, here we assign the original color of each pixel uh, in the photo. In effect, we ended up with a photo that is exactly the same as the original photo. Let's modify it a bit. Uh, we are going to modify each pixel, but adding some red color to it. Uh, to do this, we need to use a vector, uh, which contains RGBA value for each color channel, uh, with the uh, value range from 0 to 1. And final result will be exactly the same uh, as the red image, uh, red mask image I showed uh, before. Mm. Shader are essentially clever mathematical equation. Uh, to achieve slightly different effects, you can modify uh, previous shader by, uh, but making the red channel value depend on the scene of the x coordinate. Uh, as a result, we get some kind of wave pattern uh, on the image. Uh, but if we modi modify shader enough, we can achieve even effects like this. This is still shader. I am, I am so impressive uh, what is possible to achieve with just shaders. Uh, OK. And just quick recommendation. If you want to practice writing your own shaders or just need some uh, inspiration, uh, you should really check Shader Toy. Uh, it's, this is an awesome website for that kind of stuff. But how to use it in application? Yeah? Uh, to, find out, uh, to find out, I started playing around further with ExpoGL. I wanted to create 3D shape uh, so I thought uh, 3D cube would be a good starting point. Uh, and I begin with setting up the application. I was able to set up up with just two commands. And I was really surprised because I thought 
uh, I would have to do a lot of strange configuration to, uh, to get running it with 3D graphics, yeah? Uh, but, it's, uh, but it was actually really easy. Uh, at the beginning, I didn't know how to start, but, I, but then I remember that ExpoGL implements a WebGL standard, yeah? Uh, where in internet you can easily find a lot of use, uh, useful uh, resources about uh, WebGL. Uh, so I was able to write some code that let me show uh, the cube in, in app without much effort. Uh, basically, if you want to display a cube, you need to three things. Create GL view that will display the output from the shader. Uh, then you need to compile the sh vertex shader responsible for the position of the cube. And finally, you just need to add this uh, shader to GL context. And the last missing part is to write the shader itself. Uh, pay attention to the input matrix parameter, which controls the cube orientation in space. It's just some math. Uh, just displaying, but to be honest, just displaying a cube is so boring. So let's add some animations. Uh, we, but, but we want smooth animation. We don't want running animation on busy JavaScript thread. But, I, uh, but the solution is simple. We will use reanimated. Yes, the ExpoGL is integrated with reanimated. This allows us to update the GL context directly from uh, UI thread without any delays. Uh, to run the animation, we need uh, just two steps this time. First, uh, we need to create shared value and just start animation. Simple. Uh, then, uh, we need to update the matrix parameter in every frame of animation. Uh, the matrix presents the projection matrix of the cube. Uh, to update shader parameter, we need to, one, uh, get the pointer to shader input parameter, two, calculate the new projection matrix, yeah, that's point two, and three, update the value inside the pointer. Uh, since ExpoGL supports reanimated, uh, this also means that we can use gesture handler directly from UI thread. Uh, uh, here, uh, the code is almost identically to previous case. Uh, the only difference is that we are using gesture handler and modifying projection matrix in two different axes instead of just one, like before. Uh, what are benefits of having other libraries integrated with uh, reanimated? As it's known, uh, reanimated is running on UI thread. Yeah, it's running on UI thread. Uh, that means you don't need to set, uh, send commands through the bridge and serialize uh, and then deserialize it. Uh, we also can react faster to event and gestures. Additionally, uh, if the JS thread is busy, uh, we still can calculate smooth animation so we don't, uh, we don't lose frames. But going back to the example, let's think about how difficult it is to achieve such effect. Basically, uh, you need to know some math. I mean, uh, this, 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 this. So uh, that's the piece of math responsible for rotation the cube. Personally, I like math, but I can imagine that not everyone is really into it. Uh, but math is not all what you need. The vertex shader needs to know the coordinates of each vertex. So you need to provide them. Doesn't look really friendly, yeah. Uh, but here is also good news. So we don't need to uh, we don't have to manually define all vertexes. We can simply load the file that describes the 3D model and display it without writing own shaders. And here comes FreeJS, which provides 
a much simpler API, API uh, for manipulating 3D objects. Uh, the Expo team, Expo team uh, has bridged 3.js to make it possible to use it in uh, React Native by creating Expo tree package. Uh, this allows developers to take advantage of features that 3.js contains. Uh, it was possible due to uh, 3.js uses WebGL context provided by, by Expo GL library. Uh, the fact that 3.js is a powerful tool uh, is proven by advanced and so impressive examples presented on their website. Uh, so, we already have idea how to display objects using plain Expo GL. Uh, we know this is so powerful tool, but uh, not the easiest one. Uh, it requires knowledge about the GPU, about shaders. Uh, but what about using 3.js to achieve the effect shown on screenshot? Basically, we only need to load file with description of the model and display it uh, on the Canva. Simple and beautiful, right? Uh, but let's take it a step further. Let's add to it a bit of gesture handler and re reanimate it. Uh, it's just a matter of reading the gesture information uh, received by the gesture handler, then modifying a simple property on the mesh object. Mesh object and that's it. I think it's quite simple. Uh, the example that inspires me uh, comes from those tweets. Uh, it's great to see uh, people sharing such inspiring idea. Uh, let's see how it works. So uh, this example uses a uh, use animated sensor from reanimated. Uh, OK. Uh, taking the opportunity. I need to tell something more about Reanimated. Uh, I would like to show you a few uh, great uh, examples of using this hook. Uh, it may enrich your user experience of your app and allow you for creating 3D movement illusion. Yeah. Uh, also, uh, this time also, people were happy to share their idea. Let's take a look at on this, uh, this, uh, this, or this. OK. Uh, I would love to see how, uh, I would love to see more apps with this kind of features. Yeah. For me, pretty awesome. OK. It's, it's hard to not mention uh, another great tool that has gained more popular popularity recently. William has proven today, and not only today, uh, that using Skia you can paint like Bob Ross. Yeah, uh, so it's hard to uh, add more here. Yeah, uh, and but I just want uh, to mention that Reanimated is integrated with Skia also. Uh, how to add animation to Skia component? The answer is super easy, yeah? Uh, you can directly pass the shared value from reanimated as a property. In this case, the radius, yeah? And just animate it. Uh, then you can enjoy smooth animation running on UI thread. But what about gestures? Of course, it's also possible. Uh, one of our software mentioned open source goal was to provide a single, consistent, and simple API for gestures and animations. Now, all you need to know is just the API of reanimated and gesture handler. And you can simply use it in many different scenarios with different libraries. With Skia, reanimated a gesture handler, you can make an awesome effects like this one, or this one, or even this. Uh, the presented example, of course, I took from William's channel. Uh, if you want more content like this, I really recommend you to visit William's YouTube channel. Uh, before I finish, uh, on behalf uh, of the of open source team at Software Mansion, I would 
like to say uh, thanks to Shopify for their continuous support over the last few years. I would love to have uh, them as part of our community, and we appreciate they, all they do to driving this technology forward. And that's it. I hope I inspired you to give free animation a try uh, in your application. I think that 3D technology is a, a large untapped, untapped potential in a React Native world. Don't be afraid. Try to make your app stand out from the crowd. And remember, you are awesome. Thank you. That was amazing. I almost thought we were all going to get shoes, but I have been informed that we are not all getting shoes. Uh, just kidding. Look under your seat. Just kidding. No, we don't. Um, this next talk is very special. Uh, so special that it even has a handy assistant for it. Oh, where's our handy assistant? Anyway. Uh, we're very excited about this next talk. There's going to be some very cool stuff coming up. Our next speaker, before I hand it over to him, has come uh, all the way from Taiwan, which is very jet lag. Shout out anyone coming from that far, all the California people. Um, this conference has been going so well so far, and I just wanted to like do a little survey. Who came to this last time? Who's here for the first time ever? Ooh. Who traveled here from out of town? Oh, my God. Uh, Software Mansion, you should get money from the tourism board. This is incredible. Maybe that should be a good. Uh, we're still setting up. There may or may not be a special demo for this next talk. So don't go anyway. How many of you have already had a beer? I've been drunk all day. No, I'm kidding. No, I'm not allowed until it's over. I'm just naturally this nervous. Nope, still no. OK. How are we feeling? Front row, very brave. Kudos to you. Back row, cowards, it's fine. You don't have to be, you know, the hero in anything. Um, I have a small plug, which is, since I'm up here, and they gave me the microphone, and also a cool uh, ear headpiece thing, where they tell me my jokes. No, I'm kidding. I make them up myself. Um, I've been tweeting. And skeeting. Is that really what we're calling it? Does anyone here have blue sky already? Did anyone get codes from, yeah? Good vibes, right? A lot of butts. But you know, it's up to you, not that many, just like the right amount. At Ellie Belly, uh, if you want to say hello. If you're joining us from uh, the live stream from home, there's a lot of people in the live stream that are not here. Uh, I would love to see what your setup is. Are you watching from like your sofa or your office pretending to work or your bed on a plane, on a train? Uh, so please tweet that. Are we good? Are we excited? OK, OK. I am very excited to announce this next talk. Um, this is Kura Chen, who came from Taiwan. And, and can I get a wave from his lovely assistant, Gabriel, from behind the thing? Can you give us a little, just a hand? Gabriel. No. Just give us a little wave, just a hello. Yeah, he will help me with the demo. He's going to be our lovely assistant for the day. Uh, so I'm going to let you take it away with this amazing talk. OK, thank you so much. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome to the conference. I'm sorry I have a lot of stuff to set up today because I have uh, some live demo, maybe interesting. So I'm Kudo Chen. I work from Expo. And um, I actually, I'm thinking there's a lot of exciting, fantastic talks in this conference. So I'm trying to uh, talk something 
fun, uh, something fun while doing, uh, I'm doing on my spare time for you. So there's no expo stuff. That's relative skia. What? <laughs> What's that? <laughs> okay. Originally, I'm thinking the real native on Linux, but Skia is fun. So I'm trying to speak about Skia. Sure. And thanks for William Candina, where talk an exciting talk this morning. And he actually has a blog post on the Shopify blog. And they, he mentioned one renderer, three platform, and Three, as we think, is uh, iOS, Android, and web. Now we have the fourth. That's Linus with the uh, Skia. <laughs> Thank you. Actually, there was two. And let me show the history. And there's a totally different real native Skia, uh, even though it's the same name. But I will show you it's not so very confused because uh, the top one, which I released three years ago, which is uh, focusing on new platform. The other one, where it's Shopify, William, Candina, and Christian, is focusing on existing view, namely iOS, Android, and web. Right? But it's not confusing. Given now, not a. Okay. Ooh. Now that there's a lot of real native library, and both of them uh, on the button side talk about view or native module. So with a reanimated SVG or picker, talking about view. But there's rare exception, real native is not talking about view, which is uh, about platform, like Windows, Web, Mac OS. So we can think about, think about that real native skia could be both fit to a view and both, uh, and also to the platform. So that's actually real native skia from Shopify rendering on real native skia slash real native skia. All right, a little weird. <laughs> and yeah, last year being this exciting conference, I met uh, William my, our first time, and we took a good photo and have a good treat, like a real native skier reunion. And that's happening in real life. That's actually the two real native skier being reunion in the product life. So talk about the platform of the skier project, which built on top of the real native new architecture. How is it? That's a typical uh, real native component. And then on the old architecture mode, we, have, we call the paper mode. Typically, we have a real native render tree. And on each platform, we should have to do a lot of work to do the UI manager, to do the shadow tree, and mapping to the platform, a host platform tree, host platform UI tree. So if we fork the real native core and to support a new platform, there will be a lot of work. Thankfully, for the new architecture, especially for the fabric, right now we have a fabric UI manager and a shadow tree, which is written by C++. And the core can be shared to be different platform. And for the blue part building block, you don't have to re-implement again when you're working to support the new platform. All we need to do is to support the ground block where the mounting manager and mapping to the host tree. And real native skia did is actually replaced by host view tree to skia drawing command. So like a draw rack, draw image rack, and exactly that's what real native skia. And this project actually released three years ago. At that time, it's just a proof of concept. So I have a picture and a call at that time. And as a view, image, and text, just like that. Nothing else. So you cannot have a view border, view shadow, and image. You can even fetch image from the network. So network, no network activity at all. And importantly, there's no compositor. Uh, compositor is like a drawing 
between layer to organize things like uh, efficiency and doing correct. So I have a busy loop, like a keep painting, so the CPU will be very high. And in some case, if you're drawing the layer in incorrect order, you'll see the weird picture. That's why the proof of concept I showed before is a really simple use case. And I also think about like porting Compositor, because Compositor is a very complex building block in this system. So I think about to port some from something else that's called the Flutter Engine. And that exactly has a good fit for the Compositor, which is called the fl Flow Compositor. And built on top, there's a shell. And there's their APIs from pure C, so ABI safe and support each platform. If we can do in that, build on top of the shell and flow, we can literally support all the Flutter platform we want to support. And we also think about, like, call it real native Flutter. <laughs> OK. And unfortunately, Flutter's code is really tight coupled to the dot VM. So I tried uh, very hard to decouple from each code, but uh, it's too hard, so I gave up. So there's no real native Flutter. <laughs> OK, but what's the project stay in this year? After three years, so during these three years, what's happening? We now support more features. We support Linux. We support more view property, view Im image property, and especially score view. Score view is really complex. You have to do it from scratch, doing touch event, doing the um, score bar drawing. OK, that's another demo on Linux. So you can see there's a demo, uh, the touchable model. And you can see touch event is visible, focusing on different building block, score view. And then playlist also support. And touch input. So that's an on screen touch input keyboard. <laughs> okay. Another demo from the like a Real product one, like a, we can show you like a login form. So after login, so there's a TV poster. You can see different picture. There's scholar and focusing have a highlight, border, and shadow. Ooh. So that's the current state of the Reanimative Sphere. All this work is not done by myself. Actually, I do not, did not did much during these three years. There's a one fork called Nagra Open TV. So you can see from this GitHub graph, there's a, a lot of contributions from Nagra Open TV. But what's that? Um, it's actually a subcompany belong to the Kudaski group. And Kudaski group doing a lot of product in the world, like security, IoT. And Nagra team is focusing on embedded TV set-up box. So uh, what a coincidence, Kudaski, the founder, is coming from Polish. Ooh, how I got it. <laughs> OK, and that's. Uh, the guy reached out three years ago. Like he mentioned that uh, they want to port the Skia project to their embedded in a setup box product. So that's the beginning. And during these three years, they have more than 10 people involved in this project. And most importantly, their senior VP and direct, director uh, still keep uh, in helping uh, have a lot of people doing this project. So I was thinking this company is not very well known in the native community, but someone still in the world doing a lot of fantastic stuff to this community. So give them a round of applause, please. <laughs> OK. 
Thank you. Oh, yeah. There's another one from their repository called Build Loot React Native Skia, because when they are talking about porting React Native Skia on embedded Linux, they actually support different Linux rendering backend, like X11, Wetland, and Direct B. So we can actually run React Native Skia on this Raspberry Pi 3 device. I'm going to show you live demo. OK, because it's very hard to bring a large screen. So I have a Raspberry Pi with a, with a small screen building. Doing good? Okay. So we can take a little bit. Okay, that's better. So that's a the spare pie device. So we can see the different UI effect, text and border and JavaScript animation. That's one thing I want to mention because native animation driver is not implemented yet. So that's happening only on JavaScript thread. And the performance looks not so bad, right? Okay. And also we have the uh, image support and shadow. Okay. So that's the demo on Raspberry Pi device. Thanks, Gabriel. <laughs> Sorry, I have a lot of stuff. <laughs> and let's talk about their roadmap because they are uh, a TV setup box company. So right now they are trying to support uh, video player on this project. And furthermore, they try to uh, integrate more third-party library like uh, SVG, async storage reanimated, and also Shopify reanimative skia. Because the, I show you the previous ones that just proof of concept, and we need to formal support it. If you go into layer fork, like uh, this reanimative uh, linear gradient example, they have a skia folder, and there's a build.gen file inside. That's exactly how uh, the uh, project's build file is. So check it out. Why does the project stay after three years later? Why I think it's like a uh, different area. The first question is uh, which platform do you think is the best? Web view, Android native view, or Flutter? People tend not to answer the web view, right? But the fun facts the three platforms all rendering on top of Skia. But how does it happen? We talk about the rendering pipeline, this enjoy native view, four step from the view and go into the enjoy service, uh, lower hardware UI layer and go to Skia. Flutter, five step, widget tree, element tree, render object tree and go to Skia layer tree and passing to the enjoy service view. And web view, this is simplified version. So we generate a DOM tree, CSS OM tree, internally Chrome will generate fragment tree, property trees, display item list, and it's not stopped yet. We should pass the Skia command to Android native UI system to the view and hardware UI. And that's a full version from the web key. <laughs> that's the graph. Uh, from the Chromium's rendering architecture mode. So really complex. If you have a React built on top of WebView, it's actually adding more layer. So from the left-hand side there is a, a React element tree, which is virtual DOM. So there's a lot of step to causing why we have a slowness on WebView. So what's the React native on Android? Better one because we have a uh, element tree and going to the React Native shadow tree and the right hand side 
blue building blocks are uh, from the React Native, native uh, rendering pipeline. But if we talk about React Native Skia on Android, that's only four step, pretty much like a Flutter. So it's just a shadow tree going to the Skia render uh, layer tree and passing to the Android surface view. Pretty simple. So we can see maybe uh, if we're doing some, uh, if we keep involved, keep contribute to this project, we can have a promising speed like, uh, like Flutter. And I also think another good path for the React, which um, people going to tend to say React is a good path for the decorative style to write, in, write your UI. But I also see another good part the render have an abstract. So you have a React code. If you're running on, running on web, you use React DOM. Running on React Native, you have a React Native code. And the code is shared on top of C++. So we can have a different platform. And given like uh, the Shopify's React Native Skia has fantastic UI effect, you literally can draw anything on each platform. Now Skia supports six platform. So if uh, someone like using Electron, which is now very intensive to use a platform native UI, maybe it's a good option. So in the future, a uh, view, a uh, React Native view can be platform iOS UI view or HTML DIV, like a React Native web. And sweet UI, React, uh, like a Skia draw React. And versus the, we can also the HTML DIV to be React Native view. So that's so flexible of your code, like you can literally render it on any platform. But the project scope is still very high, uh, large scope. So help wanted, we still lack of CLI support, hard reloading, Hermes, and more third-party library integration. So help uh, if you seeing the, the future of this project, especially from the big company, we really help your help. Really help your join. Okay, before next session, which is uh, React Native on macOS from Microsoft. I was showing you another stuff because I'm a macOS guy. I literally not very um, familiar with Linux and I develop Skia project on macOS. So if it work, let's see, I'm a tester on macOS. So let's a React Native Skia uh, support both Linux and Mac OS right now. Okay, that's all my talk today. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Kudo, for that amazing demo. We love a bit of showmanship here at AppJS. Am I right? Shout out for the demo. That's really great. A uh, couple of fun reminders. The AppJS Twitter handle is appj at AppJSConf. So if you're having a good time, if you've taken photos on the neon wall, if you want to get really up close shot of your friends from across the room and tweet it into the world, uh, tag appjsconf, at appjsconf. I don't think there's a hashtag. We can make one if we want, because that's our power. There is no bluebird tag, but I think that's OK. Blue sky, sorry, not bluebird. What did I say? Um, I'm very excited uh, to introduce this next speaker. Um, how many of you use a Mac? Boy, you're going to love this talk. Um, please give, all the way from Seattle, a huge welcome to Saad Najmi.
Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Saad Najmi. Uh, I'm a software engineer at Microsoft. I've been there for about five years. I started off as a native Apple developer, since I'm in the Microsoft Office on Mac and iOS team. And over time, my role has kind of grown, and we started doing a lot of React Native stuff. Uh, the open source projects that me and my team are involved with are React Native macOS, Fluent UI React Native, which is our open source cross-platform UI library, and Fluent UI Apple, which is another open source UI library, mostly for a native Apple. For the purpose of this talk, I'll be talking about the first one, React Native macOS. So in this talk, I'm hoping that I can answer a few questions and then show you a few things and just show you the basics of how you can get started with React Native macOS. We'll first talk about what it is and how we, like why Microsoft decided to invest in React Native desktop overall that includes both macOS and Windows, where it's used out in the wild and in the App Store, uh, what's new, what are the things that my team has been cooking up down in Seattle, and I'd also like to talk about how you can use it, what are some of the APIs that are available that are common with React Native and also desktop specific, and I'd like to really quickly talk about some of the nitty gritty implementation details of how we brought React Native to macOS along with some useful tools in case you do decide to add macOS to your library and want to have a better maintenance story. So let's get started. What is React Native macOS? So to put it simply, we're an out-of-tree platform. And what that means is we're a fork of React Native core. For the purposes of this talk, I'm going to refer to upstream React Native as React Native core, just because there's so many forks to keep track of, and that's the easiest way for me to keep it all straight. So we're a fork of React Native, and we have implemented our UI library views stuff on top of AppKit. AppKit is the macOS equivalent of UIKit, in case you're familiar with that from the iOS land. And I do want to be clear, this is not WebViews, this is not Skia, this is truly built on the native UI platform of macOS. So the next question you might have is, why React Native macOS? Why does Microsoft care about React Native on macOS? And why am I talking to you about it right now? So let's start with why does Microsoft invest in React Native on desktop overall? If you look at the types of apps we have, say Microsoft Office, we have lots of large apps on many platforms. Office runs on Android, iOS, macOS, and Windows, and web. So that's basically everywhere you can think of running a large app like that. Uh, and in addition to that, we have a desire to develop new modern experiences that are cross-platform, that look and feel great on the platform, and can fit into our large and existing code base, otherwise known as brownfield development. So if you just have those three criteria, that already excludes a lot of other possible technologies. We couldn't do something like Electron, because that's uh, an all or nothing. You can't rewrite an entire app in Electron, or rather, we can't. Uh, we can't use something like Mac Catalyst, because that also is all or nothing. And you could use something like WebViews, but they, you don't get that like true uh, native platform integration that you do with something like React Native. So when you have these three considerations in mind, React Native feels like a natural fit. All right, so the next question you might have is why should you use or care about React Native macOS? And I'm not going to assert that it's like the best solution always. I think it is a solution that may work well for your use case. The first uh, obvious place is you have better platform integration. You can go down to native code. You can use the windowing API of desktop. You can use the native look and feel of the native app kit uh, controls. So that's one obvious win. The second is if you're a React Native or iOS developer, I think you'll find that React Native macOS is a very familiar and natural transition. A lot of the UI kit and app kit classes are the same, and a lot of the React Native JavaScript API is shared. And lastly, even if you never use React Native macOS, I truly do think that React Native on more platforms means a better React Native for everyone. As I mentioned, Microsoft invests heavily in React Native, and we, that means we do a lot of upstream contributions back to React Native core whenever we need to, say, refactor something to be a little more cross-platform. And that makes its way to everyone else and leads to a better community. So 
Next, I'd like to show you a few apps where React Native Mac OS is used. So I've already talked about Microsoft Office. Uh, we've had lots of conference talks in the past where we've showed off a lot of cross-platform React Native experiences in Office. So I won't talk about this one too much. Uh, the second one is Messenger Desktop. Messenger Desktop actually recently switched from Electron to React Native for their Mac OS and Windows app. And as far as I can tell, they have never looked back. I was listening to a talk they gave two years ago at ReactCon, where they said they had like an 80% reduction in binary size and like a 60% reduction in cold start performance, like truly massive improvements in numbers. Uh, so those are two big companies using React Native. I'd like to also talk about some smaller apps. The next two apps are actually made by the same guy. His name is Oscar Franco. He's been kind of tinkering with React Native macros for a while, and I wanted to, and I think he has some interesting use cases. So the first is CI Daemon. This is a simple menu of our app that just shows you the state of your CI builds in GitHub and other places. And it's like, I just like it because it looks good, but it also kind of shows you how you can use React Native in new contexts and places that you wouldn't have otherwise thought you could stick React Native. And lastly, this is actually one of my new favorite apps, is Soul. Soul is a spotlight replacement. Uh, it's all built in React Native. It's a floating, borderless window. And this is the type of thing that I, I would have never thought to build with React Native Mac OS. So it really goes to show that creativity knows no limits. All right. So those are some places where it's used. Let's talk about what's new. So first off, we released React Native Mac OS 0.71. Um, thank you. So this is the first version that's caught up with React Native Core. And by that, I mean you can use the same version of React Native, the latest version, on all the platforms for your app. If you've been following us for a bit, you might have seen that we're usually behind a few versions. And we've been doing a lot of work to catch up and sync literally thousands of commits so that we can be caught up and stay caught up in the future. And additionally, being on the latest release helps us use the latest new features from React Native like Fabric. So uh, I'm really, really happy to say that we've been working closely with the Messenger desktop team. And they've helped us to implement an experimental version of Fabric on React Native Mac OS. This uses the same setup as iOS, which is you pass in RCT new arc enabled equals one pod install whenever you're doing your pod install. And then you get a Mac OS app running on Fabric. Uh, yeah. So let's go to a demo. So I'm actually curious about this. How many of you guys have seen RN Tester in the past? OK, that's like a, maybe like 10% of the audience. OK, so if you haven't seen RN Tester, you definitely should. What RN Tester basically is, is a, the example app for the React Native repo. Uh, it has a showcase of every API that React Native Core has. And because React Native Mac OS and Windows are forks, we have an implementation of RN Tester on our repo. So I love this because it's basically living documentation for what works in React Native Mac OS and what doesn't. So if we look at something simple like view, you can see we have background color and border, things you would expect. But we also have some interesting things, like cursor, which lets you change the type of cursor that you have on your view. Um, you also have APIs. So we've got platform color. That's one thing that we do support. Um, actually, I think. The original platform color implementation was proposed by a React Native Mac OS maintainer back in the day. So that's one way that we have contributed things upstream. And we also have other stuff like app state. So if you're ever curious about like, what works and what doesn't, you can always just use RN Tester and find out. So I did mention that we have Fabric. So if I scroll one more to the left, you can see RN Tester and Fabric. Could you tell the difference? No? That's a good thing. That means it's working. So like, I, when I say this is active development, I really do mean it. We've merged like four or five pull requests just this week that made this demo a lot better. You know, like, this is really, really, really a good demo, and I'm really happy about it. Um, yeah, like, yeah, I'm sorry. Fabric makes me happy, and then I forget how to say words. Uh, I'd like to show off one more thing. We do have some native components that you can see like Switch. Uh, fun fact about Switch, before Mac OS 10.15, Mac didn't actually have a native Switch component. 
So in React Native Mac OS, we just put a checkbox in here. So yay, progress. All right, back to the talk. Let's talk about using React Native Mac OS. So some of our guiding principles when we're developing React Native Mac OS is we want to be as similar to iOS as possible. And that is because we share a lot of code with iOS, and the two native platforms are quite like, similar in code, too. Uh, and what I want you to take away from that is if you're developing a React Native app and something works in iOS and you're wondering, does it work in macOS, it probably does. And if you're not sure, you can always go and check R and Tester. So in addition to a bunch of the React Native mobile APIs, we do have some this desktop-specific APIs, because as we know, computers have mouses and keyboards and other stuff that phones don't. So let's walk through some of those. Uh, the first is we have some support for mouse handling. Uh, on top of view, we have on mouse enter, on mouse leave. You can use those callbacks to say, style a hover effect. You should be familiar with this from web. And in Pressable, those are mapped to the more cross-platform friendly names of on hover in and on hover out. On the keyboard side, we have support for keyboard focus. So we've exposed the focus and blur uh, properties so that you know when a view has been tabbed into, basically. Uh, the focusable prop was actually an Android prop that on desktop we ported to work for Mac and Windows. And lastly, we also have a desktop specific prop called enable focus ring. And what that basically says is either you can enable it to get the system focus ring or you can disable it to put your own custom styling. Uh, lastly, we have our keyboard event API. This is the most complex of the three that I'm showing, but this lets you listen to what keys you're pressing on a view while it has keyboard focus. Uh, we have the on key down and on key up that you should be familiar with from web. Uh, and we also have these additional props called valid keys down and valid keys up. Uh, these are macOS specific. We need them because of the way that uh, events travel both the native and JavaScript view hierarchy, and we basically need this to keep the two events in sync. Uh, it's effectively just an array of the keys you're listening to that you want on key down and on key up to fire for. Um, Windows has a similar set of uh, properties called key down events and key up events. All right, so I've shown you how you can use React Native. Now let's talk about getting started with React Native. What if you want to create a new, a new template project? So the natural starting place would be our React Native Mac OS init command. And what this is is you can initialize a normal React Native project using React Native init and pass it your version and all that stuff. And then you can run our React Native Mac OS init. This will add React Native Mac OS as a dependency, and it will copy and generate the uh, extra target in your Xcode project for the Mac for Mac OS and add some extra native files. It'll basically get you started with all the native boilerplate code that you need. And at this point, if you're feeling fancy, you can also run React Native Windows init. It's almost like those two commands are meant to be used with each other. <laughs> yeah, and that will get you the boilerplate code for a Windows project. Uh, we have the instructions for how to run this on aka.ms slash React Native. So at this point, I'm going to do a second demo. Um, so I've got, our, I've got our template project over here. Um, it's just going to show the Hello World screen. And you can see that we have our Mac OS, app delegates, and view controller. The view controller is what's creating our root view. So if I go and oop, close the Metro server from the other demo and start the one over here, and run this one. Oh, nope, that's not what I want. You have React Native Mac OS. So I want to take this one step further, and I want to see if I can make a menu bar app. I've shown you a few, I, I showed you a few of those earlier. I saw on Reddit that literally one other one came out like this week, again. A lot of stuff just happened this week. <laughs> uh, so I, what I did is I basically just Googled how do I make a menu bar app? found a bunch of links, and let's start modifying this project. So the first thing we need to do is, in our app delegate, um, we need to create a status item. This is the object that represents one of these uh, menu bar icons. And by the way, uh, 
I'm doing this demo in Objective-C, but you could easily do this in Swift. Um, I'm just choosing Objective-C because it's what the template's in. So next, we need to go and initialize that status item. Let's uncomment this. And uh, we need to set its image and its click handler. For the image, we can use our favorite app, Sol, to find the Apple system images uh, app. This is called SF, SF Symbols. And choose what we want it to look like. I found this one called Atom, which I think should work well for our use cases. And then we have to implement the show popover function. So this, if we uncomment this, will create an NS popover. Uh, you'll see what that is soon enough. And it will also add the view controller for the React Native view and show the popover relative to the button. And lastly, because AppKit can be annoying, we do have to override load view, which is going to create the parent view of the root view. And I'm just choosing a hard-coded size for this demo. So if I run this now, uh, wait, nope, I need to build it. All right, so we have our normal window. But if I minimize this, we now have React Native in a menu bar. Thank you. However, I am not done. So I have a secret reason for doing this in a menu bar. Uh, so back in my days as a native Apple developer, uh, when I was working on Fluent UI Apple on the Mac OS side, me and two of my coworkers, Mark and Lucas, uh, mostly Lucas, built this native date picker for Mac OS. Uh, this is because we were not happy with the system date picker, and we wanted to have something better that we could use in open source and in office. And then later on, my friend Mark, he created this menu bar app. And I think it's a pretty great app. It's pretty simple. You ever need to look at a calendar? You, have, you got access to it. But I've always thought, can it be done in React Native? So uh, what I really want to do is I want to create a menu bar app, or a calendar. So what I, do, what I can do is change the name of that symbol uh, and run this. So now we have a calendar. But that's not really a calendar. OK, so is there maybe like a React Native calendar project we can use? So back to our good friend Google. Turns out uh, oop, there is. Uh, Wix has a project called React Native Calendars. It's purely JS, but it says it only works for Android and iOS. We'll see about that. So what I love about this is that they literally have just sample code that you can copy and paste to run. So let's do that. Uh, in my uh, app.js, so I just copied that to a new file called calendar app. Um, no changes, like straight copy and paste. And in the index.js, I'm just going to, let's do this, uh, uncomment this and comment this out. And if I save, we now have a calendar. Yeah, so take that, Mark. I made your app in five minutes. <laughs> All right, that's enough for the live demos. So um, that's all great and dandy. That's how you get to a simple starter app. But let's say we don't want to deal with the native boilerplate code of yet another platform. Maybe you're a library maintainer, and upgrades already scare you enough, and you really just want like, to focus on the JS and not worry about native code. And for that, I recommend React Native Test App. This is another repo that Microsoft maintains. It's basically an NPM package that does its best to handle all the native bits for you, but also be like a simple React Native app. Uh, it supports Android, iOS, macOS, and Windows, all the ones that we use. And it will take the macOS template code and boil it down to a single pod file. And that pod file will have like three lines of code. I really love this because it's so simple and so easy, and it's backwards compatible with old versions of React Native, and it supports Fabric in the new architecture. Um, the setup for this is pretty simple. You just add it as a developer dependency, and then you run their command init test app. So yeah, uh, that's a bit of using React Native macOS and creating fun apps. Let's talk about some of the nitty gritty details. I won't go into this too much because I could spend all day talking about it, but we'll just go over the basics. So I mentioned earlier that we're a fork of React Native iOS code. And by that, I mean we have lots and lots of if tests. If you take a look at this example over here, this is a method that is in React Native core that tells you if your app is foreground or background. 
um, in React Native core, which is just like upstream React Native, you'd only have this one line. But in our repo, where we forked it, we've added this if def to do the iOS implementation if we're not iOS, and then the macOS implementation if, if there is one. So, and then we also add these uh, diff tags to help us keep track of where we've added code. So we've done this for literally everywhere there is native iOS code. And that is, that is quite a lot. We like this because this helps make sure that we are correct, especially as we're upgrading between versions of React Native, because as the native iOS code changes, we also have to update our diffs for macOS. We don't always use if defs. Sometimes we'll have a type def for the app kit to UI kit name if the two classes are similar enough. And sometimes we'll have a subclass where it's a wrapper class over, um, let's say, UI view. And on iOS, it'll be UI view. And on macOS, it'll be NS view with a bunch of extra methods to make it more similar to iOS. It really is context dependent. And uh, this shim layer, we call it RCT UI kit. The reason that this is important is because we could reuse the shim layer for Fabric. And that is why we're able to get Fabric up and running pretty quickly. And as we continue implementing Fabric, we can continue improving the shim layer, which in turn also <laughs> improves the paper implementation. It's all shared code goodness. All right, so one quick note about releases. Uh, we tend to release a new patch release for every commit. The reason for that is because the code you see on GitHub is the code that we use internally. So if I just released 71 and I found a bug and I want to fix it, I want to use that as fast as possible. Therefore, new patch release. And what that also means is that as we release a new version, we tend to have a lot of fast iteration until we, uh, towards a stable release. So you might, it might be more common to see version numbers like 0 0.68.30 instead of 0 0.68.6. All right, so the last part of my talk will be a few useful tools if you do decide to add or try out macOS in one of your libraries. So I've already mentioned React Native Test App. Uh, that's super useful. There's also the Upgrade Helper. I think a lot of you know about that. Uh, if you didn't know, it does support React Native macOS via its dropdown. And we'll show you how to diff the template projects there. The last one, we've also talked about this in a different talk, so I'll cover it really quickly, is Align Depths. This is basically a one-line magic command that will update all of your package dependencies across your entire monorepo with the correct version that supports whatever uh, platforms for React Native you have. So when you have, say, macOS and Windows in a project and you don't know which version of React Native SVG works, you can use this command and it'll know which one is the right one and update it every everywhere. All right. That's the end of my talk. I have a few links over here. You can find our Getting Started Guide at aka.us slash React Native. You can follow us on Twitter. Uh, here are some of the talks I've mentioned. And stay tuned for Chain React, where some of my coworkers at the React Native Windows team will talk about their experience maintaining that repo. And also, there will be a talk about Messenger desktop switching from Electron to React Native. Thank you. I can hear the jingle in my head now. It's like, I think it would be a really good remix. Um, before you go get coffee, a couple of fun announcements, uh, housekeeping kind of stuff. One is that up on the neon mezzanine lounge, we have an expert panel with CEO of Software, Man of Software Mansion, uh, Martin, who spoke at the beginning of the day. So if you want to go hang out, ask questions, etc., he'll be upstairs where the beer is. Uh, Saad is also going to do an expert panel tomorrow, so if you loved that, go say hi to him tomorrow. And after you get your coffee or your drinks, we're going to be showing another uh, live interview from the studio with Evan Bacon. So feel free to stick around for that. So yeah, go be merry, have drinks, coffee, stretch, sunlight. Smoking is bad for you. In Krakow, a remarkable journey awaits you through time and culture.
science and innovation. From the foundations of an ideal city, Nova Huta, golden dream of socialism, to the medieval city center. Besides more on UNESCO heritage list, Krakow has something else to offer. People. In Krakow, every year, close to 200,000 people complete their higher education. This includes almost 6,000 foreigners. These are specialists in almost every field from IT to biotechnology. No wonder that global players open their affiliates in Krakow. Krakow has become the center for modern services in Europe. Krakow is also a mecca for innovative business, from small catering unit to internet startups. A few of them have become world famous brand names. Our town is called the Polish Silicon Valley. By investing in infrastructure and transport system, we draw closer to each other. Local public transport is considered to be the best in the country. The blue trams and buses carry a quarter of a million pass and buses carry a quarter of a million passengers each year. The map of the town shows that museums play a special role, especially those that have outstanding collections uncomparable with anything else in the world. As for instance, the Wawel Museum of Aviation, the only one of its kind in Poland. Here you will find in this part of Europe, the largest library with access to books that constitute not only Polish heritage, but also that of all Europe. Old and modern architecture are the town's strong assets. In these interiors, not only are extraordinary concerts held, but also great sports and artistic events. One of these extraordinary places on the map of Krakow is Małopolski Garden of Art, an area for the implementation of innovative art projects combining many fields of art. Krakow, due to its center of Congress, has become one of the leading places in Europe where both cultural and trade events are organized. Krakow is increasingly associated with excellent cuisine. Its restaurants offering both traditional Polish food dishes as well as those representing other often distant lands gain recognition amongst residents, tourists and culinary experts. Hidden in the medieval cellars or located in sophisticated townhouses, vibrant centers of social life may be found. Krakow is a town which is unique, intriguing and surprising. A unique mix of history and modernity inspires action. Experience Krakow.
And if you want to become a Node.js developer that can build end-to-end -end applications, join our thriving community at Node.js.dev and I'm gonna help you master full-stack mobile development by building applications users love. Okay, so welcome back to the last Studio Live for today. Um, our guest right now is Evan Bacon from Expo. Um, so, hi, welcome. Oh, yeah, no, thanks for having me. Thanks again for giving us the talk earlier today, and we have a couple of hopefully interesting questions for you. So, Wojtek? Yeah, it was an amazing talk, and the huge part of it was actually announcement of the React router. and Expo router, yeah. <laughs> Explorator, I guess. It's stressful, sorry. Okay, it happens when you replace something. You know? Yeah, sorry. I just wanted to ask you about your favorite part of it and what do you think will have the biggest impact? Oh, yeah. Uh, I definitely think that thinking of apps in terms of a URL-based architecture is going to just really unlock some very special types of applications. We've also struggled for a lot of years to figure out, not just like me, but like the, the whole community has really struggled to figure out like what's the right abstraction for sharing code across web and native. And I think what we're finding with the, the URL-based file system-based system is that it's a, it's a pretty good way to share code. Like generally the parts that you want to change between web and native are uh, the shared layout elements. Um, which you actually see with a lot of cross-platform, where like it's pretty easy to draw text and images and views, but then as you scale out, that's where things start to diverge across platforms. And um, so, yeah, I could go on for a while. That, that's what I'm most excited about with Expo Router. Yeah, that's huge. And actually, I think it's gonna create a big impact on how we write apps because it's much more reusable when we think about web and the React application that we create right now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, my first interaction with React was the React website. And then I remember people telling me about React Native and how you could just swap on over to Native and run it on Native. Uh, but it's been pretty far from reality. Like, uh, there's definitely a lot of differences between web and native, and I, I feel like Expo Router is a, a giant step towards unifying the two. And hopefully, it's a lot more approachable for web developers, just because it's a uh, you know a, a very thriving community with a lot of great ideas. And so, having them build native apps is just going to lead to really excellent opportunities. Yeah, when I remember when. Web React Native was just starting out, and I really believe that it will be successful because it was so much different from the React uh, application, React Native applications. And now, thanks to projects like yours, it's finally coming to the place that it's actually developer friendly and we can use it on a daily basis and create real applications with it. Yeah, yeah, it's really uh, interesting. Like, there are a lot of difficult you know, patterns for every platform. And uh, web has definitely fallen subject to neglect, I I'd say. Um, so 
for example, basically every cross-platform system, when it, it does web, it will do somewhere, like at best, a single page application. And at worst, maybe like it will just paint everything to a canvas. Uh, but that's, if you were to step outside of the cross-platform world and you were to just look at how web development works, uh, it, that's been phased out pretty aggressively. So figuring out a way where you can write truly native apps, but then also get really performant web patterns and modern you know, web rendering uh, techniques, I think is going to um, just open a lot of doors. Like, uh, I think what we see a lot is that people will start with React Native, and then maybe if they have a website from like Expo, uh, maybe they'll migrate to use a, a different system in the future. Uh, and in that regard, it's, uh, it's kind of like the website isn't uh, entirely like real. Um, and maybe it creates more work uh, in the long run. So we're really excited to have that fixed now. And uh, you know, everything uh, is exactly as you would expect it to be right from the get-go. Yeah. yeah, so jumping on to a bit of a different topic, like in what ways would you kind of like to see React Native improve in the near future? It's a great question. So bringing that back to Expo Router, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> things I would like to see improve in X, uh, React Native. Um, well, styling for sure, I think, is my um, my main pain point right now. Just because in the Expo world, like I think in the the React Native survey, we see that it's like uh, upgrading and debugging and styling. And in the Expo world, upgrading is pretty much solved with config plugins. If you're using continuous native generation, uh, you can just you delete the native projects and just regenerate them on a whim, and you can even do more advanced things than that. Uh, and then debugging, we've got you know some great announcements tomorrow uh, from the Metro team and the Expo mm -hmm. team. Uh, so that leaves it like styling as the the main thing that I think a lot about. Um, like we have really great momentum now on the the, the yoga side mm -hmm. in Facebook. Uh, Nick Gerleman is working on it. He's doing a fantastic job. Um, and we added flex gap support, which is, you know, like, it's very niche sounding, but it, it's quite uh, special and it empowers a lot of uh, nice uh, UIs. So just seeing more happen in there. Like, I think uh, one thing that's really popped up lately is um, this concept of like combining some of the primitive views. So we have like a, you know, a blur view and a gradient view and a normal view and a a masking view, and it's like, what if they were all just one view? Because on native, that's kind of how they work now. Like originally, when they were written, uh, things like blurring weren't available on both platforms, but now they are. So maybe it's time to kind of upgrade and pull them back together. Uh, I think that will just unlock uh, applications where you you see more just interesting UIs. Like you see this a lot with um, like Swift UI, and also just Figma. Uh, prototypes. You'll see there's a lot of heavy gradient usage, a lot of heavy blur usage and shadow usage. And in React Native, where you have to like switch out the views in order to do that, you're just like, well, maybe I'll go flat. And it'll, you know, maybe I'll just do outlines and stuff. Um, so I think improving the styling will just really, I think, make it click, especially with the design crowd, which, you know, everything looks better when it looks better. Yeah, right now when it competitive is so much in the app industry. We just need to create those sophisticated app designs and does technology get to follow that and let allow us create that quickly and easily. Yeah, I'm also super excited about the work that Software Mansion's been doing with Reanimated 3, uh, mind blowing. And uh, yeah, yeah, shared element transitions is great. Uh, the new API, the performance. Um, and I mean, I know worklets aren't part of V3, uh, but like just worklets in general is like genius technology. So I, I, all the work that is happening uh, from the software mansion side, specifically in uh, reanimated gesture handler and screens, uh, is, is especially exciting to me. Okay. All right. So thank you so much for joining us for the talk and then for this interview. Um, and yeah, so we'll be wrapping up the break right now and moving on to the last segment of talks. So see you back at Studio Live tomorrow. Bye bye.
And if you want to become a Node.js developer that can build end-to-end -end applications, join our thriving community at Node.js.dev and I'm going to help you master full-stack mobile development by building applications users love.
everyone to our final sessions of the day. Most of everyone, I guess. All right, before we start with our two last speakers, uh, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, so tomorrow, uh, we're going to end the day with a panel, and it's going to be a panel of luminaries, uh, star-studded, if one might say. Do we have the slide behind us? We do not. Not yet. Anyway, the panel is live. It's six people and your moderator, Mr. Yanni Avakalio himself. You can ask questions to this panel beforehand, uh, and there is going to be a QR code online, so be ready. And also a QR code oh, behind us right now. So if you would like to submit questions to this panel, uh, to Christoph, to Saad, to Charlie, to Monica, to Ankita, and to Marty, uh, feel free to uh, grab a link and ask any questions when they come to you, either today or tomorrow. And don't worry, this is not the last time you'll be seeing this QR code, so there will be more opportunities to do so. But I think this panel will be a great way to finish tomorrow. I think it'll all tie us together and we can, uh, we can answer some questions that we all have left wondering at the end of the two days. And it'll be a good time, nice weather, good friends. Um, up next, before we bring up our next speaker, we have reached a point which to me is one of the most important points of any conference, which is the obligatory MC audience selfie. Now, I need you to get like before lunch excited for this one so we can pretend on the internet like we're having fun, okay? Are we ready for that? They did not sound ready. Well, we're doing it anyway, so. Yeah. I did try to save you from this, but she was very insistent. And uh, we I just, I think we're having a nice time. I want to capture it for when I don't remember things anymore. Wait, are we having a nice time? Are we, are we having a nice time? Yeah. All you back people, come be in the selfie. Come be in the selfie. Okay, fix your hair. Fix, fix it. I want to see big smiles. Uh, so one just smiling. And now I want you to like throw your hands up in the air like a rave. One, two, three. Thank you. Yeah, so we're neighbors. I have to deal with this like 365 days of the year. So it's, uh, You're welcome. Yes. Um, all right. Well, I think that is all the housekeeping and or ego stroking that we're going to do today. I think we can move on to the thing that you were really here for, which is the talks. Yes. So let me introduce uh, the first talk of the block. Uh, Nathan Wienert will be on stage momentarily uh, talking about Tamagui. Uh, it's a really cool project. I really look forward to learning more about it. So let's give it up for Nathan Wienert. Thank you. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Nate, and uh, today I'm talking a bit about Tamagui. Um, so what is that? Uh, it's sort of three things in one. Um, the, the core of it is this style library that also lets you bring along a bit of a design system, uh, a universal style library, I guess is what we're calling it these days. So it just works on native and web with the same APIs. Um, on top of that, what I think is probably the more interesting part is this package called Static, which is an optimizing compiler that uh, it works alongside core. And then on top of that, there is a um, kind of like a complete component kit uh, and UI system that works on native and web. And I'm actually not going to really talk much about that today, um, just because there was too much stuff to talk about with the, uh, the first two. And I think they, they're probably a little bit more interesting. So um, I thought it was kind of interesting and, and relevant to start out by talking about why I built it, um, because I, I got this question from a lot of people early on. And uh, it, it was sort of like in the form of like concern, like, are, are you sure you want to build a UI kit? Because uh, <laughs> it's a lot. And uh, I think the, the, one of the answers to that is just that I don't really think ahead 
very well. Um, and I wasn't really 100% uh, aware of what I was signing up for because I think when you're building um, a UI kit, especially one that works across a lot of different platforms, you actually end up with this like multiplicative uh, problem where you're supporting you know, multiple operating systems, four different JavaScript runtimes, server and client. Uh, with an optimizing compiler, you're also having to test everything when it's optimized versus not. Um, two different input modalities, uh, headless versions, styled versions, and also uh, when it adapts to native, native versions of everything. Um, Tamagui works with different animation drivers, which I'll talk about uh, in a bit. Um, so there's also testing across three different types of animations, and you end up with kind of an insane amount of uh, combinations. So, um, but the real answer was kind of ironically that I was trying to save time building an app, and um, <laughs> and and then I ended up not not ever really building that app and building Tamagui instead. Um, and the and and I guess the reason behind that was that uh, I was using React Native Web at the time, and my app was feeling kind of bad. And um, basically, it was feeling slower the more I added features. And uh, and and why was why was it kind of feeling slow? It was actually two reasons, I think. Not just uh, the fact that it was loading a lot of JavaScript, especially you know on the web where it's a lot more sensitive to that sort of stuff, but also because implementing a lot of features that uh, in CSS are you know, very natural, actually were um, quite cumbersome on native. So you know, media queries, I was having to write a hook and a set state and, and kind of thread a lot of state around. Same thing with pseudo styles or like interactive styles, so like hover and focus and, 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 uh, and press events, you have to kind of do quite a bit of, of code. Uh, for themes, like changing from dark to light mode, I was threading values down the context and having to re-render every view every time I wanted to change a the theme. Um, and also just, you know, generally, if you have all of your styling in JavaScript, you're paying quite a, quite a cost in terms of your bundle size and, and the parsing time up front. And then I think there's this kind of like one um, underappreciated uh, aspect of, of when you write a, a universal app today, which is that, um, you know, I was trying to abstract all of these different features that were cumbersome to write, like media queries and pseudo styles, into like a stack view that I had designed to make it much easier to write. Uh, but then the problem is that all the leaf nodes, and basically the majority of the nodes in your application, are now paying the extra cost in tree depth because you have the stack view that makes it easier to, say, write a media query. But now, instead of rendering to a view or a div on the web, you're rendering to a stack view, which has to run a bunch of hooks, and, and, and React has to you know, deal with one extra layer. So um, I think that verbosity, both in terms of like how much you have to write and, and how much code you have to thread in order to try something out, is kind of the death of, of creativity, which is very important when you're trying to design and come up with like a new product that you're not exactly sure how it's going to work. Um, and so I like this little example that I put together, which is that, say, you're a, a painter that likes to paint uh, landscapes, and, um, and you went to go make like a, a brush stroke, um, and it took, like say, a few seconds until you actually saw the brush stroke. And I just don't think you'd be a very good painter if that was the case. And that's kind of what it felt like coming from, like a, say, like a web world where CSS was just so simple to write and so quick that I could try out different styles and different ideas. But the idea of having to you know, you know, add an, an event and add a set state and then update uh, that in the render function made me feel like I was painting in, in slow motion. And so um, the question is, can we solve that? And uh, I, I've come up with this like sort of uh, diagram where it's like a choose two or a trilemma, I guess, is what some people call that, like the cap theorem, so to speak, um, which is that you can sort of choose two of these options. Um, you can have one code base and have it feel native, uh, or you can have it be multi-platform and, 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 and feel native, or you can have one code base and be multi-platform, which I'll break down in a second. Um, this is what I was choosing at the time, which is that I had abstracted things to make it very easy to write. Um, so, you know, I had this very nice stack view that let me write very simple media queries and hover styles and all of that, but, uh, and it worked across platforms with one code base, but um, 
my app was feeling quite slow due to all that extra JavaScript. Um, a different option is just to not ship it on both native and web, obviously. Pretty straightforward. It's going to feel native, and you'll have one code base. And then you know, I think a common option with like, bigger companies is that they will write everything twice, and obviously that gives them quite a, good, quite a bit of performance. But I do think it's kind of underappreciated um, that this has a huge cost. Like Even at the biggest companies, having multiple teams have to deal with each other and plan and coordinate features. Uh, you know, the ideal team is a small group that just like, is able to kind of control everything. And so you know, I, I think um, while Tamagui definitely helped me as like, an individual developer, I think it still has a lot of value for uh, bigger teams that, that want to move quite fast. And so uh, this is where I ended up um, in the middle, which is that I just never actually shipped that app because I was trying to solve this trilemma. Um, but I do think that I found somewhat of an answer. And it's, I think, an answer that's just always been true in kind of the history of computing, which is that we make higher level abstractions, and then we make those actually perform somewhat better through optimizing compilers. And so that was what I worked on with Tamagui. Um, how does it do that? Uh, well, most of the optimizations are actually on the web because the web has uh, a, a lot of features that, that do run a lot faster than JavaScript, and namely that CSS. So you know, media queries um, are media queries. Um, interactive, interactive styles can be generated in CSS. Um, themes can be generated as CSS variables. Um, and then also, just in general, the more JavaScript that you can remove and replace with CSS, the faster it's going to feel. And then I think this is kind of like the uh, underappreciated one, of course, which is flattening. Um, you want to be able to have these styled views that you can define that are you know, much easier to work with. But in the end, you would like to be able to render them out to something like a div on, on the web or a view on native and not pay that extra cost of rendering a, a, another component. Um, so this is Tamagui Core, which is the style library. I think. Uh, I put the Stitches logo over there because, to be honest, it's just about the exact same um, API. Um, you have you know, typed themes and typed tokens. You have uh, media queries and, and pseudo styles. And you also have um, this concept of variance, which is just a kind of a simple way to add typed properties, uh, custom type properties that expand into styles. Um, and I think one thing that actually what's kind of cool about variance is, is that you can wrap these styled views as many times as you want. You can just keep kind of taking like this heading, for example, and make like an H1 on top of it or an H2 on top of it and change a few values. And, and you build up this sort of like vocabulary in your design system. Um, but you don't actually, you know, it's not actually adding an extra layer of components in between. It's, it is just, you know, merging the various variants and uh, still giving you nice types and TypeScript and all that, um, which is great because the compiler, you know, a, a compiler can only understand so so much dynamic behavior, um, and variants are like a nice limited amount of functionality that still gives you the, a, a decent amount of power without deoptimizing a compiler. Uh, okay, so I'm not going to really go over all of these, um, but these are some of the features that Tamagui Core brings on top of something like React Native Web. Um, it is fully compatible with all of the React Native APIs, and everything that it does works 100% the same on Native and Web. Um, and I threw this slide in. I like Tailwind, by the way. I, I think it's a great library, but I do think that it's relevant to compare it with Tailwind. It, it takes a lot of similar sort of the upsides, and I think the nice idea is that Tailwind has, like, being able to write inline styles with shorthands, generate minimal CSS from, from what you use, and also that works on native and web. It has a, a definite downside compared to Tailwind on the web, which is that you do bring along some JavaScript. Um, one of the decisions that I made with Tamagui was to make everything work um, in, in, at runtime, so you don't actually have to use the compiler. It's not uh, you know, zero JS, which I think is kind of popular these days. Um, but I do think that brings you some upsides, which is that which I'll talk about in a second. But um, and I think one one counterbalance to that extra bundle size is that the the compiler tends to do a pretty good job of actually neutralizing that, and even in some cases making your app I think feel faster than 
say, like a, a typical zero runtime JavaScript library. Um, some, some upsides, though, is that everything is typed with TypeScript, and you don't need any editor plugin. Um, you can do really dynamic styles, so you can sort of throw anything you want at it, and, and it will work without having to worry about whether or not like, the uh, plugin will pick it up. Um, and one really nice thing is you can merge your properties down. So I think uh, Tailwind has something like Tailwind Merge, but you know, just by default, since uh, Tamagui is using flat style props, you are able to just kind of like really granularly control whether or not your component lets uh, an external user override some style properties or not. Um, and again, you can use dynamic styles. And, um, and uh, well, I think I covered the, the, the properly merged props, but also it's kind of nice that you can destructure style properties and also then go back and restructure and add them on. So I think you get, you, you're basically using JavaScript, which is really nice. And so you have a lot of control over how you manage your styles and, and manage your components. And then a powerful theme system, which I will talk about next. So one of the main principles of Tamagui is that it tries to avoid re-rendering as much as possible, which is very important, especially for, for, I mean for, pro, for uh, performance on both native and web. Um, and I'm going to kind of show how that happens through two of the, main, two of the more interesting features, which are animations and, and themes. Um, so there's three animation drivers, like I mentioned. Um, and the cool thing is you can swap them out depending on the platform. So if you want to have nice spring animations on native, you plug in the reanimated driver like so, and you get this kind of typed animations that you can access on any view. And then on the web, if you wanted to save some bundle size, you can plug in a CSS driver, and as long as you match up all of those properties, they'll all be typed, and you can just swap it out at any time, and, and so your web app can have a lot less bundle size. Um, this is a quick example just showing kind of how animations work. You have a stack view. Um, you give it the animation property, and then all of these properties will animate. And you know I can hover on this, and it does a little spring effect. Um, and that's that. And uh, so here's how you define. And then the themes are the other thing. And, and I'm going to show how they kind of work together to avoid re-rendering in a way that I think is pretty, pretty cool. Um, when you define themes, again, it's just JavaScript objects. They're meant to have the same um, structure. So basically, you know, background and color here should be across all your themes so that when you change out a theme, it's kind of always there for all your different components. They generate CSS variables at, uh, on the web. And here's an example, just kind of very arbitrary example, showing using a theme, you can set the theme. These are all imported from Tamagui Core, by the way. I just wasn't sure if I had enough space on the slides to show the imports. But uh, theme, stack, and text all are just built into Tamagui Core. And then you can extend them from there. But you, know, you can basically set a theme and then look for the background color. And, uh, and, and it will pick up the background color and color from that theme. And then likewise, you can abstract your widget out now and, of course, set the theme in, for that entire subtree. Set it to dark, and of course, it will change to dark. And also, you can nest themes and change them as many times as you want down the tree. So you kind of have a, quite a bit of power in terms of changing the look and feel of different sub, sub parts of your, of your tree. And uh, themes also have this little nice feature called inverse, which just automatically works with dark and light mode. Because uh, a lot of people like to have, say, like an inverse button that looks like the opposite color. And uh, this is really nice because you know, if your top level thing is like a prefers color scheme, then you don't have to worry too much, like is it dark, and then change it to light and do a bunch of logic. You just kind of inverse it, and it works. Uh, and then I think this is the, the cool part about Tamagui themes, which is that you can have sub-themes. And they're defined with an underscore, like this. So here we can add on two more themes, which is a light red theme and a dark red theme. And again, it's, oh, you know what? The white and, oh, no, that's right, white and red. OK, I thought maybe I, I didn't put the right values there, but I did. Um, so yeah, we're just adding like a light red theme and a dark red theme. And then again, you can now nest your themes. And so you can set theme equals light. And then down somewhere further below, you can set it to be red. And now you have your light red theme applied to that widget. Um, again, we can just use that little inverse thing. And it's actually smart enough to change from light red to dark red 
in that sub area, which is, I think, pretty cool. And uh, one, one last thing to note about sub-themes is they actually go all the way down to the component level. So with your style view, you can give it a name. So this one's named square. And, uh, and then if you define a theme with a capital, so light square and dark square, you can actually apply a theme directly to any component. And I think this is actually pretty interesting in terms of being able to share code and, and publish widgets that other people can use because they can go ahead and just rechange the look of anything that you've published while not having to dig deep down into the internals or like thread props down in a very weird way. Um, so I just wanted to th show a few examples. This is kind of just like a, a, an overview of a variety of the uh, components that come with the Tamagui theme. I think the contrast on this monitor is not quite as good as the contrast on my screen, but um, this is a dark theme, for example, and then a light theme. And that's just obviously changed out at the root. Um, and then here we're showing dark plus inverse by inversing uh, the card, which is, again, pretty nice. You can sort of just change it at any level of the tree. I made a little outline theme, which, again, I'm not sure the contrast is super high here, but uh, it just basically made all the borders much stronger. And then a light theme, which, once again, kind of gives you that like sketch outline type look for, for more of like a prototyping type uh, design. Um, this is a dark purple theme. Again, it's just tweaking a bunch of things. And then a dark purple alt theme, which is a further level down, which kind of just increases the brightness and lowers the contrast. Useful for things like having like a subtitle that's less emphasized, for example. Um, and I think the idea here is that with Tamagui, you kind of get close to this like dream of Winamp, where you could have people publish themes and actually change every single part of an interface without actually having to go in and, and change any of the code. It's not quite there yet, because the style system in, in React Native doesn't support things like you know, background image um, or linear gradients and stuff like that. So you're, you're a little bit more limited in what you can change. But I do think as we keep adding on these nice style properties to React Native, we'll get pretty close to being able to have apps that you can basically fully control the look and feel without having to dig in and hard code a bunch of different values and, and change them. Uh, and then again, I, I kind of talked a little bit about um, re-rendering and avoiding re-rendering. And so I, I think it's cool to show how it all comes together with themes and animations. Um, so here's a stack view again, where we have an animation. We have a background color that's using one of your theme values that you've set, and then we change it when you hover over the stack view. Um, and the cool thing is, if you're using the CSS driver on the web, um, it's going to actually read the theme value into a CSS variable. And that means that it knows internally that you're not actually dependent to, uh, that, that's not a value that needs to be changed when I change a theme somewhere up above. Um, so it won't re-render as you switch from dark mode to light mode. And that was one of the things that was making my app feel very slow was when I was just using a bunch of hooks and threading a bunch of context values down. When I would change from a dark to a light theme on, on my app, it was like a 400 or 500 millisecond uh, main thread pause. Whereas now the Tamagui homepage has you know, hundreds of elements on it, but you can switch between dark and light mode instantly because it's only re-rendering a very small amount of components. Um, for example, if you did have a spring driver, like one of the, like the reanimated or React Native animated driver, then when you do do an animation, it needs to actually grab the, the real value of the color and not the CSS variable, because those drivers don't work through CSS variables. They work through you know, the actual raw color value. And so this stack view would actually re-render as you change the theme, but none of the other, uh, other views that don't use the theme or that don't use the uh, uh, reanimated driver would actually re-render. So you get this kind of really nice vertical integration, I think, between all the different features in, in, in Tamagui Core. OK, and so then onto the cool part, uh, the optimizing compiler. Uh, Tamagui Static does four different things to optimize your, your apps. Um, the basic thing is to extract CSS at build time. Um, and then tree flattening, which I will explain in a second, which actually works alongside partial evaluation. And then hook removal, which I don't really have a slide for, but basically um, Tamagui has hooks for use theme uh, and use media 
And if you use those as, part, like, as, as values for your styles, it actually does a bunch of analysis to figure out, OK, well, these are just used for plain styles that we're going to generate CSS for. So we can actually just turn that into CSS and remove those hooks from your code to save you a bit of rendering time. Um, here's an example of how it works. So on the left is what you would write, and on, on the right is what the compiler would output. It does evaluation of a variety of different things. You can use logic, um, including nested ternary logic uh, or spread values. It handles quite a few different um, things to, that, it, that it can analyze. Um, and uh, the my custom color there would be like an imported value. It actually will do evaluation of cross module boundaries. So you can have like your constants in a different file and import them and use them as color values. And it will try and analyze that at build time and see if it can just fully optimize it away. And uh, it's very nice. I mean, the difference in performance when you have a large page uh, is, is quite significant, not just because it's using class names, but also because it's rendering out to an actual div and, and h1 rather than rendering to an extra level of depth, you know, especially at these leaf nodes, because style views are everywhere. You, know, uh, you can have hundreds of them on a single page. And so you're actually basically flattening your tree by almost half in many cases and, and just getting this very, very efficient output. There's obviously some CSS that's output too on the right. I'm just not showing it. But it, it emits CSS along, in a, a plugin that works alongside Vite or Webpack or, Met, or uh, it works with Metro through Babel. Um, so just a brief explanation of how that sort of works with partial evaluation. Um, basically, it's, it's a Babel plugin. It checks for uh, JSX expressions. It will go through and normalize all the different ternaries and spreads and, and nest of the logic that it finds. Um, Babel has this really nice helper called get all bindings, where it traverses upwards within the current scope and tries to grab all of the static bindings that it can find uh, and give them back to you. It will then analyze imports that you whitelist. We actually don't Im analyze every import because that could get kind of uh, insanely expensive. But um, you can give it some whitelists, like const your constants file, your colors file, for example, and it will go and try and analyze those and, and require them in. And then it takes all of those bindings, and it uses this very cool node module that uh, I, don't, I never heard about. I've, I actually haven't seen it in use much at all. But the node, node has this thing called VM, which lets you run node code from node. Um, so it'll pass in the source, uh, all these static bindings that it's found, and then try and basically um, analyze that code. So you can even do stuff like, you know, uh, in the higher scope, you can have like some addition or like multiplication of different values. And as long as it can figure that all out, it will still go ahead and flatten your views. Um, just a little example of how that looks on the homepage of the Tamagui website. We have this little demo of like a Safari browser that's got a bunch of different you know, divs and stuff, obviously, to make those tabs and, and the different sections there. Um, it's about, you know, it's, it's, it's a small little area of the home page, but actually within that just one area, it is flattening about 50 different components from being uh, stacks or, or views or whatever into divs. Um, and this is what it looks like. On the left, you can see, I don't know if it's big enough. Yeah, I guess it's not too bad. Um, you can see a bunch of different views. Like we have the H1 view. Oh, I've got my cursor here too. So this H3, for example, is like my own custom H3. It uses my design system. It uses my tokens, my size tokens, and everything. And then the output is just a very nice, clean, flat div, or H3 in this case. Uh, I did a little bit of profiling for this um, and, and kind of tried to keep it consistent. And uh, I, did, I did a bunch of runs. And what I found was that the home page, on average, would take about 660 milliseconds until it fully finished rendering. Now, granted, uh, the Tamagui home page is trying to show off like every feature in Tamagui. Um, so it's, it's quite heavy. It's, it's showing like a bunch of themes that you normally wouldn't have and, and all the different animations and features. But nonetheless, without the compiler, it's about 660 milliseconds until it finishes doing all the animations and rendering. And when I turn on the compiler, it takes about 600 milliseconds, so you're getting about a 10% increase in, in startup time. Uh, likewise, the Lighthouse scores seem to be about a similar amount better. Um, it goes from about an 80 to a 91. That was an average of four different runs that I did, um, which I think anyone that's struggled with Lighthouse knows that the, the last 20% is kind of the hardest 20%. And so it's pretty nice to be able to just give yourself 
10, 10 or more points uh, without having to do anything. And I think uh, kind of like a final takeaway from this uh, that, that I think is very important is that when you do get speed along with simplicity, it really helps with creative expression because now you can do these inline styles. You don't have to worry too much about if you're you know, costing your app a bunch of performance. You can just kind of throw things in there, uh, iterate a lot, and then turn on the compiler before you go to production mode and get back most of that performance that would normally be costing you quite a bit. Um, and so. That's kind of a brief overview of Tamagui. I wanted to do quite a bit more, but I was, it was taking like 40 minutes for my talk uh, a couple of days ago, so I pulled out a few slides. Um, so I just wanted to say that uh, I think CSS and JS is back, and, uh, and that is my talk. Thank you. for the last talk. I have no announcements for you today. Uh, just gonna let our next speaker set up. And we've been hearing a lot today about all the cool things you can do in React Native now, with Expo, with styling, uh, I, I gotta get on different operating systems. Can, uh, but what about wait. six months from now? What about a year from now? What about in the year 2030? What is React Native going to look like? And that is what our next speaker is going to explore with us today. And after that, we'll all have learned a lot. And uh, we'll do some announcements at the end. And then we can go enjoy the sunshine. So please, for our final speaker of the day, give a big round of applause to Fernando Rojo. Where are we now, and where are we going? Our lists are slow, and our images flicker. Our keyboards cover our inputs, and our inputs can't format text. We can't use multiple modals, and we can't put toasts on top of modals. We can't use modern CSS. Our shadows barely work. It's hard to do shared element transitions, and I don't know how to use native code. If you've been a React Native developer, facing these issues is almost a rite of passage. But little by little, people stepped up and donated their free time to solve many of React Native's fundamental shortcomings. As you can see, in the past year, React Native's feature set has increased dramatically. And many of these features have come from the community rather than React Native itself. And all this has made me wonder, what would React Native look like in its perfect form? if we didn't have to accept any of these issues as the way things are. So let's travel through time to 2030 and explore what the future could look like through every release along the way. My plan is to introduce these and see what the next years will look like. And it might come in 2030 or maybe a little bit sooner. And what better place to start than with native modules? What sets React Native apart is the fact that you can use JavaScript to express truly native UI. And since this is such a big selling point, it's important that we have really simple ways of interacting with native code. Otherwise, you end up with a very minor subset of features, and it becomes a bit of a false promise. In the past year, writing native modules has gotten a lot easier with the introduction of Expo modules. I was able to write my own module with the help of ChatGPT in just a few hours called Burnt. And even though it's very simple, it gave me a lot of insight into what the experience is writing nat native code today with React Native. This is what it looks like to do it today. First, you have separate code in your iOS and Android folders, where you have your Swift and Kotlin files, respectively. Every time you make native changes, you have to rebuild your native app and restart the dev server to get it running. Next, you have to import your native code using this function called require native module. And lastly, if you want to add TypeScript types, you just have to manually cast it on top of them. Now, this is pretty good. If you ever try to write a native module without Expo modules, you know that the list is a lot longer. But in the future, it'll be even easier with the introduction of inline native modules. 
Notice that I'm importing burnt from a Swift file. And I can call its functions with types right in my JavaScript code. With inline native modules, you can suddenly import Swift and Kotlin files right alongside your React code. You don't need separate folders. It lives right in the same place. And while it doesn't technically use fast refresh, whenever you update a native file, your native app will automatically recompile. And it'll be so fast that it feels like fast refresh. Now, probably my favorite part is the automatic TypeScript types. Using AST parsers for Swift and Kotlin, we can read in what the types are and automatically cast them. And using type, TypeScript declaration merging, we can apply these files with their types. And all this will work without any additional setup. So if you're building a library that just needs one native file, or if you have a ton of native files in your app, all you need to do is write it, import it, and you're good to go. So how do we deal with platform inconsistencies? After all, this is only showing a Swift file and what happens here on Android. Turns out this will be pretty easy. You can import your Swift and Android code separately. And here I'm using platform select, but you could use any of the different platform methods to do this. And what's cool is this won't error on either platform. On iOS, the Kotlin file will be tree shaken out, and the same thing will happen on, on Android for the Swift files. And you know, back and forth, you won't have any errors. So as long as you don't call an iOS method on Android, you won't get any errors. And something I love about this approach is each platform has its own types. And that's OK. We want to share code a lot of the time, but I think we forget that it's actually a good thing for each platform to have its own implementations. And it's then up to the JavaScript side to match up the APIs and provide a single interface. You can finally co-locate your native iOS and Android code in a single place. But native modules wouldn't be complete without taking advantage of everything the platform has to offer. And that's why these will also let you import Swift UI files with any, without any additional configuration. Just write your Swift UI components and import them and run them like a normal React component. It can receive state and re-render, and it'll also be able to receive children. Everything that you're used to doing with the React component will work here with our Swift UI views. We need access to native APIs without headaches. Now, with all that said, not everything native is better. After all, there's a reason we're using JavaScript to build apps. And one of the greatest benefits of using JavaScript here is over-the-air updates. I've tried doing some native updates soon, uh, recently without React, and really, it's, uh, we have no idea how good we have it. Imagine every single time a bug sparks up, you need to do a native build, get a review, and then if they find something from your previous build they didn't like, then you have to you know, just wait a few weeks, and users could just be on a buggy app for weeks. It's, uh, it's just not something I envy from native developers at all. And that's where OTA comes to the rescue. But that said, OTA still lags behind web deployments. When you deploy a new version of your website, it's immediately accessible to every user without any installs. They don't see a banner. They don't have to wait until the next time they open the app. They're always on the latest version. And there's so much peace of mind from that fact. But React Native's over-the-air updates are similar with a little bit of a complication. You have to make a tough decision. Do you prioritize fast time to interactive? Or do you make sure you're, that your app is always up to date? The common pattern I see is this. You ship an update over the air. When someone opens the app, you fetch that update and have it ready for the next time they open the app. As a result, a lot of people are on a stale version. And so if you have a bug, it's possible that they're still experiencing that until they open it the next time. So why not just go the easy route and block users from entering the app until it's downloaded? Well, this is nice from a developer's perspective. You know, it's, it's really safe. But for the users, it's kind of unfortunate. You have to decide how long are you going to force someone to stare at a splash screen until, you're, until your upgrade has downloaded. But all this will be changed in the future with a new addition to over there updates called Under the Radar. With Under the Radar, updates are fetched in a background task. Rather than waiting for people to open the app, the latest JS bundle is ready by the time that they open the app again. Whenever you ship a new update, your app receives a silent notification telling it to start downloading the update in the background. And finally, we'll have up-to-date releases together with fast time to interactive, bringing the best parts of the web experience to native deployments. I spent a long time thinking about how to unleash the best parts of web on native. For the past few years, I've been working on a startup called BeatGig. 
our product uses the Solido stack, meaning that our website is powered by Next.js, and our mobile app uses React Native, and our UI code is shared across both. Using this stack is a really nice way to understand the differences between platforms. I've really explored where they diverge here, from the ways we navigate to the subtle differences in how Z-index behaviors across, across iOS, Android, and web. And above all, I've discovered the subtle ways in which React Native still lags behind the web. With React Native, you need to use so many components to build basic layouts. In order to press something, you need a pressable. If you want a gradient, you need a gradient component. If you want a mask, you need a mask component. If you want a scroll, you need a, it just it keeps going. Meanwhile, on web, you need a div. Now, I don't think React Native will ever have a div that matches up with web, nor do I think it should. But I think it should be as powerful as the web, and less, but not as unorganized, like a strictly typed div. I really love that phrasing. Take well-known APIs and implement the important parts. Now, even though I'm making predictions for 2030, it's possible that Christmas may come early for the strictly typed div. A few months ago, an RFC called React DOM for Native was posted on the React Native discussions board. It appears that React Native is considering implementing it, and this is an example screenshot of its usage. Rather than a view, you can see that we have a single HTML import with a bunch of DOM elements on it. Now, the div doesn't exactly match the web one, but it's close. Instead of using style sheet, we have a CSS function. And on native, this probably won't do anything, but on web, it'll facilitate creating optimized CSS styles. You can see that we have an on-click handler without needing a pressable component. And something I want you to notice is the comment above on-click says it has a synchronous event. That'll be relevant in just a second. This RFC opens so many doors. All those components that I displayed earlier can get, all get rolled up into the style prop. We could finally use multiple shadows and use the CSS shadow syntax, which is just so much more intuitive than React Native's, and they'll actually work. If you want a gradient, just get rid of the linear gradient component and use the style prop. <sighs> if you want to track when an element has entered the view, this one is really close to my heart because it's super annoying to do, you don't have to change your whole screen to be a flat list. You can get any arbitrary view, track when it's entered the screen with an intersection observer, just like we can on web. Now, as we compare the experience of building with web and native, I want to highlight a very specific UI pattern, and that is formatting text inputs. Let's look at an example from the BeeKig app and website. In this case, the user is typing in a dollar amount, and I want you to pay close attention to the formatting. So it'll be kind of quick here, but hopefully it'll be easy for you to catch. First, let's look at the website. This one works great. I type, I can see the comma pop in right away. There's no flickering. Very easy. Now, I'm going to show you the iPhone, exa iPhone app example next. Same exact component, same exact code, but there's one small difference in what the user sees. OK, so here I type, and it does format well. Right? I still see the commas. But you'll notice that there's this like, one second flicker where it's not formatted. I'm going, to, I'm going to show you a slow motion version here so you can actually see it. Okay, so here's the same thing, but in slow-mo. Notice that I delete, the comma's still there, and then it goes away. And then I type again, and then the comma comes in. Right? This is slowed down, obviously. It's dramatized a bit. But let's look at the code to see why this happens. On the left, I have an HTML input. Whenever I change the text, I first call event prevent default. What this does is it tells the browser when I'm changing the state to ignore the default behavior, which is to add the text to the input. As a result, the input is only ever using the prop for value, which is always formatted. Now, why don't we just do the same thing on native, right? We still have an on-change handler for native that we could call. And the reason is that prevent default doesn't do anything on native. Communication between JavaScript and native side is asynchronous, meaning that we don't have a synchronous event prevent default function to call. And if we do, it just doesn't do anything. Now, while this may seem like a minor quirk, I think it's a pretty good litmus test for how mature a UI library really is. Little details like this are the difference between an app feeling truly native or not. React Native claims to be truly native, and it's just supposed to be a better abstraction than a web view. But, but when it comes to complex inputs like this, 
oftentimes a web view might win. In the future, if the React DOM for native RFC comes to life, we will actually have synchronous events, like that on-click handler mentioned. And that would mean that our inputs can finally be formatted as well as a website. Another key advancement I'm excited to look at is modern CSS properties. Here's an example of a gradient border using nothing but a mask. And here we have another one from Sam Salikoff using background clip with tailwind classes. People these days are finding just about every single way to create gradient borders. Another common pattern I'm seeing with modern CSS styles is making an element glow. For web, all you have to do is duplicate a view, absolute position it, and apply a filter. So in this case, Emil is applying a 40 pixel blur in just one line. Now it's worth noting here, this is not the same behavior as the blur view that we're used to. The blur view that we have from Expo or from React Native in general is a backdrop filter, right? It blurs between your content and what's behind it. Whereas in this case, we're blurring the layer itself. So here Paco from Linear predicts that the future of web design will be powered by mask, clip path, filter, and other modern CSS properties. And it's no surprise that if you go on the Linear website, you can see a lot of these CSS properties in action. Now, while none of these are currently available in React Native, I think they're coming. These are all additions that are mentioned in the RFC for native, or in the uh, React, for, uh, React DOM for native RFC that I mentioned earlier. Let's get rid of the blur view and move all these things into the style prop. It's critical that we don't limit our ability to build great designs with ease. The final part of unsolved styling in the core of React Native is, of course, animations and transitions. We all love reanimated, but just the fact that we need to use it is a bit weird. When I was building Modi, I obsessed over having the simplest API possible. I wanted one import, one object, and no helper functions unless you wanted them. Adding animations should feel like play without any mental overhead or you know, too much setup. This was greatly inspired by my prior experience using CSS transitions. With just a single line and no third-party library, you could animate any kind of transition that was happening on a, on a div. And as, as much as I love using Modi and Reanimated, we just shouldn't need third-party libraries for basic high-performance animations. Instead, we should reach for these when we want something more advanced, the way we do on the web with Framer Motion which is why I'm excited to share what the API will be for built-in transitions for native. We can see here that opacity is updated based on this visible prop. To make the opacity animate when it changes, all we need to do is add it to the transition property. This is exactly what happens with CSS. And unlike now, all the transitions will run with high performance without blocking the JS thread, or at least that's my hope. The same goes for keyframe animations. Simply take an animation object and pass it to the style prop. Here I'm using from and to, but you could actually use any keys that CSS keyframes would allow. And I'm wondering, as I say all these things, like, could this really all take seven years? Like, is, is this really that much? Because it starts to feel pretty obvious, and I wonder why we don't have these things now. If you want to help bring the React Native 2030 vision to life, I want to encourage you to think what kind of things here would I be good at building? And where can you contribute? I've noticed that when it comes to open source, the biggest changes often come from a few people passionately hacking away on something over the weekend. If you help build it, maybe we could have everything this year. Before closing, I want to highlight this tweet from May 2020 from Evan. Back then, Evan made a quick example for using Expo together with Next.js. And it kind of flew under the radar at the time. But I remember seeing it when I was walking through the streets of Denver, and I immediately jumped into a coffee shop to try it out. Something right there just clicked for me. If only this stack could work, it could be the best way to build front ends without compromise. And there began my multi-year journey of building Dripsy, Modi, Solido, Burnt, Zigo, and more. I never expected to build any open so source software at all. So start tinkering and share your discoveries publicly, no matter how early, because you never know who you'll inspire to take them on. Thank you.
We did it. Day one complete. One more to go. Did you like it? Yeah. It is a sad occasion, but we have some good news for you. I don't know if you knew this, but there's a second day. Woo. That's right. Your ticket money goes a long way over here in Krakow. Two days of entertainment for just one ticket. Can you believe it? So a couple things about tomorrow. One, don't forget to bring your badge because we don't have second day badges. This is your superpower. One ticket only buys you one badge, two days though. I actually have three, but it's because I'm special and wonderful um, and multiple personalities. Uh, and the other thing is that tomorrow we're starting a little bit later, 10 a.m. So you can like, you know, hang out today, enjoy the sunshine. Maybe have a little drink, but not too many. But like a 10 a.m. amount, mm -hmm. you know, depending on how you, not like a midday amount, but like a 10 a.m. amount. Uh, and I think that's it for us. We have been your hosts, Yanni and Ellie. And you have been wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, see you tomorrow. Enjoy the sun.